Materialism and Revolution, published in Les Temps Modernes the same year that Reflections appeared, this is a pivotal essay in Sartre's political and social thought, but typically, it is ontological in nature as well. Two years later, when Sartre is making conciliatory gestures toward the Communist Party, he explains that this was a critique of Marxist scholasticism of 1949, or, if you prefer, against Marx through neo-Stalinist Marxism. 33 The essay consists of two parts, the revolutionary myth, and the philosophy of revolution. The revolutionary myth. This section could have been titled, Why I am not a communist, for it lodges a metaphysical critique of dialectical materialism. Point 34 I now realize that materialism is a metaphysics hiding positivism, MR 201, and it inconsistently eliminates human subjectivity, reducing it to an object of scientific investigation while making the scientist an objective beholder that claims to contemplate nature as it is, absolutely. We have observed Sartre pursue the ontological line in BN while resisting the positivist stand that dismisses metaphysics as meaningless. In the present essay he takes the metaphysical tack. Addressing now the materialist, metaphysics, of the Marxists, he concludes. It is a clear and a priori stand on a problem which infinitely transcends our experience. In other words, it is, metaphysical, in a common use of that term. This is also my own stand but I did not consider myself to be any less a metaphysician in refusing existence to God than Leibniz was in granting it to him. And by what? Miracle is the materialist, who accuses idealists of indulging in metaphysics when they reduce matter to mind, absolved from the same charge when he reduces mind to matter? Mr. 204. One should not rush to enroll Sartre among the mind-body dualists in any unqualified way. We have acknowledged that being and nothingness is dualist, in nature, while pointing out that it does not subscribe to a two-substance ontology. The most that we can conclude from the quotation just cited and from B.N. is that Sartre is not a crass materialist. Neither was Marx, who explicitly rejected such a position. As he moves toward a dialectical philosophy, it seems that Sartre may be adopting an emergentist form of materialism, again as did Marx. This would admit that mind developed from matter, to put it simplistically, but insist that it is irreducible to matter in its distinctive features, chief of which, for Sartre, would be, intentionality, which he has consistently defended as the defining characteristic of the mental point. 35 Sartre is willing to consider a dialectical relationship among ideas, as we find in Hegel, but considers it implausible in matter, which is characterized by inertia, because, the mainspring of all dialectics is, the idea of totality, MR 204. This was already his position in transcendence of the ego. We shall find him continuing to reject a dialectic of nature, what the Soviet communists called diamat, and, once he accepts a historical dialectic in the critique, insisting that the practical inert, heir to being in itself, is anti-dialectical in that it can turn praxis against itself in counterfinality. Point 36 The theoretical backbone of his argument is an anticipation of his discussion of the dialectic with the French Philosophical Society the following year that we shall discuss in chapter 12. It turns on the distinction between the Hegelian notion, begriff, and the abstract concept. Science is made up of concepts, in the Hegelian sense of the term. Dialectics, on the other hand, is essentially the play of notion, voicing what could be a mantra for Sartre's philosophical life since he and Beauvoir first read Jean Walls toward the concrete in 1932 and continuing into the critique and the family idiot, he explains, dialectical enrichment lies in the transition from the abstract to the concrete, that is, from elementary concepts to notions of greater and greater richness. The movement of the dialectic is thus the reverse of that of science, MR 209. We recognize a variation on the distinction between analytic and synthetic reasoning that is now well established in Sartre's discourse. But he is willing to grant the pragmatic truth of the materialist faith insofar as it is linked with the revolutionary attitude. It is a fact that materialism is now the philosophy of the proletariat, he concedes, precisely in so far as the proletariat is revolutionary. Mr. 222. In the second part of this essay, Sartre sketches the kind of philosophy that should replace the materialist myth of the proletarian revolution with a logically coherent philosophy to match its revolutionary mentality. In effect, 
he is reaching toward the horizon from which his critique of dialectical reason beckons. The philosophy of revolution. Because this major document could easily be discussed at monograph length, it seems prudent to limit our consideration to four claims made in this text which portend the next, dialectical phase of Sartre's thought. A philosophy of revolution is a philosophy of work. Sartre is initially circumspect in claiming that work is, among other things, a direct link between man and the universe, man's hold on nature and, at the same time, a primary kind of relation between men, MR 226. Compare this with his remark in the critique 14 years later, the essential discovery of Marxism is that labor, as a historical reality and as the utilization of particular tools in an already determined social and material situation, is the real foundation of the organization of social relation. This discovery can no longer be questioned, CDRI 152 and point 35 emphasis his. This is a fulfillment of the promise voiced in Materialism and Revolution, the liberating element for the oppressed person is work, MR 237. The physical resistance of matter to manual labor, Sartre imagines, also gives rise to the worker's sense of solidarity, his class consciousness, and leads him to understand himself in terms of action and not of being, in effect, human reality is action that is both the unmasking of material reality and its modification. Labor also familiarizes him with necessary violence and, above all, with his freedom as the transcendence of this situation. This is freedom as the possibility of rising above a situation in order to get a perspective on it, not simply a theoretical viewpoint but an indissoluble linking of understanding, compare Hen Zion, an action, MR 235. In the critique, Sartre will describe comprehension as the totalizing grasp of any praxis, human activity in its socio-historical context, in so far as it is intentionally produced by its author or authors, CDR 776, CRDI 190, trans. Amended. Revolutionary thinking expresses a new humanism. The shout that, we too are men, which echoes among the revolutionaries, Sartre will hear voiced on several occasions, not only by the economically exploited but by the colonized and the racially oppressed. What is now at issue and will continue to be is a conflict of humanisms. All of these forms of injustice exhibit a kind of racist bias, as that plaintive cry attests. Bringing the ontology of being and nothingness to bear on the demands of an exploitative society, Sartre lays out the plan for his future social theory, it is the elucidation of the new ideas of situation and of being in the world that revolutionary behavior specifically calls for, MR 253. And because this new humanism is grounded on freedom and not the recognition of historical necessity, as Marxist economism would have us believe, its future is possible but not guaranteed. Precisely because man is free, the triumph of socialism is not at all certain, MR 253. What is literature? Les Temps Modernes, like Sartre himself, was committed to politics, literature, and what the French call Les Sciences Humaines, that we saw included academic anthropology, sociology, psychoanalysis, linguistics, history and, of course, philosophy. Point thirty seven. Several of his major works appeared initially either in part or entirely in the journal. What is literature? Was serialized over six monthly issues. Despite its occasional errors of fact and lax copy editing, which seemed to concern Sartre less as the years went on, this is recognized as a major piece of literary criticism. The interrogative dominates this book. Three of its chapters are titled as questions, What is writing? Why write? And, For whom does one write? Following his recent counsel that the writer's responsibility is not eternal but contemporary, the final chapter addresses, The Situation of the Writer in 1947, see note 36. Let us follow his response to each question as we prepare to assess the situation of the writer at that time. What is writing? In response to this question, Sartre introduces the distinction between poetry and prose that will haunt him in subsequent essays because of his contention that prose can be politically committed whereas what he calls poetry, which includes painting, music and sculpture, cannot. Poetry, in his view, is intransitive, it is for its own sake, whereas prose is transitive, it carries us into the world. He makes an implicit exception for literary prose, as we shall see. 
Besides this famous distinction between poetry and prose, Sartre refers to a parallel and more basic one between sense and signification. Introduced earlier in the imaginary, it appears frequently in Sartre's art and literary criticism, his cultural history, his existential biographies and even his theory of history, once he formulates one with the help of historical materialism and existential psychoanalysis. Admittedly, this is quite a harvest to be gathered from a pair of conceptual seeds, and it would be reckless to ignore the numerous other factors that figure into the development of Sartre's thought in each domain. But the point is that this distinction between sense, sens, which might now be translated as concrete or lived presence, and conceptual meaning, signification, along with the cognate expressions that gather around each lens a unity and coherence to Sartre's thought that survives the transformations and displacements required for his evolution from existential phenomenologist to materialist dialectician. We have been witnessing some of those changes in the collection of essays gathered in this chapter of our study. Sign is the vehicle of prose in the transitive respect just mentioned whereas the image is a feature of poetry, in that it transforms, derealizes, its object into an image, which Sartre, forgetting the lesson of his The Imaginary, sees as a kind of thing. Thus, a cry of grief is a sign of the grief which provokes it, but a song of grief is both grief itself and something other than grief. The empire of signs is prose, poetry is on the side of painting, sculpture, and music, WL 27-28. He insists that, one does not paint significations, one does not put them to music. Under these conditions, he challenges, who would dare require that the painter or the musician commit himself, WL 28. Anticipating a likely counterexample, Sartre challenges, did Picasso's The Massacre at Guernica ever win a single heart to the Spanish cause? He doubts it, prose is capable of being committed and should be, poetry is for its own sake, and for the aesthetic joy it can occasion as a secondary effect, and is incapable of political or moral commitment. Sartre will soon regret this hobbling of poetry when he writes of the African and West Indian poets of liberation in Black Orpheus, 1948. They, in fact, used the language of their colonizers to resist colonialism. The committed writer knows that words are action and that the secondary action affected by prose is action by disclosure. This raises the question, what aspect of the world do you want to disclose? What change do you want to bring into the world by this disclosure? WL 37. At this initial stage it suffices to claim that, the writer has chosen to reveal the world and particularly to reveal man to other men so that the latter may assume full responsibility before the object that has been laid bare, WL 38.39 Subsequently, this will lead Sartre famously to abandon imaginative literature almost entirely. Why write? Each of our perceptions is accompanied by the consciousness that human reality is a revealer, de volante, that is, it is through human reality that, there is, ilya, Heidegger's yes gibbed, being, or, to put it, differently, that man is the means by which things are manifested, WL 48. But Sartre assures his long-standing commitment to ontological realism when he adds that, to our inner certainty of being, revealers, is added that of being inessential in relation to the thing revealed, WL 48. In an anticipation of what decades will later be called, receptionism, in literary theory, Sartre remarks that our, disclosing, whether as author or reader, is, creative, disclosing. In fact, the reader is conscious of disclosing in creating, of creating by disclosing, WL 52. This awareness of freedom that Sartre previously attributed to our imaging consciousness he now seems to ascribe to interpretative acts generally. It will open the way for similar uses in historical writing and reading and to what we shall describe as committed history, as an extension of the committed literature that he is promoting in the mid 1940s. 40 again, he characterizes the production of the literary work of art, adding that the same holds true for painting, music, and sculpture, as acts of generosity, as appeals from one freedom to another, author to reader. If prose is utilitarian, aesthetic communication and the joy it elicits form a complex feeling but one whose structures and condition are inseparable from one another. It is identical, he insists, with the recognition of a transcendent and absolute end which, for a moment, 
suspends the utilitarian round of ends means and means ends. The final goal of art, he claims, is to recover this world by giving it to be seen as it is, but as if it had its source in human freedom, WL 63-64, emphasis added. Using terms and argument from the ontology of BN and especially from the imaginary, Sartre offers a refined and subtle account of this aesthetic modification of the human project such that it implies a pact between human freedoms and an image-making consciousness of the world in its totality both as being and having to be, that is, as fact and as value. But in spite of the momentary suspension of the utilitarian character of prose, literary prose, which is the problem species here, does seem to demand, concrete, read, political, and not merely abstract, freedom, which it likewise fosters in order to succeed. This is why Sartre can assert that no decent literature was produced under the fascists or the Nazis. We now encounter a form of argument that has been favored by classical German idealists like Fichte, Hegel and especially Schiller. The argument, as Sartre elaborates it, is to connect in some demonstrative or at least plausible manner, the freedom that is the definition of the individual with the socio-economic freedom, promised by socialism, via what he calls the aesthetic pact. But to reach Sartre's socialist goal the argument must extend to concrete freedom for everyone and not just for a chosen few. He has been facing that challenge since E.H. Can the aesthetic freedom and the joy that accompanies its successful exercise invite or even demand political freedom or at least, undermine its blockage? Clearly totalitarian governments since Plato have seemed to think so and have censored what the Nazis labeled degenerate art accordingly. In his play Rock and Roll, prominent British playwright Tom Stoppard dramatizes, among other things, the mutual incompatibility of this popular art form and the discipline of the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. Sartre has long valued the democratization of art. Recall his lecture to the students and their parents on the seventh art at their honors ceremony during his first semester of teaching. But it is in W.L. that he draws on the resources of his phenomenological studies to forge an argument between the creation-slash-reception of art and political commitment by means of the experience of freedom. His argument turns on the phenomenological thesis that the aesthetic object is properly the world in so far as it is aimed at through the imaginary, W.L. 64. And the aesthetic pact entered into between artist and audience, he claims, modifies the intersubjective situation of each one's respective project. The factual world as imaged emerges as a value because of its saturation with mutual freedom. That world becomes ours in the aesthetic joy conveyed, or at least made available, to each and everyone. The work of art is both an exigence and a gift, a gift as an act of confidence in the freedom of men, WL 67, and a task proposed to human freedom, WL 65, to maximize the concrete freedom, the choices, for all. Although literature is one thing morality a quite different one, Sartre allows, at the heart of the aesthetic imperative we discern a moral imperative, WL 67. That translates into a number of conclusions, one of which is that, as committed writers, we cannot ignore social injustice in our society when we take up our pens. To do so, he will argue from now on, is to be a party to that injustice itself. We shall encounter this argument for the remainder of Sartre's career. It combines his fundamentally moral outlook with his growing sense of social responsibility. Another conclusion he draws from the foregoing is that, the art of prose is bound up with the only regime in which prose has meaning, democracy, WL 69. Of course, by now we know that this democracy is nurtured by a socialist economic system, a point he will stress in the following section. For whom does one write? After offering us a brief survey of the writer and his public in the 18th and 19th centuries, Sartre notes such writers' preference for abstractions, their penchant for psychological accounts, and their insensitivity to historical context, historialization. Turning to his own critique, Sartre considers how the writer can address those who are willing to hear the message of socio-economic liberation. It won't be the liberal democrat criticized an anti-Semite and Jew, that is, the historical optimist of the Third Republic, who fails to take seriously the warning of Dostoevsky that, if God does not exist, all is permissible, and who reduces moral evil to a mere idea as did Sartre's idealist professors at the Sorbonne. This is why the work of art is irreducible to an idea, 
first, because it is a production or a reproduction of being, that is, of something which never quite allows itself to be thought, then, because this being is totally penetrated by an existence, that is, by a freedom which decides on the very fate of thought. That is also why the artist always had a special understanding of evil, which is not the temporary and remediable isolation of an idea, but the irreducibility of man and the world to thought. Point 42. From 1848 to 1914, Sartre summarizes, the author had to write on principle against all his readers, WL 109, emphasis his. But a virtual public was forming thanks to authors like Proudhon and Marx, the socialists and the communists who, after the Great War, framed a different situation from which and for which to write. The Heideggerian term, historicity, gesticklichkeit, and sometimes, historialization, already employed in BN and employed several times in the notebooks for an ethics now enters the scene. If history, with a Hegelian H, is the study of the dead past under the retrospective illusion of causal necessity, then we can say that, historialization, is the revival of these past moments as, lived absolutes, with their contingency, possibility, and risk. Point 43 It is to this sense that Sartre appeals in his response to the question, for whom does one write? The answer depends on the situation and must be changed accordingly. One does not propose abstract freedom to oppressed and exploited people. But it is Sartre's hope that the rise of class consciousness among the proletariat in the 19th and 20th centuries will invite the writer to realize that union of content and form that had necessarily eluded his bourgeois predecessors. While acknowledging the limitations of his brief history, Sartre tellingly appeals to its conclusion, be it only an ideal, as the discovery of, the pure essence of the literary work and, conjointly, of, that type of public, that is, of society, which it requires. W.L. 134. In short, actual, and act, literature can only realize its full essence in a classless society. Only in such a society could the writer be aware that there is no difference of any kind between his subject and his public. W.L. 137. For the subject of literature has always been man in the world. As that world changed and concrete freedom became objectively possible, a Weberian term Sartre is courting but doesn't use, the writer can address, the sum total of men living in a given society, in social time, WL 136. For, if the public were identified with the concrete universal, the writer would really have to write about the human totality, not about the abstract man of all the ages and for a timeless reader, but about the whole man of his age and his contemporaries, WL 137. Finally, literature would really be anthropological, in the full sense of the term, WL 138. In short, literature is, in essence, the subjectivity of a society in permanent evolution. To be sure, he repeats, this is utopian, WL 139 to 140. Situation of the writer in 1947. I am speaking about the French writer, the only one who has remained a bourgeois, so begins his concluding chapter. Addressing writers who share his historical situation, which includes the violence, the propaganda, the betrayals, the discrediting of trusted individuals and institutions, in sum, the recent war and its immediate aftermath, Sartre expands several of the conclusions drawn in his three previous chapters. The first is the importance of historialization, namely, of facing up to our situation with its limits and opportunities, its liabilities for the past and its possibilities for the future. All of a sudden we found ourselves situated, historicity flowed in upon us, a bitter and ambiguous mixture of the absolute and the transitory, 44 historialization, then, is not a matter of choosing one's age but of choosing oneself within it, WL 195. Sartre has been presenting a lesson in such moral ownership, in this essay and the others in our chapter, especially in Antisemite and Jew. He cites a genealogical example of the various forms of exploitation and bad faith exhibited by three generations of writers, before the Great War, between the World Wars, and the present, post-war generation. This generational reference will prove to be a favored argument that Sartre will repeat, though the subjects change, in The Communist and Peace, The Critique, and The Family Idiot. It reveals yet another, generational path, toward the concrete. The fact is that the purely imaginary and praxis are not easily reconciled, WL 334, 
and point 25. Though directed against the Surrealists' revolution, this remark captures Sartre's thought as well, especially his politically committed writings following the liberation. References to image and the imaginary in our present chapter have suggested this and the rest of our study will confirm Sartre's quasi-confessional claim. An effect of the peculiarly French experience of the war and occupation, Sartre seems to believe, is that it gives the lie to moral relativism. Not in favor of absolute good, perhaps, unless one assigns that honorific to freedom, but clearly to absolute evil. He cites torture as the paradigm. Hinted at in his early works but now brought to center stage is Sartre's theodicy. This is a branch of metaphysics formulated by Leibniz to justify the ways of God to men, that is, to reconcile the various evils in creation, physical, metaphysical, and moral, with the existence of a good and omnipotent God. Sartre's is a failed theodicy, I would argue, but a theodicy nonetheless in that it addresses the justification of evil in the world. Its message is that evil is real and that it cannot be redeemed. WL 180, C. Sit 7 332 342. The former he argues against his idealist professors like Loan Brunschvik, who insist that evil does not exist except as a function of ignorance, the latter is sustained against his Christian compatriots who seek to overcome evil with absolute good. Sartre gives this problem full artistic expression in his play The Devil and the Good Lord. Lucifer and the Lord, 1951, and in his extraordinary existential biography, Saint Genet, Actor and Martyr, 1952, the effect of dialectical materialism, as he claims to have shown presumably in Materialism and Revolution, is to make good and evil vanish conjointly. On that view, there remains only the historical process, WL 178. Sartre exhorts the writer to create a literature of production, of praxis, to counter the bourgeois literature of consumption, whose model is Gide, CWL 119. To counteract his critics, he argues that, if negativity is one aspect of freedom, constructiveness is the other, WL 191, emphasis added. For, production, read praxis, understood as, action in history and on history, that is a synthesis of historical relativity in moral and metaphysical absolute, with this hostile and friendly, terrible and derisive worlds which it reveals to us, WL 194. We will make frequent reference to praxis and its dialectical rationality, when it supplants consciousness in search for a method and a critique. Finally, Sartre reaffirms the moral exigence lodged in the aesthetic experience and he translates it into the demand to convert the city of ends, his version of Kant's moral kingdom, into a concrete and open society, and this by the very content of our works, WL 221, emphasis added. For even if formal beauty elicited a general feeling of good will toward everyone as an end in himself, Sartre cautions, the concrete reality of our present society is that it is built on violence. We must historicize the reader's good will by directing his attention on the oppressed of the world. But we will have accomplished nothing if, in addition, we do not show him, and in the very warp and weft of the work, that it is quite impossible to treat concrete men as ends in contemporary society, WL 222. What he calls, the present paradox of ethics, WL 221, figures centrally in his dialectical ethics and reappears five years later in St. Genet as the present alienation of man, namely, the fact that ethics is for us inevitable and at the same time impossible, SG 185N. The task of the committed artist is to exhibit this paradox. Clearly, art as such is not enough. Chapter 10 Ends and Means, Existential Ethics. On November 1, 1946, Sartre delivered a lecture entitled, The Writer's Responsibility, for the inaugural General Conference of UNESCO at the Sorbonne. In view of the auspicious nature of this founding symposium, he concludes with a litany of recommendations that he believes should guide the writer in our day. 1. To create a positive theory of liberation and freedom. 2. To put himself in a position to condemn violence from the viewpoint of oppressed men and classes. 3. To establish a true relationship of ends and means. 4. To immediately reject, in his own name, which, of course, will not prevent it, any violent means of establishing a regime. 5. Finally, to devote his thoughts without respite, day in, day out, 
to the problem of the end and the means, or, alternatively, the problem of the relation between ethics and politics. Underscoring the timeliness of these remarks, he adds, that is the problem, of the present age, and it is our problem, it belongs to us writers. That is our responsibility, not eternal but contemporary, one this exhortation underscores the fundamentally moral character of Sartre's thought. He concluded his first major essay, Transcendence of the Ego, with the prospect that no more is needed in the way of a philosophical foundation for an ethics and a politics which are absolutely positive too and he ended his final attempt at an ethics, an ethics of the we, with an encomium of revolution as replacing our present situation by a more just society in which human beings can have good relations with each other, a society in which relations among human beings are ethical. Though Sartre rather consistently opposed what he called Machiavellianism, understood popularly as the notion that politics is amoral and that the end justifies the means, he had to come to terms with the morality of violence, especially the consequentialism of the revolutionary claim that one must crack a few eggs to make an omelette. This tension grew as he became more actively engaged with the French Communist Party, 1952-1956, a period he recalled as one of immoral realism, or R79, it haunted his involvement with the Algerian Revolution and his subsequent relations with the Maoists. It was the year when he began fellow traveling with the communists that he wrote in St. Genet, any ethic which does not explicitly profess that it is impossible today contributes to the bamboozling and alienation of men. The ethical problem arises from the fact that ethics is for us inevitable and at the same time impossible, 186n, emphasis his. Nearly a decade later, Sartre would emphasize this agony even more forcefully, in implicit debate with Albert Camus over the Algerian Revolution, with his preface to France Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth.4 As a journalist born and raised in Algeria, Albert Camus had long defended the Arab population against oppression by the French minority. But as a pacifist, he believed it was in the interests of the Arabs to pursue autonomy within the French Union rather than seek complete independence by violent rebellion. Sartre, on the contrary, held this view in utter contempt. A fine sight they are too, the believers in non-violence, saying that they are neither executioners nor victims, allusion to a line in Camus the Plague. Very well then, if you are not victims when the government which you voted for, when the army in which your younger brothers are serving without hesitation or remorse have undertaken race murder, you are without a shadow of a doubt, executioner. We 25. If the political and the ethical have been moving in parallel streams in Sartre's works, often watering the same landscape, they come into full confluence in the concept of collective responsibility when he concludes. But if the whole regime, even your non-violent ideas, are conditioned by a thousand-year-old oppression, your passivity serves only to place you in the ranks of the oppressors. 5. We shall follow these streams and their confluence in this chapter and the next. The first stream, stages on Sartre's ethical way. It is common to gather Sartre's reflections on ethics into two or even three stages, reflecting his respective methods and ontologies. The initial stage is the phenomenological, followed by the dialectical and finally, what may be called the dialogical. We shall consider each stage in terms of the major works that ground and exhibit it. For the ethics of authenticity, the leading work is Sartre's posthumously published notebooks for an ethics, though many of its insights were anticipated in texts that we have already discussed, like what is literature. His dialectical ethics is formulated in the notes for a single lecture, Ethics and Society, presented at the Gramsci Institute in Rome in 1964, and a series of talks, Ethics and History scheduled for delivery at Cornell University the following year but cancelled in objection to America's escalation of its war in Vietnam. Point six, The Social Ontology of the Critique, 1960, laid the groundwork for this second ethics. The dialogical ethics or what he described as an ethics of the we consists of the recorded conversations that the now blind Sartre held with his secretary and confidant Benny Le Vy toward the end of his life. Sartre's seemingly wholesale rejection of earlier positions in these conversations and his apparent softness on quasi-religious themes that he had previously dismissed shocked both Simone de Beauvoir and Raymond Aron. They saw them as the ramblings of a sick old man under the influence of an aggressive religious convert. However one may assess this apparent volte-face and the ethics that it sketched, 
it should already have become clear that many, though certainly not all, of the allegedly shocking remarks in these interviews should not have disturbed anyone who cared to hear what Sartre had been saying over a good part of his public life. Not that one could have predicted this conversion without the catalytic presence of Benny Le Vy, but that, in retrospect, one can notice a series of remarks, some offhand but others quite relevant to the discussion, that make this change less radical than might otherwise have been expected. We shall address these last two ethics in chapter 14 below, once their appropriate ontologies and contexts have been considered in the intervening chapter. Ethics of Authenticity, Notebooks for an Ethics We have discussed Sartre's initial reflections on authenticity in his War Diaries, where his shift was from Stoicism to Authenticity, 7 and in Being and Nothingness, where he concluded the text with a set of questions that can find their reply only on the ethical plane. He assured us, we shall devote to them a future work, BN 628. The 574 pages of notebooks constitute Sartre's initial attempt to make good on that promise. Sartre left this material unpublished in his lifetime, probably because he considered it too idealist in nature, so are 234. He saw it as, completely mystified, due to its insensitivity to the materialist dimension of the ethical, film 103, an ethic by an author for author, pretending to write for those who did not write, as he put it point eight by then he was already moving into the dialectical stage of his thought. Still, these pages contain a wealth of insights that complement and in important respects revise the popular image of existentialist ethics gathered from the conflictual relations analyzed in being and nothingness and dramatized in his popular play, No Exit. Rather than a close and extended reading of the entire text, 9 I shall discuss several theses and themes that constitute what I take to be the major contributions of this work to what we understand as Sartre's existentialist ethics. Authenticity. Let us begin with the signature term of that ethics. Earlier we contrasted it with bad faith and likened it to good faith, while admitting that the relationships are problematic in Sartre's own usage point 10 but authenticity is clearly a moral value for Sartre. Like good faith, it carries a cognitive dimension that excludes self-deception. But it also resists the inertia of the spirit of seriousness that relies on formulating ethical ready-mades to cloak its freedom and the anguish that accompanies. In effect, the authentic individual eleven embraces his contingency the way Nietzsche's individual embraces the eternal recurrence and Heidegger's authentic individual resolutely grasps his mortal temporality, his being unto death, point twelve one is reminded of Sartre's famous challenge to the young man facing a far-reaching moral dilemma, you are free, so choose, in other words, invent, eh thirty-three. He even risked likening moral choice to constructing a work of art, but hastened to caution, we are not espousing an aesthetic morality, E.H. 45. Some of his critics fail to honor that caveat. Gift response. In notebooks that risk is intensified when he extends the model of gift response between artist and viewer, author and reader, from his aesthetic writings to authentic interpersonal relations and even to political situations, where one hopes to communicate among free agents without alienating or objectifying them in the process. We have encountered this model in the author-reader relation discussed in What is Literature, serialized in LTM, while the notebooks were being composed. In the notebooks we find this analogy elaborated. The work of art, for example, demands that its content be recognized materially by the freedom of a concrete public. It is gift and demand at the same time, and only makes a demand insofar as it gives something. It does not ask for the adhesion of a pure freedom, but rather that of a freedom engaged in generous feelings, which it transforms. It is therefore something completely other than a right. It is the means of directly affecting a qualified freedom. Any 141. As the work of art reaches its aesthetic actualization when individuals adopt the aesthetic attitude by considering the artifact as an analogon, the thesis of the imaginary, so social relations must move beyond the abstract freedom of man in general, the tiresome character of a humanism founded on rights, any 140, by a generous, transformative attitude toward concrete freedoms. Relations among men must be based upon this model if men want to exist as freedom for one another first, by the intermediary of the work, technical as well as aesthetical, political, etc., second, the work always being considered as a gift, 
The beautiful is a gift above all else. The beautiful is the world considered as given. The work being the particularity of the person and his image as given back by the world, it is in treating my work as inhabited by a concrete freedom that you treat my me as freedom. Whereas if you turn directly toward this me, it evaporates into abstract freedom. Any 141. Positive Reciprocity. This is the lesson of the notebooks to supplement the adversarial image of the interpersonal in being and nothingness. It relies on generosity, gift appeal and more fundamentally, the concept of positive reciprocity so clearly lacking in being and nothingness, which Sartre once described as his, eidetic of bad faith. If anti-Semite and Jew counsel that we change the, bases and structures, of the anti-Semite's choice, that is, his, situation, since we cannot deal causally with another freedom directly, the notebooks has added the model of gift appeal from one concrete freedom to another as the means of directly affecting a qualified freedom. Any 141. Mutual recognition. The request as distinct from the order, which elsewhere Sartre calls the other in us, 13 is an appeal for collaboration and reciprocity in action. It involves a comprehension, that is, an understanding of the other's goal or purpose. This understanding is concrete and contextual. It is essential to authentic interpersonal relations. As Sartre explains, I recognize the freedom of the one to whom I make my request, I recognize the legitimacy of his ends, not because they are absolute but because he wants them. At the same time, I ask that this freedom recognize my freedom and my ends and that, through this reciprocal recognition, we bring about a certain kind of interpenetration of freedoms which may indeed be the human realm. Northeast 290 emphasis added, in his dialogical ethics, it is called, the ethical realm. In sum, the appeal, in effect, is a promise of reciprocity, NE 284. Authentic and inauthentic love. Sartre has not abandoned the inauthenticity depicted in being and nothingness. Indeed, he seems to build upon it. Consider his account of authentic love, which advances us significantly beyond the limitations of being for others explained in the earlier work. No love without that sadistic masochistic dialectic of subjugation that I described, in BN. No love without deeper recognition and reciprocal comprehension of freedoms, a missing dimension in BN. However, to attempt to bring about a love that would surpass the sadistic masochistic stage of desire and of enchantment would be to make love disappear, that is, the sexual as a type of unveiling the human. Tension is necessary to maintain the two faces of ambiguity, to hold them within the unity of one and the same project. There is no synthesis given as to be attained, it has to be invented. Any 414 to 415, emphasis added. And this invention is an ongoing process. It is a project of doing and not the stasis of being, which would betray the ontology of inauthenticity found in BN. We must remember that the Sartrean ontology, based on consciousness in being in nothingness and on praxis in the critique, is dynamic and processive. The moral virtue of authenticity embraces this dynamism in its concrete occurrence while resisting the tendency to flee the anguish which such freedom and contingency entail toward inauthentic identity and thing-like permanence. The notebooks amplify the meaning of the situation in which we find ourselves exactly as Sartre recommended in Materialism and Revolution. 14 Authentic Love builds on the claim of E.H. that concrete freedom requires that everyone be free. Sartre admits that the appeal or gift can be undermined by bad faith if the society is rent by divisions of class or caste. In an alienated society, he insists, all behavior must be alienating, even generosity. NE 368. In other words, individual and interpersonal authenticity depend on what in anti-Semite and Jew he called the bases and structures, the situation, of choice. An authentic appeal therefore has to be conscious of being a surpassing of every inequality of condition toward a human world where any appeal of anyone to anyone will always be possible, NE 285. When the gift is given between equals without reciprocal alienation, 15 its acceptance is as free, disinterested, and unmotivated as the gift itself. Like the gift, it is freeing. This is the case in an evolved civilization for the gift of the work of art to a spectator, NE370. Again, this resembles Beauvoir's concept of an open future. Returning to the example of authentic love, consider the following. Here is an original structure of authentic love, 
we shall have to describe many other such structures to unveil the other's being within the world, to take up this unveiling, and to set this being within the Absolute, to rejoice in it without appropriating it, to give it safety in terms of my freedom, and to surpass it only in terms of the other's ends. Any 208, remarks like these abound in the notebooks. They can be read as ambiguous evidence, first, in support of Sartre's dismissal of the text as idealist and mystified, but in retrospect, from the perspective of the Lou V.Y. interviews, these statements render less than shocking what could be read as a return of the repressed in his final months. At this point it must suffice simply to foreground the ambiguity. My choice to help another freedom, in Sartre's view, expresses my basic project to maximize concrete freedoms, read possibilities, in a finite world. He later states this in Heideggerian terms as, unveiling, and manifesting being point 18 in contrast, Sartre dubs, inauthentic, our original, pre-reflective, choice, to be in itself for itself or God. This project, he claims, is first in the sense that it is the very structure of my existence, NE 559. Such an ontological characterization of our original condition leaves problematic what Sartre will soon be historicizing, namely, the sense that our individual conversion could enable us to embrace our contingency and spontaneity even as we take distance on, or even learn, to live without, our egos. Our seemingly inevitable immersion in bad faith is countered by the possibility that a collective change in the bases and structures of our social choices, most notably the emergence of a society of material abundance, might yield a condition where, the possibility of inauthenticity, is reduced, if not abolished altogether. Sartre had left the door open in BN for a possible, conversion, which entailed the liberation from bad faith and a self-recovery of being, that we shall call authenticity, BN 70N. An intranscendence of the ego he had already distinguished between the self, which is pre-reflective, and the ego and the me, which are the products of our reflective consciousness. Now he informs us that the authentic individual must learn to live without the ego, NE414, or a me, and that the obsidity, selfness, of calling things into question must take its place, NE478. As he recommended earlier, get rid of the I and the me. In their place, put subjectivity as a lived, monadic totality that refers to the self of consciousness by itself, the obsidity just mentioned, 19. Conversion. All this is affected by what in B.N. Sartre called a pure or purifying reflection as distinct from an impure or accessory reflection, our standard turning back on ourselves that produces the ego and the me of reflective psychology, that a psychic object. What makes pure reflection different and difficult to conceive is that it seems to reflect without objectifying. In effect, it purports to catch consciousness on the wing. This yields an intensified grasp of the pre-reflective such as Sartre describes in the phenomenological ontology of being and nothingness. Point 20 Sartre does speak of purifying reflection as a catharsis, BN 159-160, and it seems to carry an evaluative significance especially in the notebooks. If one simply limits the purifying reflection to the process of changing one's fundamental choice in the sense that it is a criterion constituting choice such as we can find in Kierkegaard, then the name conversion is appropriate. It then denotes a radical shift of the fundamental project to abandon the desire to be God, in itself or itself, and authentically to live one's selfness, ipsiety, spontaneously and without an ego. But let me repeat that this is a problematic concept that Sartre appears to have abandoned in his later years. Point 21. Authenticity and History. The general direction of our philosophical biography is toward the concrete. Such was the direction of being and nothingness, and such has been the vector of Sartre's thought ever since. This continues in his account of authenticity, a multifaceted concept, as we have been observing. One of these aspects that plays a particularly crucial role in rendering concrete the authentic individual is what Sartre calls historialization. Inspired by Heidegger's concept of historicity, in Sartre's usage, it denotes action as revealing slash unifying being from my point of view, NE 486. Historialization entails a kind of Nietzschean embrace of my life and my epoch to the fullest rather than seeking refuge in a high-altitude overview, conscience de serval, of the era. In Sartre's words, 
It is not a matter of choosing one's age but of choosing oneself within it, WL 195. But in his case, this is pursued under the aspect of freedom, the maximization of possibility for self and others. It amounts to commitment to addressing the ethical problems of one's situation, now expanded to include the society in which one lives, with its socio-economic conditions, its present issues and its possibilities as Sartre challenged the writer in what is literature. But in that same text he raises the political dimension of his approach to art, freedom of writing implies the freedom of the citizen. One does not write for slaves. The art of prose is bound up with the only regime in which prose has meaning, democracy. When one is threatened, the other is too. And it is not enough to defend them with the pen, he writes presaging his abandonment of literature for more direct political involvement, a day comes when the pen is forced to stop, and the writer must then take up arms, WL 69. A Treatise on Violence. What are the relationships between ends and means in a society based on violence? WL 192. Sartre devotes pages 170 to 215 of the notebooks to a mini treatise on violence. That violence bears a striking resemblance to the violence Sartre experienced in the 1930s and 1940s, namely what we might call fascist violence. He admits that he is describing the universe of violence, namely, the universe as it appears when violence is taken as an end. The extreme case, NE 178. This is the world of the person who is in bad faith, the one who subscribes to the maxim that the end justifies the means, indeed, any means whatsoever. 22 Elsewhere, Sartre has mitigated this claim by appeal to counterviolence, structural violence and especially a degree of violence that would destroy the very goal for which it was employed. In the last instance, we are no longer dealing with the extreme case. In opposition to the authentic ethic just described, the violent man prefers being to doing, any 182. The goal and final justification of violence is always unity, being in itself, any 186. Accordingly, Sartre can rise to the macro level of his analysis and proclaim, the Hegelian dialectic, with its tragic universe, is the very image of violence because he has described the negation of negation and is confident about a whole that will make the positive spring forth from this negation of negation, any 184. For an example of what I have labeled fascist violence, consider the principles of what Sartre calls the ethic of force, which is simply an ethics of violence justifying itself, any 186. Listed among its 14 commandments are, 1, the victor is always right, 2, the principle of harshness, 3, love for the struggle, 4, the value of evil that cleanses and purifies like a fire, 13, the beauty of pessimism, violence and aesthetics, and 14, realism, in the name of efficacy, any 186.23 the list could set the framework for an amorality play. Sartre has drawn on these values for several of his plays. Authenticity in an inauthentic world, St. Genet. As if the notebooks had never been written, Sartre responded to a question about his depiction of negative love in being and nothingness, beginning with St. Genet I changed my position a bit, and I now see more positivity in love, I wrote St. Genet to try to present a love that goes beyond the sadism in which Genet is steeped and the masochism that he suffered, as it were, in spite of himself, Shilp 13. His 578-page Introduction to the Collected Works of Jean Genet, 1952, was seen by some as the long-awaited ethics promised in being in nothingness. Point 24 It certainly does treat of good and evil and, in Sartre's view, presents the model of as authentic an individual as he ever depicted. Beauvoir notes the increasing importance that Sartre has been giving to social conditioning in his post-war works. What is striking about this work is that there is scarcely an ounce of freedom ascribed to man. You give an extreme importance to the formation of the individual, to his conditioning, to which he responds defensively, the transformation of Jean Genet, from unhappy child homosexual into Jean Genet great writer, homosexual by choice and, if not happy, at least sure of himself, is truly due to the use of his freedom. It transformed the meaning, sense, of the world by giving it another value. It is certainly this freedom and nothing else that was the cause of this reversal, it is freedom choosing itself that brought about this transformation, so are 449.
Echoing his earlier claims about the important role of situation in conceiving a revolutionary philosophy, materialism and revolution, and the decisive function of the bases and structures of choice in fostering an agent's action, anti-Semite and Jew, this exchange between Beauvoir and Sartre underscores again the ambiguity of the given and the taken, facticity and transcendence. That has plagued Sartre's thought since B.N. The force of circumstance will continue to grow until it gains nearly equal importance, with transcendence in the concepts of free organic praxis and the dialectic of the critique. So, in the existentialist tradition, what does Jean Genet make of what has been made of him? The moments in that metamorphosis anticipate the moments in Flaubert's transformation from the family idiot, passively constituted, to the cynical night of nothingness, to the poet, to the novelist, all occurring under the aspect of the negative point. Twenty-five. Sartre admitted that his Flaubert study was a sequel to Saint Genet, but he allowed that it was a sequel to the imaginary in search for a method as well. When we reach the family idiot, we will discover that these characteristics are not mutually exclusive, that they enhance the significance of that massive enterprise. Point 26 considered to be one of Sartre's finest achievements, the biographical novel, on Genet's life and work serves a bridge role in Sartre's oeuvre. It incorporates many concepts from being and nothingness, the ontology of in itself, for itself and for others, bad faith, the cardinal categories of being and doing, the sadomasochistic conception of love, an emphasis on the imaginary and consciousness in its pre-reflective and reflective levels. But there are indications that problems and concepts calling for the critique are already present in this ample and intensely written work. Chief among these are the appeal to praxis, already at work in W.L., an emphasis on positive reciprocity as a fact and an ideal exemplified in Genuine Love, SG 328, a sense of the limit of psychoanalytic explanations, appeal to a dialectic that flattens into the circular, an implicit demand for the mediating third party, that will appear in the critique to resolve seemingly intransigent dichotomies, and an increased role for the imagination in ethical and political contexts. For these reasons, St. Genet brings to term many established existentialist concepts even as it opens the door to dialectical and praxis-oriented conditions and comprehension. The Spiral or the Whirligig, Tourniquet. In a letter to Simone Jolivet, Toulouse, Sartre avows, all that I know is I would like to construct an ethics in which evil is an integral part of good. 27 He sees two dialectics at work in the young Genet's attempt to overcome his original alienation the familiar alternative of, inauthentic, being, in the eyes of others, in opposition to, authentic, doing, non-thetic self-consciousness of his ability to act otherwise. The two dialectics that control his inner life run counter to each other, they jam, and finally they get twisted and whirl about idly, SG 329. And yet, Janet wills their, impossible, unity. What results, on Sartre's reading, is a hellish merry-go-round of alternatives taken to their extremes in the adolescent Genet's life, the hero and the saint, the criminal and the traitor, the active and the passive homosexual, the evil of consciousness and the consciousness of evil. In short, thesis and antithesis represent two moments of freedom. But these two segments, instead of merging in a harmonious synthesis, to deny the false in order to affirm the true, to destroy in order to build, remain mutilated and abstract and perpetuate their opposition, SG 338. Sartre is offering us a glimpse into an existential psychoanalysis that has yet to find its cure. Perhaps the resolution of this vicious circle will reveal itself in The Last Contradiction, Dream and Reality. As Sartre did with nausea and will repeat in his autobiography and his other biographies, he is testing the salvific power of the imaginary. In the context of the prodigious power of the negative, he interprets the choice of the imaginary as the derealization of himself in the poetic, because it unfolds both in the dimension of the real and in that of the dream, SG 351. He has yet to link this dichotomy with absolute evil or its magical transformation into absolute good, but the emergence of beauty, and his subsequent commitment to the world of poetry and theater, enables him, as it will Flaubert, to draw the public into his realm, beyond the commonplace alternatives of good and evil, to the aesthetic sphere where creative freedom rules. Acknowledging that, the imaginary corrodes praxis, SG 352, 418, 
Sartre's Janet realizes that the derealization of the real was an attempt at synthesis, he wanted to unify his realism and his power to dream. The synthesis has failed, why not attempt the inverse operation, why not realize the imaginary? To realize the imaginary means to include the imaginary in reality while preserving its imaginary nature, it means unifying, within the same project, his realistic intention and his derealizing intention. SG 418 this is precisely how Sartre described the work of art in the imaginary point 28 Genet has moved from aestheticism to art, from gesture to act. This pure freedom of the artist no longer knows either good or evil, or rather, it now makes of them only the object of its art, Genet has liberated himself, SG 422.29. Genet as a model of authenticity. It is clear that Sartre admires Jean Genet, not despite his playing the role of antithesis to entrenched bourgeois morality but because of it. Janet's logic of loser wins pushes the envelope of the thought and behavior of the just and reasonable man beyond the limit. His Nietzschean inversion of received values opens the door for moral creativity in anticipation of the dialectical ethics yet to be conceived. His learning to say, we, SG 403, opens a field of generosity, that fosters and is fostered by the social dimension of Janet's later life. In this, he replaces the model of the mythical, solitary individual of Sartre's school days and early writing. With the mature Janet, Sartre avows, For a long time we believed in social atomism bequeathed to us by the 18th century, and it seemed to us that man was by nature a solitary entity who entered into relations with his fellow men afterward, the truth is that, human reality, is in society, as it, is in the world, it is neither a nature nor a state, it is made. SG 590. Genet's is an ethic of, doing, fair, transformed from an earlier, inauthentic, ethic of being, in the eyes of others. Yet it is immersed in a world that renders the ideal of absolute reciprocity scarcely conceivable. It is concealed by the historical conditioning of class and race, by nationalities, by the social hierarchy, SG 590-591. Concealed, we should note, not destroyed. I suggested that Janet replaced Sartre's solitary man, but one might better say that he relocated it in a socio-historical setting. Janet's impossible nullity, Sartre insists, is solitude, not physical isolation. He continues, our solitude is the way we feel our objectivity for others in our subjectivity and on the occasion of failure, SG 592. Sartre would characterize artistic creativity both here and especially in the Flaubert as failure behavior, conduit d check, point 30 a reiteration of loser wins, the creation of the work of art draws the inhabitants of the real freely into the realm of the imaginary where the artist rules. How, then, are we to live this ethics that is at once necessary and impossible? Sartre's ethics of action must give itself ethical norms in the climate of non-transcendable impossibility. Again his advice, choose, that is, create, and assume responsibility for your choices. This, he implies, would be the temptation of real morality, because it is beyond being as it is beyond evil. Janet has freed himself from good and evil, he has steadily played loser wins, SG 571 and 574. The most extraordinary example of the whirligig of being and appearance, of the imaginary and the real, is to be found in one of Janet's plays, The Maids, SG 611. Sartre points out that, the truth of the matter is that Janet wishes from the very start to strike at the root of the apparent, SG 611, emphasis his. Referring implicitly to BN, Sartre reminds us that he has shown that, an appearance borrows its being from being, SG 625. But the imaginary may afford us a respite, from the demands of the real or even offer a way of living amidst the insuperable conflicts of action and opinion that mark the real. Bringing his analysis to a close, Sartre combines the ethical and the political when he compares Janet to the old Bolshevik, Nikolai Bukharin. In the Moscow show trials of 1936-1938, Bukharin accepted, objective, guilt for something of which he was subjectively, personally, innocent. In effect, he sacrificed himself, and the truth, to the party and its policies, assessed by another standard of truth. Janet, in Sartre's view, is the Bukharin of bourgeois society, SG 594. 
The just and the moral public condemn his depravity, his crimes, and the disgust his literature elicits. But, unlike Bukharin, Janet, proclaims in defiance of all that he is right to be wrong. Heel one declares himself right. He knows that his testimony is inadequate and he maintains it because of its inadequacy he is proud of being right in the realm of the impossible and of testifying to the impossibility of everything, SG 595-596. Sartre now appeals implicitly to two of his political morality tales and prepares us for a third to bring to our attention his claim that, Janet is we. Like Hugo in Dirty Hands, 31 who was executed for refusing to conform to a change in the party line, and Franz in The Condemned of Altena, who takes full responsibility before future generations who will judge him, us, guilty for our present crimes, Janet faces us with the challenge to conform to social strictures or to forge our own path. Assuming that the future will entangle us in objective guilt of one kind or another, at that point, Sartre believes, we will have to choose, we, will be either Bukharin or Janet. Bukharin or our will to be together carried to the point of martyrdom, Janet or our solitude carried to the point of passion, SG 599. Yet he offers us hope with another option. If there is still time to reconcile, with a final effort, the object and the subject, he counsels, we must, be it only once and in the realm of the imaginary, have the courage to go to the limits of ourselves in both directions at once. Again, the imaginary, with all its limits, comes to the rescue, or seems to do so. Presumably this occurs by the reading of Genet's collected works to which St. Genet serves as the introduction. But this imaginative resolution might equally be achieved by taking to heart the message of the third play just mentioned, The Devil and the Good Lord.32. The Devil and the Good Lord an exchange of dialectics. This is acknowledged as a clearly autobiographical work as, one can argue, is Sartre's Saint Genet, produced a year later. Both texts depict concretely the dilemma of someone trying to live authentically in an inauthentic world. Gone is the option of simply changing oneself rather than one situation, a solution appealing to, stoic, or what I called, noetic, freedom in BN. In both cases, we have suspended the presumably defining mantra of vintage existentialism. A man can always make something out of what is made of him, BM 35. Set in the time of the peasant rebellion during the Reformation in Germany, this tale recounts the conversion of its hero, Goetz, from the pursuit of absolute evil to that of absolute good. It appears that the destruction of human lives is inevitable in either case. But the plight of the priest, Heinrich, underscores the same problem from another angle. As Sartre explains, nowadays, we know there are some situations that corrupt an individual right into his inmost being. One such is the moral dilemma facing Heinrich. If he sides with the poor, he betrays the church, but if he sides with the church, he betrays the poor. It is not sufficient to say that there is a conflict in him, he himself is the conflict. His problem is absolutely insoluble, for he is mystified to the marrow of his bone. Out of this horror of himself he chooses to be evil. Some situations can be desperate. Point 33. Two morals are set forth from this story. First, that even the best of choices leave us with, dirty hands, the play that the devil is said to complement, and second, that in the choice between the human and the absolute, between man and God, the option for man will do less harm. We shall call this Sartre's mitigated or chastened humanism. As we move to a more explicit consideration of the political stream of Sartre's thought, let us ease the transition with reference to violence. Once more, it is a common difficulty for the means and relationship in both ethics and politics. As Sartre admits, there is a criticism by Catholics which seems to me to have more truth in it, that the reign of godless man begins in violence. I am well aware of that. But history shows pretty well that the reign of God too is accompanied by violence, st. 237. 11 Means and Ends, Political Existentialism. In this chapter a return to the texts that form the common source for the ethical and political streams mentioned in the previous chapter. But now our intent is to review some of the same institutions, structures, and events from the perspective of Sartre's developing political theory and practice. Perforce, such a move will entail some repetition, a certain rerun of the film for the sake of a perspective politically enriched much as Heidegger famously ventured when he undertook a Wiederholen, 
repetition, of the first portion of being and time under the aspect of temporality, in the second. The political significance rather eclipsed in the previous chapter should now achieve full view. As a student in the Lycee, the young Sartre did not display a serious interest in political theory or in practical politics generally. His natural tendencies were anarchic. Toward the end of his years at the ENS, however, he did publish an informed essay on contemporary French legal theories, The Theory of State in Modern French Thought, 1927. It was in the fall of that year that his close friend Paul Nizan joined the French Communist Party, PCF. Nizan would later spend an idealistic year in the USSR and return to lecture Sartre, Beauvoir and their mutual friends on the promise of the Soviet Revolution. Sartre's interests, at that time, were more literary and philosophical than political. He resisted the siren call of socialism, for example, that had turned the heads of many of his classmates at the École, including Raymond Aaron. Point one eschewing party adherents, Sartre nonetheless was strongly opposed to colonialism, which he regarded as a sordid form of state takeover. The young Sartre harbored a basic egalitarian spirit from his early teens and, as he recalled, thought of the French control of Algeria whenever the injustice of colonialism came to mind, Suar 478. As his lifelong companion Simone de Beauvoir remarks, they showed little concern for politics after graduation and did not even vote in the critical general election of 1936 that ushered in the socialist program of the Front Populaire. But even in those years his tendencies veered toward the left. As we review Sartre's life from the political angle, we discern several stages in the development of his political thought and action. It extends from early indifference mixed with sympathy for the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War, through resistance to Nazi domination everywhere, to a favoring of leftist movements generally and passed through a period of immoralist political realism, in association with the PCF. His relation with the PCF cooled with the repression of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 and ended with total rejection of the party in 1968, accompanied by a sympathetic identity with the direct action of the extreme left in the late 1960s and early 1970s. This trajectory concluded in a kind of muted optimism regarding the possibility of social reform in his discussions with Benny Le Vy in his final years. In a number of conversations with two Maoist friends, one of whom would become his last secretary, Sartre recalled having been a sounding board for politics without directly engaging in it for most of his life. Point two, if sounding board denotes committing his pen to leftist causes as well as signing petitions and participating in public protests, Sartre, in the second half of his life, was a political sounding board par excellence. As we prepare to chart his career, we should note several features of Sartre's political thought that will appear rather consistently. First, he approached the political as a moralist searching for those individuals who were responsible in an ethically evaluative sense for seemingly impersonal social movements such as racism, colonialism and capitalism. Not that he rejected structural causality or its moral aspects, Pace Lewis Althusser, we shall see him insisting apropos of colonialism that the meanness is in the system, three, but the responsible individuals are the prey of the existentialist. Secondly, his conception of political commitment involved a curiously ambivalent attitude toward physical violence. Though he opposed violence for its own sake, in a society such as ours in which he believed violence was systemic, he considered violent opposition to be counterviolence and thus justified within limits. Point four. Thirdly, he maintained a fundamentally anarchistic view of authority and a pessimistic opinion of social relations. Despite flashes of enthusiasm in later life for the effectiveness of small, spontaneously organized action groups such as party cells, that threatened exploitative institutions, they seemed often, if not always, to be absorbed by those organizations or to harden into similar collectives themselves. Sartre gave this as the reason why his critique of dialectical reason should be read as a fundamentally anti-communist book, a Marxist work written against the communists, as he put it, point five so let us pursue this path according to several shifts in his political stance. Keeping in mind that there is an ethical dimension to most of these moves as Sartre seeks to determine the responsible party sustaining and navigating the waves of impersonal structures and social causes, an existentialist. Hallmark. Political bent of the student, scholar, teacher, 1915-1939. 
In his early years, Sartre's relation to the political was oblique, on the one hand, it reflected his relations with his maternal grandfather, his stepfather and, on the other, it was influenced by his friends and teachers at the two prestigious Parisian lycées he attended, Henri Ivan Louis Le Grand, and the ENS. The two adults exemplified the moderate conservative ideals of the Radical Socialist Party of the Third Republic, which each seemed to champion and which Sartre dismissed as the party of functionaries, anticlericals, and the petit bourgeoisie. His close, long-lasting friendship with Paul Nizan, on the other hand, certainly affected Sartre's distrust of the Communist Party that was never completely healed, even in the midst of his fellow traveling in the early 1950s. Nizan, who died at the Battle of Dunkirk in May of 1940, had renounced his allegiance to the party the year before because of its support of the non-aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin which cleared the way for the invasion of Poland. The party responded by vilifying Nizan as a traitor and government informer. In 1947, Sartre joined Franco I. S. Moriac, Raymond Aron and many others in an open letter to the leaders of the PCF, challenging them either to furnish evidence behind their smear campaign against Nizan's name or to retract these accusations publicly. Point six. Although he came under the influence of the charismatic pacifist professor known as Alain at the Lice E. Henri IV, Sartre's own pacifism seems to have been rather short-lived and superficial. By the time he undertook military service during the Phony War of 1939-1940, Sartre had all but buried those inclinations in the face of the Nazi attack. Still, we witness him recording in his war diaries on several occasions the tension at play in his personal life between the stoicism that had attracted him in college and which he associated with a land's pacifist arguments and the quest for authenticity. Point seven. But it was anti-militarism rather than opposition to violence per se that fed Sartre's pacifism. This would surface in his war diaries and thereafter, especially in his frequent descriptions of the counter-dash violence that permeated the actions of the exploited and the oppressed as his writing become increasingly polemical in the late 1940s and thereafter. We noted that Sartre spent the academic year 1933-1934 at the French Institute in Berlin under a fellowship to study contemporary German philosophy, especially Husserlian phenomenology. In view of his extreme involvement in matters political after the war, it is nearly inconceivable that he would ignore the events that followed Hitler's assumption of power nine months before his arrival, the book burnings, the manifestations, the assassination, in effect, the National Socialist Revolution that was taking place virtually outside his window. But Sartre seems to have remained the detached scholar during his residence at the Institute. Point eight. A measure of Sartre's political commitment during the 1930s was his relationship to the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 1939. Though he certainly sided with the Republicans, as did many of his close friends, and would publish a powerful short story, The Wall, in 1937, which dramatized that war experience. Hermarket later that it was not his War. Point nine. When I wrote The Wall. He admitted, I had no real knowledge of Marxist thought, I was simply in complete opposition to the existence of Spanish fascism. Ten yet Sartre was not insensitive to the political implications of his early work in phenomenology. We noted his reference to the political and ethical implications of his notion of an egoless consciousness at the conclusion of The Transcendence of the Ego, 1936, point 11 This conjunction of the ethical and the political will establish a recurrent theme throughout his subsequent work. Vintage Existentialism, 1938-1946 Sartre returned to Paris after several months of incarceration in a Nazi stalag after the fall of France, quite intent on playing a part in the resistance. He, Merleau-Ponty, Beauvoir and others gathered a group of intellectuals under the banner of Socialism and Freedom, Liberté, in March of 1941 that recruited about 50 members and lasted scarcely nine months. It could not compete with other resistance organizations, especially the PCF, which had abandoned its pacifist direction once the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in June of that year. But the values of Socialism and Freedom continued to guide Sartre's public life. Indeed, in his valedictory interview with Beauvoir, Sartre reflected on his experience of true community as a prisoner and wished that it could be conjoined with freedom. We founded the movement Socialism and Freedom, Liberté. The title was my choice because I had in mind a socialism in which, freedom, existed. 
I had become a socialist by then, owing in part to the sad socialism of my life as a prisoner that nonetheless was a collective life, a community. The Marxists in France gave no place to the notion of freedom, to the notion that people, could form themselves according to their own options and not as conditioned by society, the idea that a free man could exist beyond socialism. When I say, beyond, I don't mean at some later stage but surpassing the rules of socialism at every moment, that's an idea that the Russians have never had. That's what I had in mind by calling our little group in 1940, 1941, Socialism and Freedom. Though it is very difficult to realize beginning with socialism, it's the connection, socialism freedom, that represents my political inclination. It was my political bent and I've never changed it. Today I'm still defending socialism and freedom in my discussions with Gavi and Victor, in on a raison des e revoltier. So are 494, 502. In the early years following the liberation of Paris by the Allies in 1944, Sartre accepted an invitation to join David Rousset and Gerard Rosenthal in the inauguration of a non-communist non-party of the left called the Revolutionary People's Assembly, Rassemblement Démocratique Révolutionnaire or RDR. Point 12 Its aim was to reconcile communists and socialists into a common front against capitalism at home and colonialism and superpower politics abroad. It was in search of a third option between either side of the Cold War politics, though clearly from a left-leaning perspective. Noteworthy was Sartre's rationale for joining this group, his appeal to situation as an idea capable of uniting the Marxists and non-Marxists among us. 13 In his being in nothingness, 1943, Sartre had characterized human reality, his version of Heidegger's Dacian, as being in situation. And in his seminal essay, Materialism and Revolution, published the year before joining the RDR, we saw him conclude, it is the elucidation of the new ideas of situation and of being in the world that revolutionary behavior specifically calls for. 14 It is commonly acknowledged that this feudal foray into organized politics soured him on the genre. Still, he would continue to recommend that members of the working class join the Communist Party, which Sartre came to see as its sole voice in what he had years before come to believe was class conflict. Indicative of his own ambivalence in this regard, he refused to join the party himself, though we said he supported four years of fellow traveling with the PCF from 1952 to the Soviet crushing of the Hungarian Revolution in 1956. In his last interview with Beauvoir, 1974, Sartre admitted, I was never in favor of a socialist society before 1939. He described his position up to that point as, an individualism of the left, so are 479 to 480. If his experience in the army and in the POW camp taught him the importance of social relations, he was still enthralled to the individualist ontology he was formulating in being and nothingness. It based interpersonal relations on the objectifying gaze of competing individuals, resulting ontologically in a kind of stare-down and politically in a Hobbesian war of all against all. Recall a famous phrase from that book that, the essence of the relations between consciousnesses is not the, Heideggerian, mid sign, being with, it is conflict. 1526 years after B.N., Sartre described this stage of his thought as, the rationalist philosophy of consciousness. 16 commentator Shaverit the ontology of B.N., namely, its basic categories of being in itself and being for itself as a Cartesian dualism of material thing and immaterial consciousness, but we have seen that this is mistaken, if taken to mean that Sartre subscribed to a two-substance ontology of matter and mind. Only being in itself is substantial or thing-like, being for itself or consciousness, non-substantial absolute, ono-thing related to the in itself by an internal negation. There is no need to unpack these ontological claims except to reaffirm that the basic dualism which grounds Sartre's ontology and so his political and his ethical theoresis a dualism of spontaneity and inertia. A functional equivalent of the for itself and the in itself respectively, they will replace these terms from B.N. in his critique, though, significantly, they return in the Flaubert biography. Ethics and politics, means and ends. The end means issue is a recurrent theme in Sartre's thought. It distinguishes him from the means ends continuum of Duyan pragmatism and the consequentialism of the utilitarians, for whom he had little use. 
Though the matter is complex and Sartre's reflections are often ad hoc and flexible, focused, as they usually were, on specific problems in concrete situations, we must recognize that there are non-negotiables in his political and ethical theories. One such is the free organic individual, the responsible subject, and another is the value concept of freedom. They emerge at each turn of his thought. In effect, we are charting a roughly parallel development of his ethics and his politics posed in the conclusion of Transcendence of the Ego, emerging into full light with his discovery of the philosophical significance of society in the late 1930s and early 1940s, and continuing to the hypotheses entertained in his discussions with Benny Le Vy in the aftermath of the events of May. 1968, Humanisms and the Political. We witnessed Sartre's strong animus against several types of humanism in the novel that made him famous, Nausea, 1938. But a year later he was applying that negative view to political principles in his war diaries, minus the total rejection displayed in the novel. If we are looking for political principles today, we have really only four conceptions of man to choose between. The narrow conservative synthetic conception, Action Frank Ace, for example, the updated narrow synthetic conception, Racism, Marxism, the broad conservative synthetic conception, Humanitarianism, the analytical conception, Anarchic Individualism. But nowhere Dao find any reference to the human condition, determined on the basis of individual, human reality. 17. The problem, in his opinion, is that, of the many meanings of humanity, the modern meaning, the human condition of every individual, has not yet been unveiled, WD 25.18 What is that modern meaning that will engender the political principles of the future? With the wisdom of hindsight, we can say that it is a humanism of situation. Parsing that term as Sartre uses it, we find that every situation is at once objective, practical, lived, and historical. How these features will emerge in Sartre's political and social thought remains to be seen. But it is already clear that the elements of its conception are germinating in the young conscript's mind. So let us consider each in view of its contribution to his emerging political, and ethical, thought. Objective possibility. This expression, formulated by Max Weber, denotes the extramental phenomena that both limit and foster our actions. One of Weber's examples was that the firing of shots on a street in Munich served merely to occasion a revolution that was objectively possible, waiting to happen, whereas a similar incident elsewhere and at another time might have gone unnoticed. In contrast, one might agree with Marx that the Paris Commune failed because it was objectively impossible, that is, the time was not yet ripe. In the War Diaries, Sartre calls such objective possibilities exigencies, denoting objects that demand to be realized, WD 39. Marx had a keen sense of objective possibility and especially impossibility, though he did not employ the term. Of its several uses, its original meaning applies to the socio-historical realm, where it refers to the set of socio-economic conditions that make some projects possible and render others impossible. An application of Marxist theory to Sartrean situation lies behind Sartre's remark that, it is history which shows some the exits and makes others cool their heels before closed doors, 19 by the time he makes that claim, in The Communists and Peace, 1952, Sartre is in league with the PCF, though, as ever, in his own way. The point is that Sartre's growing awareness of objective possibility thickens his sense of freedom, from a quasi-stoic freedom to think otherwise, what he called freedom as the definition of man, in his existentialism is a humanism lecture and which we have termed noetic freedom, to a full-fledged notion of positive or concrete freedom that requires the change of socio-economic conditions which at present limit one's concrete possibilities. We recognize this as the thinking behind the claim made in Sartre's famous but unfortunate public lecture, is existentialism a humanism, that no one can be concretely free unless everyone is free. Two other publications from this period register this change in Sartre's political and ethical thought from an individualist ethics and politics of authenticity to a more socially centered concern with the concrete freedom of humans and the reconstruction of institutions, the launching of the journal Les Temps Modernes, October 1945, and the issuing of Antisemite and Jew, Reflections on the Jewish Question, 1946, which we discussed earlier.
In the programmatic introduction to the initial issue of LTM, Sartre insisted that, far from being relativists, we proclaim that man is an absolute, but he is such in his time, in his surroundings, and on his parcel of earth, 20 this is the dimension of historialization that has been part of Sartrean authenticity since the war diaries, truth and existence and what is literature. The writer must speak for his time and address the problems of this situated absolute. The journal stands on the side of those who wish to change both the social condition of the human and the conception that he has of himself. Implicitly gesturing toward historical materialism, Sartre sees a relation between these two goals. He insists, first, that a feeling, sentiment, is always the expression of a certain way of life and a certain conception of the world that is common to an entire class or to an entire epoch, and, secondly, that its evolution is not the effect of just any inner mechanism whatsoever but is the effect of these historical and social factors. Sit 2 colon 21. It is in this context that he introduces the contrast between the analytic method or spirit and the synthetic or, as he shall now also call it, the dialectical. The former insists on the myth of human nature, whereas the latter thinks holistically and developmentally. Articulating a theme that will recur throughout his writings thereafter, Sartre associates the analytic spirit with the bourgeoisie and the dialectical with the working class. As he will observe in the critique, at a certain level of abstraction, the class conflict expresses itself as a conflict of rationalities. The former thinks atomistically and is blind to socio-economic class, whereas the latter is totalizing and thinks in terms of solidarity, sit 2 colon 19 21. Sartre draws upon this distinction, already employed in anti-Semite and Jew in another context, to form the methodological thesis for his critique of dialectical reason, 1960. Sartre concludes the introduction with an ironic gesture toward the Marxists. While insisting that man, despite being totally conditioned by his situation, harbors a center of irreducible indetermination, he declares that this sector of unpredictability is what we call freedom and the person is nothing but his freedom, sit 2 colon 26. This freedom is both a curse and the unique source of human greatness. The Marxists will agree with us on this point in spirit, if not in the letter, because, as far as I know, they do not abstain from leveling moral condemnations, sit 2 colon 27. In other words, consistently or not, a determinist must acknowledge a sliver of indeterminacy as a condition for making moral judgments. If the individual is totally conditioned and totally free, then the task that remains for the editors is to expand his possibilities of choice, that is, to increase his concrete freedom. This is the project that the fledgling journal sets for itself. We already discussed anti-Semite and Jew in an ethical context that revealed the moral significance of the bases and structures of an individual's choices. The explicit premise of his argument is the existence of a close reciprocal relation between human reality and the material conditions of its situation. In effect, Sartre is calling for structural change in society to render the choice of anti-Semitism virtually impossible. He rather naively believes, Pace Foucault, that anti-Semitism is a mythical, bourgeois representation of the class struggle, and that it could not exist in a classless society, anti-Semite and Jew 149. Presumably, faced with overwhelming counter-evidence, he would redefine the nature of such socialist societies as way stations on the path to genuine communism. In any case, gone is the near omnipotence of Sartrean consciousness to redefine one situation at will, what I have been calling, noetic, freedom slash responsibility. One must acknowledge the, dialectical, relation between the social conditions and the freedom that both incorporates and transcends it. Praxis and lived experience, le VECU. Praxis, purposive human activity in its socio-historical context, had already entered Sartre's vocabulary in what is literature. 1947, where it is defined as, action in history and on history, that is, a synthesis of historical relativity and moral and metaphysical absolute, with this hostile and friendly, terrible and derisive world which it reveals to us. And it occurs in his posthumously published Notebooks for an Ethics, composed in 1947 to 1948. But it plays its major role in search for a method and the critique of dialectical reason where it supplants consciousness, being for itself, as the vehicle of transcendence and freedom.
It is already clear that Sartrean consciousness is goal-oriented. In BN he had taken it as coextensive, if not synonymous, with life-orienting fundamental choice. Already in BN, Sartre claimed that, the view of pure knowledge is contradictory, there is only the viewpoint of committed knowledge. This amounts to saying that knowledge and action are only two abstract faces of an original and concrete relation, BN 309, EN 370. The significance of this conception of knowledge as a form of action is that it translates easily into knowledge as a form of praxis and all that will accompany it in terms of dialectical relations and understanding, verse to him. This, of course, remains to be elaborated in the critique of dialectical reason in the 1960s, but it assures us that the move from consciousness to praxis was not an about-face. Correlatively, it echoes Marx's famous claim in the 1844 manuscripts that the time had come no longer merely to understand the world but to change it. Sartre had been moving in that direction for some years. The appearance of the concept of lived experience, Berlovness, le VECU, was as significant in Sartre's vocabulary as that of praxis. Lived experience was introduced, as Sartre explained, to enrich the situational and the subconscious aspects of consciousness that it supplanted in his writing. What I call the VECU, lived experience, is precisely the ensemble of the dialectical process of psychic life, in so far as this process is obscure to itself because it is a constant totalization, thus necessarily a totalization which cannot be conscious of what it is. Lived experience, in this sense, is perpetually susceptible of comprehension but never of knowledge. Bain 41. He explains, I suppose, le VECU, represents for me the equivalent of conscious unconscious, L S 127. As we noted earlier in our study, le VECU seems to be a refinement of pre-reflective consciousness in BN where you understand more than you, reflectively, know. This major modification of Sartre's psychology enables him to appeal to Freudian concepts without resorting to the opaque realm of the unconscious. The unblinking eye of Sartrean consciousness is retained and our unqualified responsibility preserved. An existential approach to Marxism will embrace the psychological phenomena in more than a superficial, ideological sense. If this path is now opened by focusing on lived experience, it will reveal its promise in the several biographies of famous literary and other artists that Sartre will pen in the second half of his life. Once asked by Maoist friends why he continued to labor over his gigantic study of Gustave Flaubert, Sartre defended his undertaking as the attempt to produce a model socialist biography, CORR 73-74. The Historical We know that Sartre opposed the classical concept of human nature because he saw it as ahistorical, a myth of bourgeois universality. The human condition, on the other hand, was a more flexible concept, one that was open to historical development according as the concrete features of the human condition change. We marked his proposal of an incomplete list of such features in BN. They included my past, my environment, my fellow man whose intentions are inscribed in the instrumental complexes of my social life such as the signs in the subway or the directions on a medicine bottle. This aspect of our situation proclaims our historicity and locates our existence in a set of relations that are both temporal and explanatory in more than a simply narrative sense. Sartre elaborates this dimension of our situation by appeal to a Hegelian saying that our essence is our past, das Wesen is was Gusenist. If situation is an ambiguous mix of facticity and transcendence, of the in itself and the for itself, of the given and the taken, then the temporal dimension of our facticity is precisely our biography. But as Sartre's individualist ontology expands, so this description does as well, our facticity is read as our history, not merely our biography, it is, our, story, not simply mine. If only he can develop a social ontology that will move us beyond a merely psychological account of the collective subject, the, we, the, class, it would fit nicely into the Marxian theory of history in class consciousness, Luca C.S., where the subject of history is the proletariat. Sartre will subscribe to such a view in the critique, but at this vintage existentialist stage, he lacks the social ontology to warrant talking of a collective or class subject in more than a purely psychological sense. The problem is his individualist looking slash looked at theory of interpersonal relations. He has not overcome the limits of analytic reason, 
even as he is insisting that human reality is a totality, not a collection, the first principle of existential psychoanalysis, BN 568, Political Existentialism, 1947-1952. Aside from the stark contrast between the pre- and the post-war Sartre, the other stages of his life bleed into one another. So the present period begins with the elaboration of the concept of committed literature, developed in what is literature. 1947, but previewed in Sartre's UNESCO address a few months earlier. This set of essays underscores the concept of writing as action with its attendant political and moral implications, but it does so while trying to navigate between the aesthetic extremes of bourgeois, art for art's sake, and Marxist, socialist realism. The situated writer who does not speak up for the economically exploited and the socially oppressed of our time, Sartre warns, is a collaborator in such oppression and exploitation. We observe this overlap of the moral and the political in the previous chapter, extended to all registers of society in various forms of social injustice, this becomes the common theme of Sartre's writings for the next two decades. Various existential concepts are at work in this view of committed literature. Chief among them is the concept of situation, that invites elaboration in terms of the concepts of objective possibility, praxis, and the historical just enunciated. Of the many questions which the committed writer must address to his contemporaries, none is more pressing than that of the relation between morality and politics, CWL 154. This, in turn, raises the dilemma of the Communist Party that, as we have just noted, adopts a rhetoric of moral responsibility by its frequent appeal to social, in, justice, while sustaining a materialist dialectic which seems to render such ascriptions unwarranted. In other words, freedom and economic determinism are mutually incompatible. Such is Sartre's view of the matter. Whatever one may think of psychological, compatibilism, Sartre consistently opposed it, even to the point of confessing to having adopted a kind of immoral realism, during his years of fellow traveling with the PCF, CORR 79. Toward the end of what is literature, he asks whether contemporary writers should offer their services to the Communist Party in order to reach the masses, and responds with an unqualified no. As he explains, the politics of Stalinist communism is incompatible with the decent, Han Te, exercise of the literary profession, sit 2 280. He goes on to stress the ambiguity of a party that proclaims revolution while defending its own material interests and those of the Soviet Union. In effect, it has become conservative and even a reactionary entity. Sartre mentions the party's vilification of Nizan as evidence of its tendency to slander rather than openly discuss the merits of a case. And his appeal to the vested interests of the party itself anticipates the reason why he will disassociate himself from it after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. His reason is captured in the title of his essay, The Communists Are Afraid of Revolution. As he explains elsewhere, it is not our fault if the PC is no longer a revolutionary party, sit 2 287. But the problem of means, ends, of morality and politics, continues to insinuate itself in what is literature. The writer must live the tension between fact and value, the given and the taken that defines the human situation as such. Applied to the political realm, this raises the seemingly irreconcilable opposition between revolutionary action and moral respect for the individual agent. Given the audience he is addressing, Sartre proposes a literary commitment that maneuvers between communist propaganda and bourgeois neo-capitalism, writing directly for the mass media, the film, which he had been doing even during the occupation, and the radio, as he would try to do with a series of radio presentations that the team of Les Temps Modernes broadcast on national radio entitled La Tribune de Temps Modernes, The Modern Times Rostrum. The latter produced nine broadcasts, starting in October of 1947 in its attempt to promote the third way between Gaullism and communism that was about to be sketched by the RDR in the following months. Sartre addresses the means ends problem clearly toward the conclusion of W.L. Such is the present paradox of ethics, if I am absorbed in treating a few chosen persons as absolute ends, if I am bent on fulfilling all my duties towards them, I shall spend my life doing so, I shall be led to pass over in silence the injustices of the age, the class struggle, colonialism, antisemitism, etc., finally, to take advantage of oppression in order to do good. W.L. 221, 
emphasis his. But the other side of the paradox is that by throwing myself completely into the revolutionary enterprise, I risk having no more leisure for personal relations, worse still, of being led by the logic of the action into treating most men, and even my friends, as means. At this point, Sartre introduces an aesthetic value that, while it is appropriate for his audience, the writer in 1947, harkens back to the conclusion of nausea where the protagonist seeks salvation through literary art. Though Sartre has by now concluded that evil cannot be redeemed, WL 180, he does allow that the contemplation of beauty might well arouse in us the purely formal intention of treating men as ends. Still, his growing sense of objective, I'm, possibility counters that this intention would reveal itself to be utterly futile in practice since the fundamental structures of our society are still oppressive, WL 221. Sartre counsels that, if we can start with the moral exigence which the aesthetic feeling envelopes without meaning to do so, we are starting on the right foot. But our task is to historicize the reader's goodwill. By this Sartre means that we must turn the purely formal intention to treat men in every case as an absolute end into a specific intention by the subject of our writing that directs his intention upon his neighbors, upon the oppressed of the world. But we shall have accomplished nothing, he warns, if we do not show him, and in the very warp and weft of the work, that it is quite impossible to treat concrete men as ends in contemporary society, WL 222. This entails considering the city of ends that Sartre adopts from Kant as a practical ideal toward which we should aim and approach only at the end of a long historical evolution. Sartre acknowledges this is the strain peculiar to the project he is proposing. Repeating what we have said is the leitmotif of his political and ethical philosophy, he insists that we must militate in our writings in favor of the freedom of the person and the socialist revolution. It has often been claimed that they are not reconcilable. It is our job to show tirelessly that they imply each other, WL 223. A few years later, as Sartre is moving into the stage of full cooperation with the PCF, he published a large volume, introducing the works of Jean Genet, St. Genet, 1952. To return to our discussion of the conclusion of that work in the previous chapter, our dilemma of choosing between Genet and Bukharin can now be replayed as the freedom-socialism alternative, which itself instantiates the end means option. Recall that Sartre challenged us with the thought that we might succeed in reconciling this dichotomy, be it only once and in the realm of the imaginary, if only we had the courage to go to the limits of ourselves in both directions at once, SG 644, emphasis added. Here as elsewhere, Sartre is urging us to increase the tension rather than reduce it or, perhaps better, to resolve it in the, as if, of a Kantian ideal. However, if one opts to go to the limits of ourselves in both directions at once, to emphasize the individual and the social, one may see this suggestion as Sartre's last salute toward what we might call a Kierkegaardian dialectic, namely, one that forces an existential choice rather than resolving into a synthesizing mediation. This would underline Raymond Aron's critique of Sartre's project of Marxist existentialism voiced in 1946, a follower of Kierkegaard cannot at the same time be a follower of Marx. The misplaced imaginary, Sartre's fellow traveling with the PCF, 1952-1956. Sartre was already having problems resolving the tension between end and means, politics and ethics. In 1948 he had abandoned writing his Ethics, promised at the end of BN after producing several hundred pages of notes, published posthumously as notebooks for an ethics. He later explained that the text was too idealist in nature and no longer expressed his current thoughts, see so 234. If one looks for a more realist and even more materialist version of his ethical insights, one could do no better than to read his profoundly autobiographical play, The Devil and the Good Lord, premiered June 7, 1951. It is commonly accepted as mirroring Sartre's entire ideological evolution, Contat and Rabalka I, 249. For someone who balanced imagination and conceptualization, the literary and the philosophical most of his life, it is not surprising to note how creative literary works either anticipated or retrospectively exemplified the ideas articulated in his philosophical work. His play, No Exit, for example, communicates imaginatively much of the phenomenological ontology of being for others of B.N. 
A major issue in the devil and the good lord is the relation between ethics and politics, the absolute and the peasant revolution. In its concluding scene gets, the new commander of the peasants and a convert from the other side, after having just coldly killed a subordinate who questioned his authority, exclaims, The kingdom of man is beginning. A fine start. Never fear, I shall not flinch. I shall make them hate me, because I know no other way of loving them, I shall remain alone with this empty sky over my head, since I have no other way of being among men. There is this war to fight, and I shall fight it. Act 3, Scene 11. In an interview published the day this play opened, Sartre defends his sympathy with the communists, to the extent that I am inspired by a rather broad Marxism, I am an enemy for Stalinist communists, the PCF, until the new order, the party will represent the proletariat for me, and I do not see how this situation could possibly change for some time. It is impossible to take an anti-communist position without being against the proletariat, cited in Contat and Rebalka 2 254. These remarks were prescient. Sartre added several new members to the team of LTM. The result was a closer orientation with the party. In particular it meant that Sartre cooperated with the PCF in defending Henri Martin, a sailor jailed for distributing tracts opposing the war in Indochina. Sartre's lengthy piece, The Henri Martin Affair was a sign of his joining ranks with the PCF.22 but his chief move in that direction was a set of essays published in LTM under the title The Communists and Peace starting in July of 1952. It was occasioned by the arrest of the acting head of the PCF on trumped-up charges in the aftermath of a massive demonstration against the arrival in Paris of American General Matthew Ridgway, who had succeeded General Eisenhower as Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. His visit was to seek support for Western participation in the Korean War that had begun in June of 1950, and for the Cold War generally. This text, which illustrates Sartre at his most hyperbolic, ushers in the next years that will fix him permanently, in the eyes of many, in the communist camp. Such expressions as, an anti-communist is a dog, sit 4 248, or, there is crap in the bourgeois heart, 23 were scarcely fashioned to allay the fears of the expanding Iron Curtain and Soviet hegemony. Yet Sartre had made it clear that he was agreeing with the communists on specific, limited subjects, arguing on the basis of my principles and not theirs, CP 68. This served to distinguish him from the Stalinist-oriented PCF during this period of relative cordiality. Some of those principles would appear in Sartre's critique of dialectical reason, especially remarks that reveal that the principles of a social ontology are starting to form. But the conceptual framework had changed. The means and issue was being historicized and the situation becoming concrete. In the previous chapter we witnessed Sartre's forceful statement of the ethical problem of means and ends in a violent society lodged in a footnote to St. Genet, ethics is for us inevitable and at the same time impossible, SG 186N. It seems that the high-minded non-negotiables of Sartre's ethical belief up to this point are being placed on the shelf of abstraction or projected onto the sky of an idealist, as if, in effect, he is echoing, however reluctantly, the revolutionary's maxim that the end justifies the means, up to a point. This was the period during which Sartre broke with two of his most important friends and associates, Albert Camus and Maurice Merleau-Ponty. In Camus' case, though their respective political views had been moving in opposite directions for some time, what occasioned the break was Sartre's heavy-handed treatment of Camus' political treatise The Rebel in a review by Francis Jeanson in LTM. Sartre would have known that Jeanson's review would not be favorable when he asked him to write it. Aside from the quality of Camus' argument, much of the controversy focused on Sartre's alleged deliberate silence regarding the labor camps maintained by the Stalinist regime. Their existence had recently been discovered by the Western press and the moral outrage rebounded on the Stalinist PCF. Sartre took Camus' remarks as a personal attack and responded in kind in LTM. It would have sufficed to have pointed out that the journal had acknowledged and taken a position on the camps from the moment their existence became known. Yes, Camus, he agreed, like you, I find these camps inadmissible, but inadmissible too is the use that the bourgeois press makes of them every day. Sit 4 104. Indeed, this is a form of defense that Merleau-Ponty had used in an analogous context in his Humanism and Terror, 1947. 
but Sartre was far less conciliatory and indeed, quite harsh and ad hominem in his lengthy response to Camus. Thus ended the loss of the man whom Sartre would later identify as, probably the last good friend I had, L S 64. In a footnote to his response to Camus that distinguished Marxist practices from Marxist philosophy, Sartre, seemingly oblivious of Marx's thesis regarding unity of theory and practice, made the following telling observation, I don't have to defend Marx's ideas, but allow me to say that the dilemma you have set before us, either its prophecies, are true or Marxism is merely a method, leaves unscathed the entire Marxist philosophy and all that, in my view, who am not a Marxist, constitutes. It's deep truth, sit 4 colon 197n. So it seems important for Sartre to distinguish between the admirable Marxist philosophy and its sometimes inadmissible practices, even at the start of his shared path with the PCF. In the case of Merleau-Ponty, who had been in charge of the political desk at LTM, the conflict was again political. This time it concerned the Korean War, on which Sartre sided with the Communist North and Merleau-Ponty with the anti-communist South. Merleau-Ponty's resignation cost the journal one of its best minds and most balanced thinkers. Sartre wrote an editorial favoring the North without even consulting him. The journal continued to move increasingly toward the left from then on. However, as Ian Burkle correctly observes, one must not identify the review with Sartre's personal politics during this period of cordiality with the party. Any number of essays critical of Stalinist communist practices both in France and abroad appeared in its pages. But the crisscross of Sartre's and Merlot's political paths was deeply grounded in their respective philosophical styles and personalities. Point 24 The contrast morphed into open conflict, and Merlot Ponty published Adventures of the Dialectic, 1955, that contained a chapter entitled Sartre and Ultra Bolshevism. As the title suggests, the peace was scarcely conciliatory. It concentrated on the communists and peace and BN, as Beauvoir pointed out in Merleau-Ponty in Pseudo-Sartreanism, her equally intemperate rejoinder in LTM the same year. She accused Merleau-Ponty of bad faith for having ignored the work on which Sartre was presently engaged, which, she insisted, addressed many of the issues from CP that Merleau-Ponty had criticized. In effect, Sartre was redressing an imbalance between the individual and the social, the ethical and the political, that would find its ontological foundation in his next major work, Critique of Dialectical Reason, 1960. Sartre confirmed his sympathy with the PCF with voyages that also served to embarrass him after his return. The first was to attend the Congress of the World Peace Movement in Vienna on December 12-19, 1952, during which, as we noted, he prohibited the performance of his play Dirty Hands. Though Sartre and Beauvoir insisted that only 20% of those attending were communists, Ronald Heyman reports that nearly all the delegates from the West were communists, WA 283. Except for Sartre, each of the 50 attendees from France was a member of the party. In one of his declarations he spoke of the three events of his adult life that had meant the most to him, that had renewed his hope, the Popular Front, the Liberation, and the Vienna Congress, Life 337. In May, June 1954 he made his first visit to the Soviet Union. He returned singing its praises. Incredibly, for example, he claimed that there was complete freedom of criticism in the USSR. Recalling these remarks 20 years later, Sartre admitted that the series of remarks published after his return was the work of his secretary, Jean Kahl, and that he was not enthused by what he saw there, they showed me what they want me to see, obviously, and I had a lot of reservations, so are 462, between revolutions, 1956 to 1969, with the discovery of the labor camps in the USSR and its violent quelling of the Hungarian workers' uprising in 1956, Sartre began to distance himself from the PCF once more. It should be noted that his relation with the Italian Communist Party had been and remained cordial throughout these years. Point 25 Sartre wrote a lengthy essay, The Phantom of Stalin, to explain his move. Spread over three issues of his journal, November 1956 to January 1957, it called for the de-Stalinization of the PCF while arguing that the party, nonetheless, remained the best hope for the proletariat. Besides the exorcism of the ghost of Stalin and the establishing of common cause with other parties of the left, 
Sartre even included the Socialist Party, SFIO, which, in a not conciliatory interview in L'Express, at the same time, he described as the party of those who torture in Algeria. 26 There were three other revolutions that drew Sartre's considerable attention during these 12 years. The war in Vietnam, especially the American involvement, which lead him to participate in the Russell War Crimes Trial, the Algerian War of Independence, and the Cuban Revolution. Each could be considered the fruit of colonialism or neo-colonialism and, as such, eliciting the same disgust that we noted the young Sartre harbored toward colonialism, especially with the French presence in Algeria, long before he was ever politicized. More recently, he had written that colonialism is a system of impersonal, structural rules and associated practices. One could apply to it what he remarked about another system, capitalism. The meanness is in the system, CP 183. We shall see that the defining feature of Sartrean existentialism, even if it is attenuated during his years of fellow traveling with the PCF, is a certain irreducibility that he reserves for the responsible individual. Only in the critique of dialectical reason will he fashion the social ontology to support that position, but we can safely modify his claim just mentioned about these social structures and institutions, the meanness is, not entirely, in the system. Whether it be the 200 families, NE415, that, in popular opinion, moved their money to Swiss accounts when the socialists came to power in 1936, thereby weakening the government, or the racist attitudes and practices that sustained the workings of neo-colonialism in 1950s Algeria, the appeal to system or structural necessity, in Sartre's view, will not excuse the populace. As he says or implies in his many essays and interviews on social issues, we are all guilty. Whether it be our lack of concern for the structural injustices of a corrupt regime in Cuba, our sympathy with the actions of our national armies in Algeria or Vietnam, our unwillingness to protest against or our willingness to benefit from the exploitation of the Arab population in Algeria or the locals in Southeast Asia, Sartre voices the rhetorical judgment, we are all guilty. Doubtless this presumes a degree of solidarity as well as an idea of collective responsibility that Sartre has yet to justify beyond appealing to the spirit of synthesis. But his practice is calling for a theory that the critique of dialectical reason will attempt to supply. If the Spanish Civil War was not his war, as Roland Dumas remarked years later, the Algerian War was his war. 27 In January of 1955, LTM had started a campaign in support of the Algerian rebels. In 1957 its issues were confiscated on four occasions by the government in Algeria. The November issue was seized by the Metropolitan Government for the first time. Sartre's essay on a case of torture by French forces in Algeria appeared in the Weekly Express, March 6, 1958. That issue too was confiscated. In the same month Sartre published an essay in LTM entitled, We Are All Assassin. As the war progressed and the tide turned in favor of the rebels, Sartre's life was threatened and bombs were exploded by members of the Organization of the Secret Army, OAS, on two occasions at the entrance to his apartment on Rue Bonaparte, July 19, 1961 and January 7, 1962. The war ended July 3. 1962 when France granted Algeria independence after a referendum. Sartre and Beauvoir accepted the invitation of the Cuban journal, Revolution, to visit the island from February 22 to March 21, 1960, a year after Castro had become premier. They were effusive in their praise of the Cuban Revolution and its charismatic leader. What seemed to impress Sartre particularly was the evidence for direct democracy, that he thought he observed during his visit. We shall see that preference for workers' councils resonates with Sartre's congenitally anarchistic leanings when his sympathies turned toward the Maoists later in the decade. Still, he acknowledged that this was the honeymoon of the revolution, and he warned that things could change significantly in the future. He had described the petrification of spontaneous groups in the Bolshevik Revolution and in his major study, Critique of Dialectical Reason, had even argued that this was its normal devolution in a society of material scarcity of goods. So, despite the excessive rhetoric, reminiscent of his first visit to the Soviet Union, Sartre had his apprehensions here as well. These were justified in 1971 when his request for clemency for an imprisoned Cuban poet, Huberto Padillo, 
was rejected by his former hero, and Sartre found himself dismissed as one of those bourgeois liberal gentlemen, two-bit agents of colonialism, who dared to criticize Cuba. 28 The entire Sartre-Castro episode had the appearance of a second-rate melodrama. Nonetheless, it was Sartre's unflinching commitment to socialism and freedom that moved him into Castro's orbit and just as thoroughly drew him out of it again. The third revolution of this period was less parochial. It seemed to involve the great powers and their respective spheres of influence even more than the Cuban crisis. The civil war between North Vietnam and South Vietnam was an invitation for Sartre to join the underdog again against the American Goliath who claimed to be threatened by the domino effect that would topple all the democratic countries of the region if South Vietnam succumbed to the communist momentum. Sartre had long been opposed to French colonialism in Indochina. This time, he was invited by the world-famous philosopher and pacifist, Bertrand Russell, who had paid his dues by being jailed for opposing Britain's participation in the First World War. The International War Crimes Tribunal or Russell Tribunal, as it was also known, held its first deliberative session from May 2 to 10, 1967 in Stockholm, and its second from November 20 to December 1, 1967 in Roskilde, Denmark. It proposed to hear and weigh evidence against the United States and its allies for war crimes alleged to have been committed in Vietnam. As its executive president, Sartre announced in his opening address on May 2, 1967, the tribunal would judge the crimes committed in Vietnam by the definitions and standards of existing international law and particularly the judgments of the Nuremberg Tribunal which judged German war crimes in 1945-29 since their only authority was moral. They hoped to appeal to public opinion by publicizing the crimes against humanity that were now being ascribed to the victors of an earlier war. Sartre published an essay, on genocide, that was accompanied by a summary of the evidence and the judgment of the international war. Crimes Tribunal written by his adopted daughter, Arlette L. K. M. Sartre. The unanimous judgment of this body was that the United States was guilty of genocide in Vietnam during the period specified. Again, the appeal is to human solidarity of rights and interests. Offering a variation on a Sartrean theme, the document concludes, this crime, of genocide, carried out every day before the eyes of the world, renders all who do not denounce it accomplices of those who commit it, so that we are being degraded today for our future enslavement, on genocide 84-85. Beyond Communism, Beyond Marxism, 1968-1980. If photos of Soviet tanks crushing the Hungarian Revolution destroyed whatever belief Sartre had maintained in the Stalinist orthodoxy of Soviet and French Communism, then the Soviet-ordered invasion of the Czech Republic by Warsaw Pact troops in 1968 to suppress its liberalizing, Prague Spring, ended his sympathy for communism generally, with the possible exception of the Italian version, which he always considered sway generous. As he remarked to his, Maoist, discussants in the early 1970s, the communists, don't give a fig about justice, what they want primarily is power, or R-76. The events of May 1968 marked a turning point in French politics and culture, the effects of which continue to this day. If it would be excessive to label it the Sartrean Revolution, as some have done, 30 there is little doubt that these events resonated with Sartre's model of political existentialism, 1. its moral indignation, 2. spontaneity, 3. camaraderie, 4. heightened sense of disalienation, 5. distrust of party politics, 6. Confidence in direct action, and 7. Visceral dislike of authority. These features have emerged in a survey of his career in politics just traced. Of course, if politics is limited to the exercise of voting in active relations with, if not membership in, political parties, then the extent of Sartre's career is considerably reduced. But as he insisted to his Maoist friends, in words worthy of Michel Foucault, everything is political, that is, everything questions society as a whole and ends up disputing it, or R27. When we add to this list of features, 8, violence, we see why Sartre would find their youthful exuberance and impatience with mere verbiage so attractive, especially in his last decade. In a set of conversations, interviews, with two Maoists, 
one of whom will become his last secretary. 31 From November 1972 to March 1974, Sartre took stock of his political biography in particularly explicit and challenging remarks. Among the many decisive statements uttered in this context was his admission that he had moved from an irrealist idealism at age 18, which is why he abandoned his ethics so authenticity sketched in notebooks for an ethics, to an immoralist realism at 45, with the communists, toward rediscovery of a moralist realism but now materialist, anti-hierarchical and libertarian, with his post-communist colleagues, or R79. What Sartre calls materialist is not a crass reductionist identity thesis of mind to brain, nor a Marxist determinism that he rejects as economism. Rather, it denotes the elaboration of his basic concept of situation in terms of objective possibility. There is determinism in nature, as Kant insisted, and in history too, as Hegel claimed, but we can always make something out of what we've been made into, which is the Sartrean existentialist mantra extended via dialectical reasoning to encompass the material conditions of our existential life, le VECU, this irreducible wedge of subjectivity, which Sartre once described as, the limit of reflexive recoil, EN32, is the ontological ground of our freedom, whether abstract or concrete, and our, moral responsibility. This is why he can assert against orthodox dialectical materialism that morality is not merely a function of the superstructure but exists at the very level of production. He agrees with the Maoists that a worker is moral by virtue of the fact that he is an alienated man who reclaims freedom for himself and for all, or R45. In fact, this was a basic Sartrean claim long before he encountered his mouse. Still, as the dilemma of Heinrich in The Devil and the Good Lord exhibits, some situations render choices morally bankrupt however they are made. It is this confluence of the political and the moral in our society, Sartre insists, that leaves each of us with dirty hands. Search for a method and a critique in the context of political existentialism. If the features of existentialist politics can be gathered from Sartre's ad hoc statements and essays, then the theoretical foundation for this approach was laid in critique of dialectical reason and its introductory essay, Search for a Method. These works have been subjected to careful commentaries. But a brief reference to aspects of the argument of each will elucidate how they support features of existentialist politics enumerated above. We shall devote a more detailed discussion of each text in terms of history and social ontology in the next two chapters. Let us note at the outset that the search for a method was not written as an introduction to CDR, it was a translation with some editions of an essay, The Situation of Existentialism in 1957, published in a Polish journal at the request of its editor. So when it is attached to CDR, one should not be surprised that the fit is not perfect. Addressing the question, do we have today the means to constitute a structural, historical anthropology? SM 34, Sartre frames the hypothesis that we have indeed achieved that capability and that it is the product of the union of existentialist psychology, and moral concerns, with Marxist dialectic, and social causality. The second of its three chapters is dedicated to, the problem of mediations. Who says, Hegelian, dialectic, says, mediation, as Kierkegaard knew so well and was alleged to reject. But Sartre here and in the critique but especially in the family idiot is at pains to analyze those factors that mediate the abstract or general, structural, features of the historical situation with the concrete praxis of the free organic individual. It is this emphasis on mediating factors that enables Sartre to bring the Marxist forces and relations of production to bear on the lives of individuals. Chief among these mediators was the family. An object lesson in such mediation was Sartre's Flaubert study. Point 32 One can say that the mediations preserved the structural causality of Louis Althusser, Pace Althusser himself, by means of the praxis of concrete, existential individuals. With a bit of help from the Marxian dialectic, it looks as if Marx and Kierkegaard had been conjoined after all. The progressive regressive method, adopted from the Marxist sociologist Henri Lefebvre and introduced to bring this synthesis about, was the topic of the final chapter of Search for a Method. In brief, it begins with a phenomenological description of the object in question, say Flaubert's writing of Madame Bovary or the staging of a boxing match on a September evening of 1939. 
The regressive movement proceeds analytically from fact to the conditions of its possibility, working its way through layers of increasingly abstract conditions, which could be called structures, at a certain level of abstraction. One could designate this as the sociological or the Marxian phase of the process. A certain intelligibility is achieved. One has located the individual or thievent in the context of class consciousness, for example, or the relations and forces of production operative at that time. As Sartre remarks apropos the simplistic use of economic determinist arguments, Valery is a petit bourgeois intellectual, but not every petit bourgeois intellectual is Valery. The heuristic inadequacy of contemporary Marxism, Sartre urges, is contained in those two sentences. Marxism lacks any hierarchy of mediations, SM56. This is what existentialism will supply. In many ways, the progressive-regressive method is better exemplified by the Flaubert study than by the critique. And one can understand, in light of the above, why Sartre could defend his continued labor on that project when the Maoists were urging him to abandon it in favor of more politically useful work. I consider the opus to be a socialist work in the sense that, if I succeed, this will allow us to advance in the understanding of men from a socialist viewpoint, or are 73 to 74. Still, it was the critique, 1960, not the family idiot, 1971 to 1972, that produced the theoretical underpinning for the qualities that link existential politics with the events of May 68. In summary fashion, then, let us relate each of the aforementioned eight features of the Maoist events of May 1968 listed above to concepts that will be developed in the critique. 1. Moral indignation, we have mentioned the primacy of tepraxis of te free organic individual. This is illustrated throughout the two volumes of the critique. At the base of the practico inert conditioning, material hiertobing in itself, as was said, is the sedimentation of prior praxis of the colonists, for example whose attitude and practices continue the effects of the system they have inherited. 2. Spontaneity. In what Sartre calls after Malraux an apocalyptic moment, the alienated individuals spontaneously fuse into a group, group membership entails new qualities such as power, right and duty. 3. Camaraderie. Where each member views every other not as identical but as the same in practical interest and concern, the power of members surpasses that of a mere collection of isolated individuals. 4. Heightened sense of disalienation, thereby overcoming the alienating status of serial alterity, where each is mechanically related to the others as other to other, like the TV viewing audience or the individuals jostling for scarce seats on a bus. 5. Distrust of party politics. The party benefit originates small groups, cells, does so hierarchically and for its own interests, the party wants power, not freedom. 6. Confidence in direct action. Since the unity of the group is practical not theoretical, its goals are generated from the group itself, the group as it is forming simply is its goal. 7. A visceral dislike of authority, which, as Sartre said elsewhere, is the other in us. With the organized group arises a self-imposed authority structure that, Sartre believes, inevitably hardens into the institution, which is a phenomenon of the practical inert such as the party or the state. 8. Violence. The basis of violence is interiorized scarcity, it will pervade society so long as material scarcity infects it. The sworn group, example, those who took the tennis court oath in the French Revolution, which is Sartre's paradigm case of all of these features, introduced a relation of fraternity terror that sustained a Rousseauian sameness via the threat of mortal consequence for betrayal. Though Sartre had often described the violence that qualified societies of oppression and exploitation, as well as the counterviolence of the oppressed and the exploited, only in the critique does he connect this to the scarcity of material goods. This warrants his implicit reference to a socialism of abundance, where violence would presumably be rare, if not excluded entirely. But the dyad fraternity slash terror emerges to full view at the apocalyptic moment of group formation. True, it has been present, if not mentioned, throughout Sartre's discussion of the political and the social, but now, faced with the fact of interiorized scarcity, it haunts Sartre's thought to the point that he will finally admit that he has still not been able to reconcile one with the other point 33 in the interview he gave to Michel Contat as he turned 70, 
Sartre remarked how it was Marxism as a philosophy of power that he rejected, not several of its tenets such as the class struggle, surplus, value and the rest, that he continued to find valid. But he added, we must develop a way of thinking which takes Marxism into account in order to go beyond it, to reject it and take it up again, to absorb it. This is the condition for arriving at a true socialism, L S61, emphasis added, in a way that echoes the title as well as the thesis of socialism or barbarism, a leftist group with which he had ambivalent relations over the years, Sartre summarized his vision of the future, either man is finished, or else he will adapt by bringing about some form of libertarian socialism. He explains what he sees as the coming revolution, revolution is not a single moment in which one power overthrows another, it is a long movement in which power is dismantled. Nothing can guarantee success for us, nor can anything rationally convince us that failure is inevitable. But the alternatives really are socialism or barbarism, L S 83-84. All power to the imagination. A graffito on the walls during the events of May 1968 read, L'imagination au pouvoir. The cry to leap from the political rut into which parties of all stripes were stuck voiced the spirit of the rebels in the streets. It also echoed the persistent theme of Sartrean thought since he penned his thesis on the imagination for his DES in 1926-1927. As we remarked at the outset, it has been the thesis and the theme of the present work. The path toward existential politics charted in the present chapter should support, if not confirm, that Sartre was at heart a philosopher of the imaginary point 34 given the major role played by the concept of the imagination throughout Sartre's thought, not to mention the ease with which he moved into imaginative literature and his penchant for striking, phenomenological, descriptions. It should come as no surprise that his guiding values of socialism and freedom should assume synthesis, if only, in the imagination, S.G., such as his vision of the new man, the socialist man, whom we cannot yet experience but who will emerge with the advent of a true socialism, or are 336 to 337. In a remark that anticipates his hope for a society of fraternal equality and cognitive transparency repeated in his last discussions. With Benny Le Vy published shortly before his death, 1980, Sartre describes the ideal, the guiding star of his political life in terms of the imaginary that has been his weapon as well as his trap throughout his public life. Socialism indeed makes no sense except as a dream, comely tat revee, and a poorly conceived one at that, where man will be free, and it is that condition of freedom which people who desire socialism, whether they say so or not, are in fact seeking. Or 347. Chapter 12 A Theory of History, Search for a Method. In a footnote to what is literature, Sartre muses, Some day I am going to try to describe that strange reality history, which is neither objective, nor ever quite subjective, in which the dialectic is contested, penetrated, and corroded by a kind of anti-dialectic, but which is still a dialectic. But that is the philosopher's affair, WL 333-334. In fact, we have seen that from his youth, Sartre wished to be a philosopher and a literary person, both Spinoza and Stendhal. But if the two sides of his self-definition often existed in creative tension, the philosophical gene emerged as dominant in his later years. Point one Sartre's philosophical interest in the practice of history, as we observed, seems to have been sparked by the success of Raymond Darren's defense in publication of 12 volumes in the philosophy of history for his state doctorate. Point two Aaron's doctorate D.E. Tat qualified him for a teaching post at the university level, something that Sartre never achieved, though he thought it within his reach if Jean Paulhan had only delayed publishing the manuscript of the imaginary with Gallimard, a move that seemed to disqualify it as a thesis. Point three. Whether or not one sees a dialectic at work in being and nothingness for we know that Sartre had dialectical thought on his mind when he criticized dialectical materialism but favored what came to be called historical materialism, in the closing passages of his first mature philosophical publication, Transcendence of the Ego, 1936 to 1937. Point five we witnessed dialectic come to the fore in his book Antisemite and Jew, where he distinguished analytic from synthetic reason and explicitly ascribed a decisive role to changing the bases and structures of choice to counter antisemitism. 
Dialectic figured centrally in his seminal essay Materialism and Revolution, in which he attacked neo-Marxist economism as if the only bases and structures to be addressed were economic. He had not yet worked out the precise relation between transcendence and facticity bequeathed him by the ontology of BN, because he still considered materialist dialectic a contradiction in terms. Recall his insistence that, it is the elucidation of the new ideas of situation and of being in the world, that revolutionary behavior specifically calls for. And if, the revolutionary, escapes the jungle of rights and duties into which the idealist tries to mislead him, it should not be only to fall into the gorges rigorously marked out. By the materialist, materialism and revolution, 253. In effect, Sartre's version of the third way, between Eastern Communism and Western Capitalism is the political expression of a fundamental ontological and epistemic divide. As we have come to expect, this distinction sustains a moral dimension that Sartre's dialectical method is keen to enable and defend. Though his second ethic is called dialectical, because of its explicit use of the social ontology of the critique, his initial Ethics of Authenticity, written in 1947 to 1948 and posthumously published as Notebooks for an Ethics, makes frequent appeal to dialectical relations as well. Before turning to his two major texts that develop the organics of his historical dialectic, let me mention two other publications that prepare the way for search for a method and the critique, Self-Consciousness and Self-Knowledge, a lecture Sartre presented to the French Philosophical Society on June 2, 1947 and, as a counterposition, Merleau-Ponty's chapter, Sartre and Ultra-Bolshevism. In his Adventures of the Dialectic of June 1955, Addressing Professional Philosophers, while still in the glow of the existentialist comet, Sartre accepted Jean Wall's invitation to address the French Philosophical Society at the Sorbonne, the only time he did so. His topic was, Self-Consciousness and Self-Knowledge. The audience included the well-known philosophers Julian Benda and Jean Hippolyte, whose translation of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, 1939, and two-volume commentary on the genesis and structure of the Phenomenology of Spirit, Vrin, 1946, Sartre cites frequently in Notebooks for an Ethics. The title of his talk appears in a quote from Hippolyte's Genesis in Sartre's Notebooks, N.E. 63. Alexander Koch V.E.'s introduction to the reading of Hegel receives even more citations in Sartre's text. Clearly the dialectic of the French Hegel was on Sartre's mind in 1946-1947. In the course of his address, Sartre makes several claims about his reading of Husserl that reveal his shift toward a dialectical account, though not a complete abandonment of phenomenology by any means. Let me cite three. 1. The move toward dialectical thinking starts with Sartre's correction of Descartes and Husserl by giving ontological priority to pre-reflective consciousness over the traditional cogito which Sartre had claimed in BN was commonly limited to a reflective consciousness. Failure to recognize the priority of this pre-reflective awareness over its reflective derivative, in Sartre's view, left both Descartes and Husserl enclosed in idealism, solipsism and a pointiest concept of temporality. In other words, their ontologies were static rather than dynamic and their epistemologies essentialist rather than nominalist. Ironically, it is for just such temporal pointillism that Merleau-Ponty was to criticize Sartre in Adventures of the Dialectic. Obviously, Merleau-Ponty did not attend this session or read its published transcript. 2. Focusing on the pre-reflective opens the door to a practical, pre-theoretical being in the world that invites a hermeneutical phenomenology a la Heidegger. While Sartre does not speak of hermeneutics, he does point out a strictly philosophical circle to elucidate the right of reflection to thematize what one finds characteristic of the being of the nonthetic, pre-reflective, cogito, CSKS 125. It also presumes the act of comprehension, the Verstehen of the German social theorists like Dilthey and Weber, favored by Aaron, elaborated in N.E. 276-277, and later described in the critique as simply the translucidity of praxis to itself, CDRI, 74. Because pre-reflective consciousness is future-oriented, it fits well with Sartre's notion of the dialectic. In search for a method he will speak of the dialectical determination of real temporality, that is, of the true relation of men to their past and their future, 
explaining that dialectic as a movement of reality collapses if time is not dialectic, that is, if we refuse to recognize a certain action of the future as such, SM 92N. 3. And finally, toward the end of his lecture Sartre proposes a synthesis of the contemplative and non-dialectical consciousness of Husserl, who alone leads us to the contemplation of essences, with the activity of the dialectical project, but without consciousness, and hence without foundation, that we find in Heidegger, where we see, on the contrary, that the first element is transcendence, 132b.7 But it seems that Sartre is becoming more Hegelian in the discussion when he reaffirms in response to an intervention by Julian Benda, when I said that the cogito as an instantaneous truth does not achieve truth properly so called, and that, in agreement with Hegel, truth properly so called has become, it is clearly understood that I agree with you, truth is becoming, 135b. But he turns pragmatic at this point and warns that if one should need a totality of becoming in order to judge, we would fail precisely for lack of criteria. Citing the question of whether Hitler was right or wrong, he concludes. We have an absolute need for criteria both for action and for life in general. We need a starting point, this is true, that is false, we need certitudes. It is impossible that a man should operate on the basis of a simple moral probability when he asks other men to give their lives, as he might have done during the war or the occupation. I believe we have need of both, a becoming truth and, nevertheless, a certitude such that one can judge it. And I believe that if one reintegrates temporality into the categories, that is, if one notices the grasp of consciousness by reflection is not the grasp of a snapshot, but of a reality which has a past and a future, then a temporal truth is possible, often probable, but it sometimes carries an apodicticity which does not depend on the totality of history or the sciences. CSKS 135b 136a, emphasis added. This is an example of what I have called Sartre's two epistemologies, the one a phenomenological epistemology of vision, modeled on. Husserl's apodictic grasp of an essence or intelligible contour, the other one of praxis, much more in line with a pragmatist theory where the apodictic is really the non-negotiable, in Quine's famous thesis.8. Merleau-Ponty, Sartre and Ultra-Bolshevism. During the first years of his fellow traveling with the PCF Sartre published a set of essays in Les Temps Modernes, July 1952 to April 1954, that appeared as The Communists and Peace in Situations Volume 6, 1964. Written in anger against the French government, especially its police, the forces of order, Sartre focused on two events, the May 28, 1952 violent demonstration against the visit of General Ridgway to Paris as the new head of NATO, and the strike of June 2 against the arrest of several prominent party members after the previous demonstration turned violent. The conservative press interpreted the relatively sparse participation in the strike as evidence that the workers had abandoned the PCF. The entire scene moved Sartre to side with the party but as usual, on his principles, not theirs. His justification for supporting the practices of the PCF is that he had come to believe no other political entity could effectively serve the French proletariat at that time. Point nine. It is this text in particular that Merleau-Ponty seems to have had in mind when he launched his uncharacteristically acerbic attack on Sartre's ultra-Bolshevism. Merleau-Ponty had resigned from the editorial committee of LTM in May of 1953, though his subsequent Farewell essay, ostensibly a comment on Malraux's Lemieux's E. Imaginaire but taken to be his response to what is literature, was considerably more moderate in tone. Let us again select several examples from his Ultra Bolshevism chapter that raise issues which Sartre will address in the critique. 1. Merleau Ponty argues that Sartre cannot achieve a genuine, Marxian, dialectic because he lacks a concept of what Lucas C.S. after Weber called objective possibility to provide the negative dimension, counterfinality, as well as the mediation to negate that negation. Consequently, he leaves us with pure fact and arbitrary decision, voluntarism, where pure action is simply force. He never evokes the basic Marxist hope of resolution in true action, that is to say, action fitted to internal relations of the historical situation, which await nothing but action to take, to constitute a form in movement. In other words, Sartre never speaks of revolution, 
for the truth to be made is in Marxist language precisely the revolution, adventures of the dialectic 122. For a brief rejoinder, Sartre might have cited a text that we recognize from communists and peace, it is history which shows some the exits and makes others cool their heels before closed doors, CP 80. This will be elaborated both in search for a method and in the critique, but it was available to Merleau-Ponty if he had read that text more carefully. One gets the impression that he read this and other essays in the light of being and nothingness, where objective possibility is clearly absent. We shall see an entire section of search devoted to the problem of mediation. 2. What distinguishes Sartre from Marxism most obviously is his philosophy of the cogito versus Marx's philosophy of praxis, but what distinguishes them fundamentally, Merleau-Ponty insists, is their respective philosophies of time. Sartre's entire theory of the party and of class is derived from his philosophy of fact, of consciousness, and beyond fact and consciousness, from his philosophy of time. Adventures of the Dialectic 105 It is the pointillism of time, its unextended moments that make Sartrean conversion a constant possibility and while rendering fundamental choice an absolute beginning, adventures of the dialectic 129 to 132. Now Sartre had been mentioning praxis for years, though it came to the fore with the concept of a literature of praxis in what is literature. WL 194 FF. And it is mentioned occasionally in the notebooks, though. Merleau-Ponty may not have had access to these unpublished notebooks. His reading of W.L. and other texts as reflections of the ontology of B.N. renders him blind to any evidence of development in Sartre's social ontology. This was the core of Beauvoir's equally intemperate response. Again, Sartre's address to the French Philosophical Society puts the lie to this account, at least in the Hegelian notion of praxis and becoming truth. His distinction between the reflective and the pre-reflective cogito, already made in B.N., allows him to speak of a pre-reflective duration that is not instantaneous consciousness, while relegating a static and dynamic temporality to the reflective description of the cogito, CSKS 114. Still Merleau-Ponty has his finger on a basic ambiguity in Sartre's general epistemology, especially as he tries to fortify Hegelian dialectic with Husserlian apodicticity. We shall encounter again this instance of what Foucault would call an epistemology that is, one cog out of alignment, ten here the challenge is to synthesize or at least to coordinate the elements of two epistemologies, one of praxis and the other of vision, the former dialectical and the latter phenomenological. We shall encounter this juxtaposition of the incongruous in search for a method, but it occurs throughout Sartre's post-war thought. Point eleven. Thirdly, and finally, Merleau-Ponty claims, correctly, that Sartre's lack of the concept of an interworld renders him incapable of constructing a social ontology properly speaking. In Sartre, there is a plurality of subjects but no intersubjectivity. Looked at closely, the absolute right that the eye accords to the other is rather a duty. They are not joined in action, in the relative and the probable, but only on principles and on the condition that the other stick rigorously to them. The world and history are no longer a system with several points of entry but a sheaf of irreconcilable perspectives which never coexist and which are held together only by the hopeless heroism of the eye. Adventures of the Dialectic 205 I conclude with this lengthy remark because it is both a fair, critical assessment of the inadequate social ontology of B.N., as we have observed on several occasions, and an invitation to produce precisely the dialectical ontology that Sartre is about to undertake with the critique. Sartre never responded to this attack, except by writing the critique of dialectical reason. But in her equally intemperate reply, Beauvoir accuses Merleau-Ponty of writing in bad faith because he was aware that Sartre was in the process of revising the social ontology of B.N., which he admitted was its weakest part. Point 12. Search for a Method question of method. In November of 1956, Sartre and Beauvoir accepted an invitation to the Polish embassy where they met Jan Kott and Jerzy Lesowski, the editors of a Polish journal, Two Arcs O.C. As part of an issue on current French culture, the editors asked Sartre to write an essay on the state of existentialism in 1957. The result was, Marxism I Existentialism, April 1957, published as, Questions de Me Thought, in LTM, September, October 1957, 
alter considerably sosto adaptitoth, need saw French readers, SM 34. Graced with an augmented preface and a diminished title, question, in the singular, Demi Thode appeared as a quasi introduction to Book I of the Critique in 1960. The one question which Sartre is posing here and in the critique is do we have today the means to constitute a structural, historical anthropology? SM 34. Motivating Sartre's concern are the twin themes of a kind of humanism and a kind of ethics. We have witnessed their directive role in much of his previous work and shall recognize their guiding presence in what follows. In the 1950s the philosophical challenge was to offer a theory of human life, anthropology, that respected the claims of an aggressive structuralism that was spatial in its imagery and synchronic in its argument, such as he witnessed in the work of Le Six Strauss, Althusser, Barthes and others with the reality of history, with a Hegelian age, in a diachronic. Totalizing sense.13 in what is his second major work, Sartre is addressing the defining issue of resolving the presumed conflict between structure and history. As Wilhelm Dilthey dreamed of writing a fourth critique, this one on history to complement Kant's other three, so Sartre is undertaking a similar task, but refined by the recent successes of structuralist thought, an alleged enemy of narrative history the human subject, and dialectic in what the French call the human sciences, less sciences humanes. Echoing his advice to the Philosophical Society ten years earlier, Sartre concludes his preface to search for a method with the following reminder and proposal. From Marxism, which gave it a new birth, the ideology of existence, existentialism, inherits two requirements which Marxism itself derives from Hegelianism. If such a thing as a truth can exist in anthropology, it must be a truth that has become, and it must make itself a totalization. It goes without saying that this double requirement defines that movement of being and knowing, or of comprehension, which since Hegel is called dialectic. Also, in search for a method I have taken it for granted that such a totalization is perpetually in process as history and as historical truth. Starting from this fundamental postulate, I have attempted to bring to light the internal conflicts of philosophical anthropology, and in certain cases I have been able to outline, upon the methodological ground which I have chosen, the provisional solutions to these difficulties. SM 24-35, in the rest of this preface, which has been expanded for the first edition of the critique, he distills the foregoing into two overarching questions, is there a truth of man? and, is there a dialectical reason, to complement well-established positivist, analytic reason. CDR 10-11. Marxism and Existentialism. Sartre takes the title of the first chapter from his essay for the Polish Journal. The comparison had been percolating in his mind at least since. The founding of Les Temps Modernes, the formulating of a, definition, of existentialism in E.H., and the failure of his experiment with the third way politics of the RDR.14 It is one thing to make a gesture of reconciliation with the French Communist Party, but it is quite another to sell them the farm, which Sartre seemed to be doing in search for a method. Among the startling claims of this chapter is his famous elevation of living Marxism to the rank of the philosophy of our time, SM30, to which existentialism is related as a necessary ideology in the sense of being a function of the cultural superstructure built on the economic base, forces and relations of production. To be sure, glossing one of Marx's rare utopian indulgences, Sartre does admit that Marxism itself will eventually be overcome once man has been freed from the yoke of scarcity, and there will exist for everyone a margin of real freedom beyond the production of life. Because Marxism will have lived out its span, a philosophy of freedom will take its place. But Sartre warns, we have no means, no intellectual instrument, no concrete experience which allows us to conceive of this freedom or of this philosophy, SM 34. Years later, in his Existential Psychoanalysis, Biography, of Gustave Flaubert, Sartre would introduce the term A Socialism of Abundance, FIV 171, noting that there is an original contingency, at the core of its internal necessity, which reserves a place for existential creative freedom in whatever dialectical necessity one may ascribe to history, shades of his dialectic withholds. In effect, 
the philosopher of the imaginary is asking us to act as if, in the hope that the future is worth the sacrifice. In 1948 the Hungarian Marxist philosopher George Lucas C.S. published a book-length polemic against Sartre, existentialism or Marxism. In this book he argued that Sartre's politics were little more than petit bourgeois revolt and that he is absolutely incapable of understanding Marxism. 150. Illustrating the kind of assertion and counter-assertion that such political polemics can sink to, Sartre retorts that it is Lucas C.S. who does not understand Marx, SM 21. But this confrontation did goad Sartre into summarizing what he takes to be the provocative relation between Marxism and existentialism for the concrete thinker. Here let us simply observe that Lucas C.S. fails absolutely to account for the principal fact, we were convinced at one and the same time that historical materialism furnished the only valid interpretation of history and that existentialism remained the only concrete approach to reality. I do not pretend to deny the contradiction in this attitude. I simply assert that Lucas C.S. does not even suspect it. SM 21. The Problem of Mediations and Auxiliary Disciplines. It was structuralist Marxist Louis Althusser who labeled Sartre, the philosopher of mediation par excellence, 15 This was no compliment from a structuralist author, on the contrary, it was an implicit attack on dialectical reasoning and its theory of history that Sartre was now embracing. We saw Sartre's analogous contrast of his and Foucault's respective approaches to history, namely the cinema versus the slideshow. Taking the latter's The Order of Things as a model structuralist achievement, Sartre is claiming that structure is to history as the static is to the dynamic. If a driving force of Sartre's philosophical life has been to gain access to concrete reality, kept at a distance by the neo-Kantianism of his Sorbonne professors, and a reason why he and Beauvoir favored Jean Walls toward the concrete, we have witnessed Sartre's attempt to slake this thirst by concluding B.N. with a discussion of existential psychoanalysis. This is his method to gain insight into the defining core of an individual's life by uncovering his, her life-defining choice. As history assumed increasing importance in the late 1940s and 1950s, Sartre found Hegelian and Marxian dialectic a useful key to incorporating universal intelligibility into the concrete life of a living individual. This was the singular or concrete universal mentioned occasionally in earlier works but brought to center stage in search for a method and the critique. But the pivot of dialectical reasoning was the concept of mediation specifically the concretizing power of the human sciences to render important generalizations comprehensible, and of the actions of individuals to realize them in the uniqueness of their lives. As Sartre emphasized in the preface to The Family Idiot, which is in many ways the culmination of his life's work, The Family Idiot is the sequel to Search for a Method. Its subject, what, at this point in time, can we know about a man? What Sartre is now seeking is the current state of the human and natural sciences that enables us to comprehend the comprehension, CDR 805, 696, of any subject in question, as occurs in the boxing match that figures so prominently in Volume 2 of the Critique. Taking aim at the Marxist economic determinists as he had done in Amar, Sartre makes the now famous remark, Valery is a petit bourgeois intellectual, no doubt about it. But not every petit bourgeois intellectual is veil ry. The heuristic inadequacy of contemporary Marxism is contained in these two sentences, SM 56. As he explains, Marxism lacks any hierarchy of mediations which would permit it to grasp the process which produces the person and his product inside a class and within a given society at a given historical moment, SM 56. The Marxist, he believes, can reach the individual only by appealing to chance. Sartre seems to imply that his existentialist version of Marxism can achieve a kind of dialectical rationalism, my term, with the help of existential psychoanalysis, that everything becomes intelligible, though not causally determined as analytic reason would have it, since dialectic is not a determinism, SM 73. Consider the following. Existentialism refuses to abandon the real life to the unthinkable choices of birth for the sake of contemplating a universality limited to reflecting indefinitely up itself. It intends without being unfaithful to Marxist principles, to find mediations which allow the individual concrete, the particular life, the real dated conflict, the person, 
to emerge from the background of the general contradictions of productive forces and relations of production. SM57. One senses that Sartre is gesturing toward the structuralist Marxists like Althusser and Le Six Strauss, whose horizontal application of basic categories, Sartre's analytic reason, he hopes can be integrated, subsumed, into a totalizing historical process with the help of appropriate mediating praxis. In particular, he had in mind those of the family, and his study of Flaubert argued this in detail. He was writing Flaubert's existential biography while working on the critique, with the result that extended references appear in both Lydiate and the critique. It is not surprising that Sartre should remark, the explosive mixture of naive scientism and religion without God which constituted Flaubert, and which he tried to overcome by his love of formal art, can be explained if we understand that everything took place in childhood, that is, in a condition radically distinct from the adult condition. 16 This leads Sartre into the one privileged mediation which permits dialectical materialism to pass from general and abstract determinations to particular traits of the single individual, namely, psychoanalysis. He does not mean that of Jaspers, which he dismisses as mythological, nor even the theories of Freud, insofar as they employ their own myths and, of course, rely on the unconscious. It is, existential, psychoanalysis that Sartre has in mind, with its focus on life-defining choice, but now enhanced with appeal to the unsurpassable experience of childhood and the particular family that mediates the individual and his class. In an ironic footnote for the benefit of skeptical Marxists, Sartre asks, Is the general conditioning by his class, incompatible with the unsurpassable experiences of childhood? But precisely what was this unsurpassable childhood, if not a particular way of living the general interests of our surroundings? Nothing is changed, it reintroduces historicity and negativity in the very way in which the person realizes himself as a member of a well-defined social stratum. SM 65, N.66. Displaying perhaps an excess of enthusiasm, he insists that psychoanalysis conceived as mediation does not bring to bear any new principle of explanation. SM 65 N. It does, however, provide us with understanding. Before moving to the final chapter of search, let me emphasize two claims in this chapter, one ontological and the other moral, which are of particular relevance to the critique. Ontologically, Sartre insists that, there are only men and real relations between men. He grants that this means that a social whole such as the group is in one sense only a multiplicity of relations and of relations among those relations. But then how do we determine the type of reality and efficacy which people are social field and which may be conveniently called the intermundane, Merleau-Ponty's interworld, SM 74. Taking as an example an angler's club, Sartre acknowledges that the members have a certain type of reciprocal relation among themselves. When we say there are only men and real relations between men, for Merleau-Ponty I add things also, and animals, etc., we mean only that we must expect to find the support of collective objects in the concrete activity of individuals. We do not intend to deny the reality of these objects, but we claim that it is parasitical, SM 77. Still, he freely admits, the relative irreducibility of social fields, SM 82, this is a prime example of what I shall call Sartre's thesis of the, primacy of free organic praxis. It has grounded his theory of knowledge in his ethic, but it is fundamentally an ontological principle, as we can see. It also gives the lie to Aaron's insistence that Sartre defends a methodological and, it would seem, an ontological individualism in social philosophy as well, for this would link him with the individualism of bourgeois analytic reason, from which he had sought to free himself at least since anti-Semite and Jew. Sartre calls his third alternative dialectical nominalism, an appeal to the dialectic to save the primacy of free organic praxis while insisting on the relative autonomy of social phenomena. Point 18 The humanist theme surfaces here when Sartre dismisses the Marxist version of universalizability as an abstract skeleton with a structuralist framework, and claims that as a result it has entirely lost the meaning of what it is to be a man. SM 83. He concludes this chapter, however, by reminding his critics that his aim is not to reject Marxism in favor of an idealist humanism, but simply, to reconquer man within Marxism, SM 83. 
the progressive-regressive method. For years, Sartre had been employing the regressive method of critical analysis, arguing Kant-wise from a fact or state of affairs to conditions of its possibility. He used it in the imaginary, for example, to convey his insights more easily to a public still relatively unfamiliar with the phenomenological method, see Imaginary 179. In the previous chapter of Search for a Method Sartre cites a simple and faultless method for integrating sociology and history in the perspective of a materialist dialectic, SM51N. It involves several phases. A. Descriptive. Observation but with a scrutiny guided by experience and by a general theory. We might call this the phenomenological phase, using that term in its broad descriptive sense. B. Analytical regressive. Analysis of reality. Attempt to date it precisely. C. Historical genetic. Attempt to rediscover the present, reality, but elucidated, understood, explained. SM52N. Sartre endorses this project with one small addition. We believe that this method, with its phase of phenomenological description and its double movement of regression followed by progress, is valid, with the modifications which its objects may impose upon it, in all domains of anthropology. SM 52N. Weschel notes that Sartre takes anthropology, in a sense equivalent to what the French call the human sciences, less sciences humaines, that includes history, sociology, and psychoanalysis. Point 19 How this threefold method maps over the Hegelian Marxian dialectic so that neither the group nor the man is suppressed remains to be seen. See SM 53. Sartre points in that direction when he insists that the very development of the dialectical philosophy must lead it to produce, in a single act, the horizontal synthesis and the totalization in depth, SM82. This is the task sketched in the present chapter, but admittedly slated for development in the critique and the family idiot. In search of a supple, patient dialectic, Sartre landed a direct hit on neo-Marxist scholasticism with his materialism and revolution. Published in the ninth issue of the first volume of LTM.20 it is the rigidity of the official, Stalinist, reading of dialectical materialism, its reductionist, economism, that Sartre opposed in the late 1940s. Such an approach to history and the anthropology that sustained it was, in his view, impatient with the nuances of concrete life and in denial of the mediating factors that could give it access to the concrete. We saw Sartre opening the door to a more humanist dialectic in the Mar and laying the path for such an approach in search for a method. Before turning to the critique, let me state the Marxist mantra for a materialist dialectic that Sartre will now adopt, but as usual in his own way, men themselves make their history but in a given environment which conditions them. 21 It is the nature and flexibility of that conditioning that continues to divide Sartre from the Marxists. Even as greater flexibility is incrementally acknowledged by each side, the sticking point in this exchange is the reality of individual freedom and its concomitant moral responsibility. Can Marxism become a concrete philosophy? Can existentialism suffer a truly social conditioning? Can either of them support a viable social ethic? Sartre has already made a significant concession by shifting his focus from consciousness to praxis, roughly, purposive human activity in its socio-economic field, from facticity to objective possibility, and from transcendence to need as going beyond a situation, SM 91.23 we shall soon witness his characterization of comprehension as the translucidity of praxis to itself, CDR 74, and his insistence that to grasp the meaning of any human conduct, it is necessary to have it our Disposal what German psychiatrists and historians have called comprehension. It is originally progressive, SM-153, but it may be entirely regressive, SM-155, or simultaneously progressive, toward the objective result, and regressive, I go back toward the original condition, SM-154. Still, our comprehension of the other is never contemplative, it is only a moment of our praxis, a way of living, in struggle or in complicity, the concrete, human relation which unites us to him, SM 156. What makes this undertaking existentialist, is its emphasis on the project of the laborer, his or her physical overcoming and fashioning the resistance of the material object to yield, worked matter, as he will say in the critique.
It is, into this very knowledge and into the universality of concepts, that existentialism, wants to reintroduce the unsurpassable singularity of the human adventure. So he concludes, thus the comprehension of existence is presented as the human function of Marxist anthropology, SM 176. Sartre combines the two terminologies in this last chapter of search for a method to ease our move to the critique, we shall define the method of the existentialist approach as a regressive progressive and analytic synthetic method. It is at the same time an enriching cross-reference between object, which contains the whole period as hierarchized significations, and the period, which contains the object as its totalization, SM 148. Again, this will assume particular significance in the family idiot. Finally, Sartre repeats a major ontological claim that will continue to function both in the critique and in the family idiot when he insists. These relations, among individual capitalists, are molecular because there are only individuals and particular relations among them, opposition, alliance, dependence, etc., but they are not mechanical, because in no case are we dealing with the colliding of simple inertias. Within the unity of his own enterprise, each person surpasses the other and incorporates him as a means, and vice versa, each pair of unifying relations is in turn surpassed by the enterprise of a third. SM 162, last emphasis added. What follows in the final pages of the book is a cavalcade of terms and concepts that will be defined as they appear in the first volume of the critique. But the underlying question for both search for a method and the critique is raised toward the end of the first volume of the latter, Dow now possessed the materials for constructing a structural, historical anthropology. Several of Sartre's contemporaries had produced structural anthropologies and others had given us historical anthropology. The task for Sartre himself in both search for a method and especially the critique was to conjoin these two approaches in one grand theory. It would have to be dialectical, but supple, and respectful of the epistemic, ontological and moral primacy of the free organic individual. Such was the ideal of a critique of dialectical reason. Chapter 13 Individuals and Groups, Critique of Dialectical Reason, Volume I, Theory of Practical Ensembles. Sartre defends the published order of search for a method followed by critique of dialectical reason in his preface to the first edition of the critique, 1. I fear that the two works included in this volume may appear to be unequal in importance and scope. Logically, the second should have come before the first, since it is intended to supply its critical foundation. But I was afraid that this mountain of notes might seem to have brought forth a mouse, moreover, since, the second work did in fact grow from the first, it seemed to preserve the chronological order, which, from a dialectical perspective, is always the most significant. CDR 2nd Eden, Annex 821 Given that Sartre later described The Family Idiot as the sequel to Search for a Method, and in view of the numerous references to Flaubert that punctuate both SM and CDR, the question arises whether the progressive-regressive method introduced in SM and soon to be observed in The Family Idiot will map over the dialectic in the critique, in effect, whether it is synonymous with or at least complementary to the method used in that work. The subtitle of Being and Nothingness is, An Essay on Phenomenological Ontology. The subtitle of the critique could be, An Essay in Social Ontology, because it discusses the nature and functions of the basic kinds of social being. What makes possible a valid social philosophy and a viable theory of history for Sartre is his replacement or better complement of the visual model of interpersonal relations employed in BN with the praxis model adopted in the critique. Whereas the third party in BN is simply the existential other writ large and so could be labeled an alienating, objectifying, third, the praxis model of interpersonal relations renders positive reciprocity possible through the practical mediation of a third, Lotir's me dieter. If the model of alienating relations in BN is the objectifying gaze of the infernal trio caught in Sartre's No Exit, the paradigm of non alienating relations in the generous gift of the artist, which was already discussed in Notebooks for an Ethics, is given ontological status with the mediating third that emerges in the critique. Sartre remarks in BN that the existence of the other is our original fall, BN 289. In the critique he speaks of our relations mediated by the practico inert as basic sociality, CDR 318, and in contrast with the group, which he sees as the model of non-alienating interpersonal relations in the critique, 
he discusses the practical inert ensemble as the matrix of groups and their grave, CDR 635. We shall sort out these several technical terms shortly, but suffice it to say that practical inert assumes and modifies the function of being in itself from BN. The initial edition of Volume I of the Critique, the only one published in Sartre's lifetime, is scarcely user-friendly, with 700 pages of text in small print on large pages, with sentences running for over a page and paragraphs continuing across several pages, and the whole prefaced by a table of contents with only four entries, one of which is, question of method. The book resembles Kierkegaard's analogy of someone, trying to find their way around Denmark with a map of the world on which the country appears as the size of a pinhead. Raymond Aron, who considered Sartre, the most Germanic of French philosophers, called the critique, a sort of Baroque monument, overwhelming and almost monstrous, three still, he devoted his Gifford lectures, 1962 and 1965, and a year-long course at the Sorbonne, 1966 to 1967, to the book. And it has been rightly called, a landmark in modern social thought, a turning point in the thinking of our time, Raymond Williams in The Guardian. Significantly, Claude Lo Six Strauss, who devoted the final chapter of his famous The Savage Mind to the Critique, also lectured on the text. As the leading structuralist anthropologist of his day, he and the movement which he represented were forces to be reckoned with. Sartre used a number of structuralist code words like signifier and synchronic slash diachronic in the critique, both to show that there was considerable room for structure in his thought, though he located it in the realm of the practical inert and limited its method to analytic reason, and especially to defend the primacy of free organic practice, which is the existential non-negotiable of Sartre's praxis philosophy. After considering Merleau-Ponty's critique of Sartre's feeble social ontology in Adventures of the Dialectic, one can imagine Sartre writing the critique with Merleau-Ponty's book at his side. Whether it be the dialectical notion of time or the use of interworld or any of the other expressions and ideas from adventures that are adopted and or corrected in the critique, this major work can be seen as a response to his former friend and colleague at LTM. Of course it is more than that. But the actuality of this phenomenon helps to situate the text and Sartre's writing it, at full gallop, with the aid of drugs to support the intensity of his work, point four so let us consider several of the terms that Sartre introduces in the process of grounding a dialectical, structural anthropology, and the theory of history that it supports. For cardinal concepts. Praxis we have already observed this term in Sartre's vocabulary before the critique, but now it assumes in his thought the leading role previously reserved for the for itself or consciousness. Point five in a footnote Sartre translates praxis and practical inert into the vocabulary of BN. While correcting a misunderstanding of BN that fundamental alienation derived from some prenatal choice. Point six in one of those great inexact equations that he favors, Sartre announces that dialectic and praxis are one and the same, CDR 802 if not precisely the same, dialectic constitutes the logic of praxis. Praxis occurs according to the threefold articulation of the Sartrean dialectic, contradictions, surpassing, depassement, and totalization, SM34. Later in search for a method he remarks that, praxis is inconceivable without need, transcendence, and the project, SM171. And later, need, negativity, surpassing, project, transcendence, form a synthetic totality in which each one of the moments designated contain all the others, SM173. In other words, to reason dialectically is to think holistically, but it is also to accept the concept of dialectical temporality, or, as he explained earlier, to recognize a certain action of the future as such, SM92N. That is an essential feature of praxis as totalizing not merely a retrospective summation but a goal-focused project. Again in SM, the very notion of praxis and that of dialectic, inseparably bound together, are contradictory to the intellectualist idea of a knowledge. And to come to the most important point, labor, as man's reproduction of his life, can hold no meaning if its fundamental structure is not to project. In view of this default, which pertains to the historical development and not to the actual principles of the doctrine, existentialism, 
at the heart of Marxism in taking the same givens, the same knowledge, as its point of departure, must attempt in its turn, at least as an experiment, the dialectical interpretation of history. SM 175, emphasis added. Thus far, the dialectic is a heuristic. We are in the formal mode of gathering and identifying the components of the social ensemble. In fact, Sartre never surpasses the formal mode in Volume I of the Critique, CCDRI 818. What makes this undertaking existentialist is its emphasis on the project of the laborer, his, her physical overcoming and fashioning the resistance of the material object to yield worked matter, as he will say in the critique. It is, into this very knowledge and into the universality of concepts, that existentialism wants to reintroduce the unsurpassable singularity of the human adventure. So Sartre concludes, thus the comprehension of existence is presented as the human function of Marxist anthropology, SM 176. Sartre states categorically, the essential discovery of Marxism is that labor, as a historical reality and as the utilization of particular tools in an already determined social and material situation, is the real foundation of the organization of social relation. This discovery can no longer be questioned, CDRI 152 and point 35. Following Marx, he takes physical labor to be the most basic form of praxis. We have spoken of the translucidity of praxis, which would suggest that it shares the transparency and unqualified responsibility of Sartrean consciousness. But such is not the case. True, Sartre does say that praxis enjoys the immediacy of pre-reflective consciousness and that, like the pre-reflective, it is practical and engaged. Indeed, he asserts that, although praxis is self-explanatory and transparent to itself, it is not necessarily expressible in words, CDRI 93. This means that the self-awareness of praxis is similarly pre-reflective. Given that, knowledge, for Sartre is reflective, whereas that practical awareness called, comprehension, or, understanding, is pre-reflective, it follows that an agent or a group could comprehend more than it could know. Sartre thinks that this is true for the group members and even for the individuals dispersed in what he calls, serial, relations, such as the television viewing audience or the members of a crowd. We can now appreciate Sartre's claim in the critique that bourgeois individuals understood the significance of practices proper to their class as did those who were excluded, even if they did not reflectively know it. Yet even that, understanding, now seems to be qualified by the external influence of its situation. The unblinking eye appears to be clouded by individual history. To anticipate the family idiot or this epistemological matter is best illustrated, Sartre concedes that presence to self for each of us possesses a rudimentary structure of praxis. Even on the level of non-thetic consciousness, intuition is conditioned by individual history, FII, 141. In Flaubert's case, it is his childhood, passive constitution, which accounts for a life of massive bad faith, passive activity, whose epistemological manifestation is his choice of belief and the imaginary over knowledge and the real point seven. The practico inert in his foreword to the second edition of the critique, Frederick Jameson speaks of Sartre's having invented a new concept in a new and durable philosophical term, the so-called practico inert, as a more precise way of designating objects which are not mere things and agencies which are not exactly people either, CDR 2nd n 23. This is the antidialectic which Sartre mentioned in What is Literature, in which the dialectic of history is contested, penetrated, and corroded by a kind of antidialectic which is still a dialectic. I remarked earlier that the basic dualism of Sartre's thought was not so much one of consciousness and the non-conscious as one of spontaneity and inertia, praxis and the practico inert. But we must recognize that it is practico inert. Exhibiting what we have been calling the primacy of praxis, the inert spoken of here is the sedimentation of past praxis. And it imposes an alienating or othering character on whatever it mediates. Point eight Sartre describes it as simply the activity of others in so far as it is sustained and diverted by inorganic inertia, CDRI 556. Not raw nature, but nature as modified by prior praxis, is the mediating factor. Praxis, on the other hand, aims toward sameness, not static identity. 
A major premise of Sartre's new praxis philosophy is that reciprocal ternary relations are the basis of all relations between men whatever form they might take, CDRI, 111. The kind of binary formation that abounded in BN, Sartre believes, is the necessary ground for any ternary relations, but, conversely, a ternary relation, as the mediation of man amongst men, is the basis on which reciprocity becomes aware of itself as a reciprocal connection, CDR 109. In effect, it concretizes an abstract duality. The nature of these reciprocities, whether negative, struggle, or positive, cooperation, depends on the mediation of the practico inert or of praxis respectively, see CDR 113. Sartre can now speak of two basic kinds of social reality, that of the active group constituting the common field and that of effectively separated though ostensibly united individuals forming what he terms the practical inert field. This is the field of serial relations based on the mediation of such worked matter as natural languages, rituals of exchange or physical artifacts. He claims that the practical inert constitutes fundamental sociality, CDRI 318. Since he conceives the group as arising through an essential negation of the practical inert, he characterizes the practical inert as the matrix of groups and their grave, CDRI, 635. Sartre's view is that the motor of history is scarcity, la rarite, of material goods, which leads to a quasi-Hobbesian war of all against all and the violence that marks history as we know it. Point nine. Sartre distinguishes two basic forms of seriality in the critique, the collective and the institutional, each at opposite ends of the practical inert field. Consider his example of the people waiting at a bus stop. Their bond of materiality, the practical inert ensemble, is called the collective, the thing which forges it, the collective object, in this case the bus, and the relations altered thereby, serial. A scarcity of seats coupled with various demands on the travelers to meet obligations generates competition for places and, depending on what is at stake, even overt violence. Think of the photo of people clinging to the last helicopter out of Saigon toward the end of the Vietnam War. Sartre's larger thesis is that scarcity of material goods, of whatever sort, generates the violence that has marked recorded history. We noted his single mention of the ideal of a socialism of abundance in a footnote to the family idiot, which indicated the end ideal of properly human striving. He goes on to describe the ephemeral nature of the revolutionary group in the French Revolution as well as its seemingly inevitable demise by the gradual solidification of its spontaneity, first into the pledged group, where the both serves as a practical inert wedge, next into the organized group and finally the institution which Sartre seems to regard as the victorious return of the practical inert in the social realm. He devotes considerable space in Book II to the Soviet Union and directorial society generally. In other words, he has an ideal but he is not a prophet, as we shall discover in his final discussion on ethics with Benny Le Vy.10 process is Sartre's term for the sequence of impersonal practices that populate the practical inert field. The social field, he remarks, is full of acts without an author, SM 163 to 164. He lists three modalities of human action, individual praxis, which he also calls constituting, common constituted praxis, and praxis process. They are, he insists, in themselves distinct from the practical inert process and are its foundation, CDRI 789. The last mode unites praxis with otherwise necessary social relation. Consider what he calls the system of colonialism. In a famous critique of this institution, he remarks that the meanness is in the system, CP 183, because he considers it exploitative by its very nature. But to be true to his notion of praxis process, he should have said, the meanness is not entirely in the system for at the base of exploitative processes are oppressive praxis for which individual responsibility should be assumed. As Merleau-Ponty observed, with Sartre, as with the anarchists, the idea of oppression always dominates that of exploitation. The mediating third, it should be recalled that the crucial discovery of dialectical investigation, L.X. Brient's dialectique, is that man is mediated by things to the same extent that things are mediated by man. This is what is called dialectical circularity, CDRI, 80. 
Sartre made a similar remark regarding what could be called the principle of totalization in the family idiot, when he said that a man totalizes his epoch to the precise degree that he is totalized by it, FIV 394. If the idealist dialectic misuse the triad, this is primarily because the real relation between men is necessarily ternary. But this trinity is not a designation or ideal mark of the human relation, it is inscribed in being, that is to say, in the materiality of individuals, CDRI 109. Sartre appreciates that the core social relation is triadic. In BN that relation was objectifying and in that sense alienating as well, but what appeared to be triadic was at base dyadic. What we have called the alienating third is really the other of BN writ large. It is the looking, looked at relation as exhibited in the play No Exit, where the famous concluding remark, we suggested, should read, hell is the alienating third. That relationship continues in the critique as mediated by the practical inert. Serial relationships from which the group is born and into which it returns conceal a fundamental impotence behind. The mask of power. Sartre cites the radio listening audience as an example, but he could have mentioned the demonstrators at public events in the same regard. Interpersonal relations in this condition are not those of true, positive reciprocity, which is emerging as the prime value in Sartre's social philosophy. Rather, imitation or contagion, not cooperation, is the rule, interchangeability in numerical equivalence, not uniqueness, obtain among members of a series. With the emergence of the group infusion this changes. Sartre takes the group to be the second degree of sociality after seriality, which is the first. He adopts Malraux's term, apocalypse, to describe that moment when the group breaks out from serial dispersal to gather themselves into something new and different in kind. The change is qualitative, since as a group member the individual has achieved a new set of relations, roles and powers that were not available to him in his serial state. The group is irreducible to its members yet dependent on their organic praxis and has an ontological status of its own, it is an entity of real relation. It mediates the membership of its members just as they mediate that of one another and of the group insofar as they direct their praxis to the common end. In contrast with the unfreedom and passive activity of the series, Sartre describes the emergence of the group as the sudden resurrection of freedom, CDRI 401. He warns that the group is not a metaphysical reality, but a definite practical relation of men to an objective and to each other, CDRI 404N. This raises the implication, seemingly contrary to his previous thought and writing, that the individual is free only as a group member and that he can accomplish nothing of social significance by himself. This is precisely what he will admit to his Maoist interlocutors in 1974.12 but if he continues in his quest of the concrete, it seems that individuals in relation will meet his need. For an object lesson in group formation, its full blossoming and eventual falling into serial decay, consider Sartre's analysis of the Parisian crowd in the Cartier Saint-Antoine, July 14, 1789, when they were in serial flight before royal troops. Suddenly, in Sartre's imaginative reconstruction, as if by prior agreement, someone shouts, stop, and the command, lo mot d'order, echoes among scores of people who reverse direction even as they change their perception of the scene. What was constructed as flight is now read as mobilization for counterattack. It is a practical awareness that, we, are acting, at first a small band, but soon swelling to large proportions, each participant buoyed up by the realization that, we are a hundred strong. Sartre calls this constitutive action the interiorization of multiplicity. It denotes the crucial praxis where each takes the rest as, the same, and adopts what was the, elsewhere, of serial flight as the, here, of common concern. Each emerges as the common individual, the practical negation of serial individuality. Point 13 To summarize Sartre's brilliant phenomenological description amidst a dialectical analysis, let us simply note that, once the group is formed and the external threat removed, an oath is conceived to preserve the union. Point 14 This pledge of loyalty to their cause under pain of death for betrayal constitutes the problematic concept of fraternity terror that haunts his social philosophy. It is a duality that Sartre never managed to resolve. See Hope 93. He sees the pledge as the insertion of a necessary element of the practico inert into the spontaneity of the group, its subsequent, 
d. Evolution into the organized group, and finally the institution, for example, the bureaucratic state. There seem to be stages or degrees of practical inert mediation in Sartre's social ontology, but one can state simply that where the practical inert mediates, human relations are serial, where praxis mediates, the relations are free. Regarding the mediating third party, MT, as Lotir's mediator is often translated, we can better appreciate its function, and it is a functional concept, if we think of a football team, under whatever. Description. Consider the following. The MT is a praxis, the MT interiorizes a potentially dispersed multiplicity into a practical whole, the third receives the power he gives and he sees the other third party approaching him as his power, CDRI 510. If power is the first of many, common qualities, of the group, it joins others such as, function, rights and duties, structure, violence and fraternity. The member, of this team, in our example, actualizes all these reciprocal relations as his new being, his sociality, CDRI 510. As Sartre explains, the members of the group are third parties, which means that each of them totalizes the reciprocities of others. And the relation of one third to another has nothing to do with alterity, since the group is the practical milieu of this relation, it must be a human relation, which we shall call mediated reciprocity. CDRI 374 Emphasis added. In the middle of his analysis Sartre pauses to remind us that at the level of the constituted dialectic group praxis, we can understand any common praxis because we are always an organic individuality which realizes a common individual, since, to exist, to act, and to comprehend, he explains, are one and the same, CDRI 558. But this establishes what he terms a schema of universality, namely, constituted dialectical reason, which governs the practical comprehension of a specific reality, which Sartre calls praxis process. He offers several examples of this comprehensibility, the most striking of which are the counterfinality of Chinese deforestation and Spanish attempts at hoarding gold from its South American mines. In each instance, the reverse of what was intended occurred. The Chinese lost land to flooding due to the resultant erosion, and the Spanish government lost much of its wealth due to that inflation which followed its policy of hoarding gold from its colonial mines. We should note that these examples, read dialectically, yield important examples of what Sartre calls dialectical necessity, and constitute something as close to a proof of his approach as one could expect at this stage. To summarize his argument, he repeats, necessity appears in experience when we are robbed of our action by worked matter, the practical inert, not in so far as it is pure materiality but in so far as it is materialized praxis, CDRI, 224. As he concludes Book I of the Critique, Sartre hangs his argument on two hypotheses the first is the methodological appeal to praxis as comprehension, if a situated dialectic is possible, then social conflicts, battles, and regular conflicts, as complex events produced by the practices of reciprocal antagonism between two individuals or multiplicities, must, in principle be comprehensible to the third parties, who depend on them without participating, or to observers who see them from outside, without being in any way involved. From this point of view, he continues, nothing is fixed a priori. The investigation has to be continued, CDRI 816. He proposes to do this in the progressive phase planned for Book 2. His second hypothesis makes this clear. Thus, he concludes, the regressive movement of the critical investigation has demonstrated the intelligibility of practical structures and the dialectic relation which interconnects the various forms of active multiplicities, CDRI 817. But, he warns, we are still at the level of synchronic totalization with our discovery of the elementary formal structures. So we have now located the dialectical structures of a structural anthropology. We have yet to consider the diachronic depth of practical temporalization by a progressive movement that will complete this regressive move. But Sartre has been pursuing the goal stated in his preface to search for a method and the critique, my intention is to raise one question and only one, do we now possess the materials for constituting a structural, historical anthropology? CDR 2nd Eden, Annex 822. The foundation for such an anthropology has been laid by a regressive argument. 
it remains to chart its progressive complement in the next volume. Volume 2, Critique. The editor's subtitle for this unfinished text is, The Intelligibility of History. The volume purports to constitute the progressive movement which complements the more regressive arguments of the first book, though in fact we will have to wait for the family idiot to view the progressive method fully in the existential biography of Gustave Flaubert and his times. Like most of Sartre's major works, it remains a torso. The Boxing Match Having described history as we know it as a tale of conflict and violence due to the scarcity of material goods, and violence as interiorized scarcity, CDRI 815, it was not surprising that Sartre, an amateur pugilist, would turn to the boxing match as an object lesson in the intelligibility of history. As he observes toward the end of volume I, struggle as reciprocity is a function of reciprocity of comprehension. If one of the adversaries should cease to comprehend he would become the object of the other, CDR 816, and point 133. There is a Hobbesian tone to this remark and to Sartre's analysis of practical inert mediation via what we have called the alienating third, which resonated throughout both volumes, a war of all against all. But, as we have seen, a more Rousseauian situation arises when scarcity is overcome or at least suspended, with the advent of the group and group member as mediating third. Again, that is the sudden, if short-lived, emergence of freedom. Once more, we are in search of the concrete. So the dialectical reading of a particular boxing match differs from its analytical alternative as the contextualized and totalized differ from the acontextual and abstract. Read dialectically, in a spiral manner of internalization and externalization, Sartre's account of this particular event on this boxing card held in this arena on this evening aims to make comprehensible the expanding spiral of the mediating factors that are enveloped by the practice of prize fighting and incarnated by this particular match. What he calls enveloping totalization, totalization de envelopment, can be pictured as the expanding circles of the dialectical spiral, whereas incarnation, L incarnation, denotes the contracting circles of that spiral that point to the race and social condition of these fighters, in some, their existential biographies. It may help to consider a similar contrast Sartre drew in his discussion of language toward the end of being and nothingness. Point 15 Inspired by the Hegelian dialectic, Sartre distinguished between the truth and the reality of the Hegelian dialectic in his discussion of language. French was the reality of language, which was the truth of French. Likewise, dialect was the reality of French, which was the truth of dialect and so forth until one arrived at this particular utterance which was the reality of the patois, which was the truth of the utterance. The terminus of this spiral was the reality of this person in this situation uttering these words. From this, Sartre draws a properly existentialist, though rigorously anti-structuralist conclusion, freedom is the only possible foundation of the laws of language, BN 517, EN 600. Returning to the boxing match, the potentially limitless amount of information that one might gather as the social and historical context of the match widens is compressed into this antagonistic reciprocity. The fighter is mediated by the match in his practical relation to the other. The theme of life and death introduces another existentialist dimension both into the dialectic of this event and into the volume generally. In the example of this particular match, what Sartre sees among the conditions and grounds of this conflict, which their praxis interiorizes, is the fundamental scarcity of the material conditions of their existence, CDR 2 9. He considers this the deepest source of their violent combat, the absolute is above all the different separating life from death. Every violence event is produced, lived, refused, accepted as the absolute, CDR 2 colon 31. In the present example, it is the knockout, always risked, always awaited by the crowd, which, is a public realization of death, CDR 2 colon 31. Later he elaborates that it is violent death that condemns an individual or a group to utter failure, for such a death is realized as the incarnation of the enveloping totalization inasmuch as it is in itself, rather than as a determination for itself of intersubjectivity, CDR 2 colon 310. Hearkening back to his Bergsonian influence, Sartre lays bare the basis of this struggle to overcome scarcity, human praxis has a non-transcendable aim, 
to preserve life, CDRI 385, and echoing his prediction in search for a method of an unimaginable philosophy of freedom to emerge in a world without scarcity, he cautions, nothing warrants the assertion that this end, the preservation of life, would remain non-transcendable, even if humanity one day freed itself from the yoke of scarcity. On the other hand, it is clear that it is our own history, the history of need, which we are describing, and that the other, if it does exist one day as a transcendence of prehistory, is as unknown to us as that of another species living on another planet, CDR 2 colon 385N. Two technical terms, just introduced in the previous paragraphs and one unique to this volume, require additional explanation, enveloping totalization 16 and incarnation, presumably more appropriate to the progressive method and the history that it is groomed to comprehend, they gloss the previous pair, practico inert, and praxis, by expanding the scope of totalization and sharpening the focus of free organic praxis. One could say that together they constitute and clarify the concrete or singular universal by which Sartre enlists the Hegelian notion, Begriff, in his pursuit of the concrete, le concrete, point 17 Sartre had, admitted to having delivered in volume I, not the real concrete, which can only be historical, but the set of formal contexts, curves, structures and conditionings that constitute the formal milieu in which the historical concrete must necessarily occur, CDRI 671. Enveloping totalization a term unique to critique volume 2, enveloping totalization, ET, is, a turning back of the inert upon the agent to recondition him, 284. In terms of critique volume I, it is a temporalizing of praxis process and, as such, draws its unity from its transcendence toward a goal, praxis, and forges passive syntheses and multiplicities, processes. The editor of this text calls it a system, CDR 2 colon 183N. In this sense it could describe colonialism discussed earlier. True to his dialectical nominalism, Sartre gives, enveloping totalization, a somewhat different meaning as its reference shifts. Point 18 still, he preserves the primacy of praxis when he adds, in rejecting any idealist interpretation of this phenomenon, that, it goes without saying that this dissolving mediation, of the practical process, is carried out by men, CDR 2 232. Once more, the meanness is not entirely in the, colonial, system. Point 19 in its most comprehensive form, enveloping totalization may be seen as a version of that, totalization without a totalizer, on the possibility of which Sartre hangs the meaning of history in volume I, retaining the hypothetical mode of these volumes, he writes early in volume 2, we do not even know yet if the enveloping totalization can exist, we shall see further on that it is the condition of any intelligibility of history, CDR 2 colon 33 n, incarnation, correlative to ET, it is an internal and local temporalization, moment, as Hegel might say, of the ongoing totalization, CDR 2 colon 77. Incarnation appeared earlier in the context of Sens and the concrete universal, CNE 170. Thus every move of the boxers in the ring, incarnates, the fundamental violence that permeates the historical process in a field of scarcity. The upshot of this quasi-Hegelian stance is that, boxing in its entirety is present at every instant of the fight as a sport and as a technique, with all the human qualities and material conditioning, training, physical condition, etc., that it demands, CDR 2 colon 20. Of course, Sartre will expand ET, of which this fight is an incarnation in a dialectical sense, to include the socio-economic dimension, the contractual relationship, the capitalist interest, the racial and class identities of fighters and crowd and the like, unfortunately, gender identities are not mentioned. It appears that the duality of E.T. and incarnation was introduced to foster the historical character of the dialectic, rendering it historical, not in a narrativist sense but in its social ontological dimension. Incarnation is an especially apt notion for integrating idiosyncrasies and biographical considerations into the historical account as befits an existentialist theory. In fact, the existentialist approach to history, being a combination of historical materialism and existential psychoanalysis, demands that we concretize, incarnate, the formal abstractions into the convergence of a lived life. Sartre speaks of incarnation as the concrete universal, 
constantly producing itself as the animation and temporalization of individual contingency. In the case of the boxing match, this means that one punch, like one dance, is indissolubly singular and universal, CDR 2.40. So Sartre's turn to Stalin, if not a complete treatise on the dictator and the directorial society that he constituted and that constituted him in a dialectical circularity, is a suggestive move in that direction. Though incomplete, it prepares us for a more complete existential psychoanalysis of Flaubert and his times in The Family Idiot. The Circularity of Incarnation, The Case of Stalin Armed with these additions to the dialectic constructed in Volume I, Sartre is now in a position to discuss a historical phenomenon that focuses not only on the formal ensembles of structural intelligibility and on a praxis process of professional violence, but on a sovereign individual, and not just any individual, but one who in the 1930s and 1940s could say elitat, say moi, or its Russian equivalent, though. There were other candidates for that title in other countries in those days. After distinguishing directive, dictatorial, from non-directive societies, the latter being capitalist societies left for future study, Sartre focuses on Stalin and the phenomenon of Stalinism as a case study in the dialectical circularity between the common individual and the sovereign. Though he allows that the formative experiences of this Georgian seminarian were decisive in many respects, as befits his appeal to the unsurpassable childhood, SM 65N, his interest at this stage is not in biography as such, the singularization of the social, but in history as the subsumption of chance events and personal idiosyncrasies, the socialization of the singular. CDR 2.216. Where does this lead? To a dialectical relation by which Stalin makes himself, and is made, the man of the hour, a transformation of the individual and a deviation of the social function, see CDR 2.219. It is this reciprocal modification, this transformation and deviation, which Sartre calls the circularity of incarnation, CDR 2.194, that determinists like Georgi Plekhanov overlook. What it means is that, as a common individual, Stalin was not a mere person. Sartre dubs him a human pyramid, deriving all his practical sovereignty from the inert structures and from all the support of every leading subgroup, and every individual, but conversely, inasmuch as he was not just a man called Stalin but the sovereign, he was retotalized in himself by all the complex determinations of the pyramid, CDR 2.199. What distinguished Stalin from other sovereigns, in Sartre's mind, was that he was so constituted by the type and organs of his power that there was no gap between person and function, between a private Stalin and a public Stalin, where freedom, responsibility and, one could say, conscience, could lodge point twenty by subsequent moves of his dialectical argument, Sartre uncovered Stalin's voluntarism, the terror, suspicion and other qualities of the regime. The Russian Revolution demanded a sovereign who would be a dogmatic opportunist, CDR 2.215, without slipping into historical determinism as analytic reason might counsel, but relying on dialectical necessity, which Sartre finds compatible with freedom, Stalin emerges as, the man of the hour, not, because that is who he was but because that is who he made himself to be in circular incarnation. Point 21. The Intelligibility of History. The editor of this volume, Arlet L. K. M. Sartre, observed that, since history, with a Hegelian H, is born and develops in the permanent framework of a field of tension engendered by scarcity, reflecting on its intelligibility involves first answering the preliminary question, are struggles intelligible? CDR 2X. The opening example of the boxing match viewed from either an evolving macro perspective or compressed into an increasingly micro focus was meant to illustrate the dialectical intelligibility of interpersonal relations in their socio historical context. We have discussed this combination of historical materialism, Marxism, and existential psychoanalysis in Sartre's method since the mid 1940s. By the time he wrote the biography of Jean Genet, 1952, we saw that Sartre was willing to admit, I have tried to do the following, to indicate the limit of psychoanalytic interpretation and Marxist explanation and to demonstrate that freedom alone can account for a person in his totality, SG 584. Of course, we have stressed Sartre's growing sense of social conditioning on our choices, their bases and structures. 
As his attention turned to the positive role of the givens of our situated being in limiting and fostering our choices, non-Marxist considerations entered the picture. Thus, he could acknowledge in an interview in 1975 that without a fundamental ontology, he could not have raised the social problem in the way he did in the critique. That is really where I differ from a Marxist. What in my eyes represents my superiority over the Marxists is that I raise the class question, the social question, starting from being, which is wider than class, since it is also a question that concerns animals and inanimate objects. It is from this starting point that one can pose the problems of class. I am convinced of that point 22. His turn to the structures of dialectical thought, the regressive movement, sets the ahistorical, synchronic, conditions for the dialectic that is historical, diachronic, and respectful of the primacy of free organic praxis. It is such praxis that guards existential moral responsibility amidst impersonal forces and relations, again, the meanness is not entirely in the system, CCP 183. But if ontological issues are more fundamental than the socio-economic, in the sense that a social ontology is more basic than an appeal to economism in understanding history, then Sartre's approach to historical understanding is not rationalist not even a dialectical rationalism which would leave no room for chance or contingencies in general. In this matter, Sartre has softened his critique of certain Marxist theorists who seemed reduced to explaining the concrete via appeal to chance events, CSM 56. We have seen that even the unblinking eye of pre-reflective consciousness can be clouded by historical conditions. Point 23 While the second volume ends rather than concludes with an impressive set of additional reflections that enriched the previous discussion even as they lead us into the progressive argument of the Flaubert, let our present consideration of the critique suffice to open the book on Sartre's social ontology and the productive overlap of dialectical ontology and the regressive. Progressive Method Chapter 14 A Second Ethics as we continue our investigation of Sartre's intellectual life, we must keep in mind that, despite the nearly lifelong hovering of ethical concerns over his political commitments and written work, Sartre never produced an ethical theory. Rather, he offered sketches for what such a theory might entail, as he did with his sketch for a theory of the emotions in the 1930s.1 but this was always done in a hypothetical, exploratory manner, and, as in the present case of the dialectical ethics, he was willing to pursue lines that did not seem to converge. One might object that a dialectician, a totalizer such as we saw at work in the two previous chapters, should be in search of convergence, that the acceptance of incompatible, if not outright contradictory claims, would be taken as a sign of defeat. But we should remember that this same author described the Hegelian insistence on unity as an implicit appeal to violence. Point two in the case of Sartre's first ethics, unity was achieved with explicit use of the phenomenological ontology formulated in being and nothingness, his ethics of authenticity. As Sartre's thought matured and his concept of freedom and responsibility thickened, his ethics and politics did so as well. We witnessed his four-year period of fellow traveling with the French Communist Party, a period of immoral realism, as he admitted to his Maoist friends. With the help of the dialectical ontology elaborated in the critique, Sartre developed a social ontology to accommodate his growing sense of socio-economic conditioning, historical agency, and collective responsibility. Point three, as we observed above in Chapter 13. This ontology supported an existentialist emphasis on free organic praxis, social wholes both positive and negative, and the practico inert, which is both freedom's birthplace and its grave. The historical and its conditions of possibility were missing in Sartre's earlier attempt, which he set aside as idealist, an ethic by a writer for writers for but these attempts at a dialectical ethics in the 1960s seemed to be either repressed or rejected in the 1970s. When he was asked in an interview less than four years before his death whether the regressive analysis developed in CDR is the foundation for every future ethic and, if so, what that ethic on the basis of the critique would look like, Sartre responded by naming several concepts to be elucidated in the so-called ethics of the we on which he was working with a friend, Benny Lovey, at the time. He even named its proposed subject and title, Power and Freedom, 5. In that book I will provide the first principles of morals. We are doing it in dialogue form, because I can no longer write, 
after a serious stroke that left him virtually blind, so that it is a dialogue just like ours, whereby each says what he has to say and the other answers. And I will try to show that morals and politics can only make sense from the moment when the concept of power and the reality of power are truly removed. A society without power starts to become an ethical society, because a new form of freedom is established, which is the freedom of reciprocal relations of persons in the form of a we.6. Despite mention of an ethic based on principles found in CDR, Sartre moves immediately into what we shall be calling his dialogical ethics with Lou V.Y., as if the hundreds of pages devoted to his dialectical ethics a decade earlier had never been written. Emphasizing the break from his earlier work, he continues. Speaking more generally, power and freedom returns to concepts which lie before BN, as for example contingency in nausea, more generally as everything that I said in nausea. And I am trying to recover it, because it seems to me that it is the starting point of my thought. And I am trying to close the circle, to link up my first thoughts with my latest, by giving up some of my ideas from BN and CRD.7. These claims may give us pause when assessing his dialogue with Benny Le Vy, as we shall do shortly, but it is certainly worth keeping in mind when we do. Yet before turning to this dialogical ethics and its apparent repudiation of some of Sartre's ideas in BN and CDR, let us examine rather closely the dialectical ethics that lies between the critique and power and freedom.8. Sartre's Second, Dialectical Ethics. Like the thoughts recorded in his notebooks for an ethics, the remarks from which we must reconstruct this second ethics are scattered over. Hundreds of pages in which Sartre recorded notice for raising the lecture and da set of lectures. This in the lecture was delivered at Gramsci Institute in Rome on May 23, 1964, as part of a symposium, with prominent Marxist humanist intellectuals such as Roger Garoy, Karel Kosick, and Adam Schaff as participants, on the theme of ethics and society. 9. The set of lectures addressed the topic of morality and history and was scheduled for April 7 to 14, 1965 at Cornell University but was cancelled, despite elaborate preparations by the host institution, because of the American escalation of the war in Vietnam. Sartre was working on the Rome lecture when the invitation arrived from Cornell to give a set of five lectures on Flaubert and ethics, La Morale, Point 11 So though the typescript for the Rome lecture is not simply duplicated in the notes for the Cornell lectures, the two are sufficiently intertwined, with terms from the critique appearing in both, to warrant our referring to both, together with the disorganized collection of papers that seem to overlap with them, as Sartre's dialectical ethics. Sartre's friend, the ethicist Francis Jeanson, noticed the large manuscript from which Sartre delivered his lecture and asked him how he could give a single talk from such a sheaf of papers. It was simple, Sartre replied, I turned the pages ten at a time. Jeanson said he would thereafter refer to that mass as, Notes on the Relations Between Morality, La Morale, and History. 12 This captures in brief the spirit of both the single lecture and the set. It resonates with Sartre's claim in the critique that a concrete ethics must be historical, that is dialectical, whereas his view in BN was that the concrete had to be existentially psychoanalytic, that is biographical. The function of existential psychoanalysis to uncover the life-defining choice of an individual explains why this procedure came at the end of BN. As we noted earlier in our study, the movement of the argument in BN is from the general to the particular, from the abstract to the concrete. This movement facilitates Sartre's turn toward his promised ethics of authenticity 13 and lays the structure of existential psychoanalyses, biographies, that exhibit his abstract principles in individual lives. The Rome Lecture, Morality and Society The focus of the notes for the Rome Lecture is on the construction of a socialist ethic.14 This fits quite well with the many technical terms from the critique that punctuate these texts. It also builds on the notion of group praxis as historically efficacious in contrast with that of the solitary individual analyzed in any, who, Sartre now concedes, is socially impotent. Point 15 Finally, it resonates with what Sartre told Beauvoir toward the end of his life were his lifelong guiding values, socialism and freedom. Point 16 So how does such a socialist ethics unfold? Addressed as it was to the intellectuals of the Italian Communist Party and their foreign Marxist guests. According to the typescript of these notes, 17 such an ethics must meet at least four conditions. 
It must address the ethical paradox facing any ethics that claims to be both moral and concrete. This is the old question of relating, is, to, ought, fact to moral value, that Hume revived in modern thought. But in this case, the problem expands to relating and even conjoining an abstract ethical theory with history, and specifically history in our day. Point 18. Secondly, it must account for what is specific about the experience of morality, if it is neither positivist nor idealist in nature, the one stressing facts and the other promoting values. What in Sartre's view distinguishes a socialist ethic from non-ethical agents and phenomena? Thirdly, as Foucault once warned, dialectic leads to humanism, which entails a bourgeois morality of self-realization. He considered it a 19th century affliction and Sartre one of its carriers. Point 19 Granted, Sartre's dialectic does lead to a humanism that, in turn, entails an ethic, on morale. But must such a humanism and the ethic it inspires necessarily be bourgeois? Are not a socialist humanism and a socialist ethic conceptual or even historical possibilities? The honored guests at this lecture would have responded unqualifiedly in the affirmative. Finally, how does one deal with the seemingly intractable problem of means and ends 20 that has plagued Sartre for decades? Stated in terms of the critique, how does one resolve the problem of fraternity and terror? Ethical Paradox The root of what Sartre calls the ethical paradox lies in the ambiguity of its basic term, the norm. As we shall see in the next subsection, norms support both authentic and inauthentic moral approaches. In fact, this term recurs often both in the Rome and in the Cornell lectures. Though the paradoxical nature of moral reasoning has accompanied Sartre from the start, it is in these lectures that it comes to the fore, so prominently that one could call the dialectical ethics an ethics of paradox. As his colleague Merleau-Ponty was considered the philosopher of ambiguity 21 so Sartre could be known as the moralist of paradox. Sartre has consistently opposed the naturalist fallacy, that you can derive, ought, from, is, or, as we might now say, morality from history, ever since his discussion of values in being and nothingness. At the conclusion of B.N. he writes, ontology itself cannot formulate ethical precepts. It is concerned solely with what is, and we cannot possibly derive imperatives from ontology's indicatives. It does, however, allow us to catch a glimpse of what sort of ethics will assume its responsibilities when confronted with a human reality in situation, BN 626, emphasis added. As he implies in Materialism and Revolution, the concept of situation may serve to bridge this gap between fact and value, is and ought. The revolutionary solution, radical ethics, seems called upon to play this difficult role in the Cornell lectures and hope now, if only, as the latter records, one can dissociate the concepts of revolution and terror, fraternity and violence. After explaining that, existential psychoanalysis is moral description, for it releases to us the ethical meaning of various human projects, Sartre continues. The moral, for the later Sartre, is linked with praxis, that is with the free organic individual. In contrast to the alienating third party, that objectifies others via forms of the practico inert, the critique introduces the pivotal role of the mediating third party, a functional term, as we know, that describes free organic practice as constituting the fused group. Point 22 This is the moment of concrete freedom, the origin of humanity, CDRI, 436. We could say it is the ethical moment as well, in the sense that dialectically it generates and is generated by a mediated reciprocity that has nothing to do with alterity, alienation, CDRI, 374. As will become clear in the resultant dialectical ethics, this positive reciprocity mediated by praxis, both individual and group, offers a glimpse, however brief, of a future free from the alienating mediation of the practico inert. Sartre will now elaborate that true ethical moment, by contrasting it with inauthentic moral systems and their nature and structure. Throughout our study we have spoken of the threefold primacy of praxis in Sartre's thought, the ontological, the epistemological, and the ethical. Though the epistemic primacy does not figure centrally in this dialectical ethics, it does play a crucial role in the critique, where the intelligibility of history depends on the mutual transparency of individual and group praxis. That is actually a basic methodological assumption that Sartre defends not transcendentally but in practice. The ontological primacy, 
recall, emerges when we talk about praxis as grounding social relations, sustaining processes, systems, such as capitalism and colonialism, and even leaving behind sediments as practical inert. And the ethical primacy of praxis reveals itself in the dialectic where it sustains and is dialectically sustained by the practicoiner, the locus of alienating moralities, ethical heir to the spirit of seriousness in BN and surreality in the critique. The experience of morality. Sartre is intent on proposing a concrete morality, ethics. Consequently he rejects moral imperatives outright. He now seems to believe that all such commands in their one-size-fits-all formulation are functions of the practico inert, which undermines the free, creative praxis of moral agents either by harnessing them to the past or by limiting the scope, possibilities, of their future. Sartre draws a major distinction between norm, value, and imperative in order to distinguish a true or authentic ethics from what he takes to be inauthentic varieties. Norms are the common ontological structure of objects of different sorts, like institutions, particularly laws which prescribe conduct and define sanctions, and customs, which are diffuse and non-codified while revealing themselves objectively as imperatives with diffuse and non-institutionalized sanctions. Values, which are also normative, refer to human conduct or its consequences, and constitute the object of axiological judgments, roughly, judgment expressing an assessment of favor or disfavor. They too impose the weight of the past on the spontaneity and creativity of our present decisions, or foreclose the extent of our future possibilities. It is the ambiguity of norms, for Sartre, that accounts for the ambiguous or paradoxical character of ethical judgments. They can generate authentic and inauthentic moralities accordingly as they aim for moral autonomy and the maximization of possibilities, opening up for the agent a pure future, a term Sartre adopts from Beauvoir, point 23 or, on the contrary, they can limit the agent with imperatives or pre-given values. As Sartre summarizes, we shall call ethics the totality of imperatives, values, and axiological judgments constituting the commonplaces of a class, a social milieu, or an entire society. 24 This contextualization of the totality is significant. It smells of relativism, possibly historicism, but, as we shall see, Sartre links it with what he calls historialization. Inspired by Heidegger, Sartre introduces the term in his War Diaries, 301. Point 25, but in his hands it denotes the commitment of an agent to their present situation, the admission of their facticity, in order to move beyond it in creative freedom or to remain the same in repetition, as in inauthentic moralities. His examples of the inauthentic morale include Kantian deontology, an ethic of duty and principles that must be universalizable, in the sense of allowing for no exceptions, including for oneself. Sartre's anarchist tendencies emerge when he repeats an expression he has used over the years to the effect that duty, like authority, is the other in us, duty inhabits my soul like phlogiston inhabits fire. It is the purely abstract presence of the other. 26 It is alienating in the sense of objectifying, and so, in terms of the critique, is a function of the practical inert. Of course, the same objection could be raised against Sartre himself when he later describes obligation as the prime concept in an ethics. Point 27 At the other extreme, another class of the inauthentic is what Sartre calls positivist ethics. He likens it to structuralism in that both approaches ignore the historical dimension of properly ethical normativity, rather, in his view, they collapse normativity into moral imperatives, that is, into the practical inert. Sartre had been combating structuralism since it emerged in the 1950s and began to supplant existentialism in the French philosophical scene. He remarked to Michel Sicard that the Cornell lectures, which they were discussing, had been intended to address Le Vieux and Le Six Strauss, especially the former, because Sartre wanted to treat the concept of moral constraint among these sociologists and anthropologists, whose views on the concept he considered lamentable but that he set the project aside and never returned to it. Point 28 Sartre's position is still Marxian, insofar as it considers need, labor and class struggle to be motors of history. 29 He states that the root of morality lies in need, that is to say in the animality of man. It is need which posits man as his own end, and praxis as domination of the universe of man to be effected through work. 30 Indeed, 
he focuses on man's animality as years before he attended to the coefficient of adversity that the laborer experienced in overcoming the resistance of physical nature via his labor. On Sartre's reading, even in BN, this led the worker to visualize his freedom in the sense of liberation from oppressive work as a matter of counterviolence. That figures centrally in his analyses of the capitalist and colonialist systems, 31 which he takes to be practical inert phenomena based on violence and racism. But Sartre's position here differs from orthodox Marxism in at least two ways. It denies that the base-slash-superstructure model is applicable to morality. Admittedly, what he calls inauthentic ethical systems, such as those of imperatives and values, count as ideologies in accordance with that model. But we saw that he would later insist to his Maoist friends that morality, while moralite, is not limited to the ideological superstructure, but exists at the very level of production, RR45. He is obviously talking of a true morality, one that opens a pure future for creative praxis. The second way in which this dialectical ethic differs from orthodox Marxism is only implicit in these lectures, but was stated in a previous lecture on Marxism and subjectivity that Sartre delivered at the Gramsci Institute on December 12, 1961.32 Broadly speaking, Sartre had elsewhere insisted that a concept of subjectivity could be found in the works of Marx. And this lecture was his attempt to make good on that claim. Without pursuing his interesting argument in detail, suffice it to note that he relies on a concept of subjectivity, not a substantial subject, that builds on his earlier notions of the pre-reflective consciousness and purifying reflection as not objectifying. It joins a number of other attempts to materialize our pre-reflective awareness by introducing a dialectical relation between that awareness and the situation which it conditions and which dialectically conditions it. This, in turn, builds on Sartre's notion of situation as an ambiguous mix of facticity and transcendence, the given and the taken. One should note that in BN he had removed the substance, and soy, from subjectivity, leaving us with the imminence of self to itself, BN 57. This is yet another description of pre-reflective consciousness as presence to self, but it adds the distinctive note of a limit to reflective withdrawal, for Sartre describes imminence as the smallest recoil, recall, which can be made from self to itself, BNLXV, F32. In other words, subjectivity, is another word for the impossibility for a man's being an object for himself, I am the one who cannot be an object for myself, BN241. Years later, in his brilliant study of Jean Genet, Sartre will explain that what he is calling, presence to self, is, this vague sense of a want of exact correspondence between the subjective and the objective, SG 592, in other words, it is the difference to which he is about to appeal in the following paragraphs of his lecture. Sartre discusses various examples to show that, I recognize subjectivity best in the results of work and of praxis in response to a situation. If subjectivity can be discovered by me, it's because of a difference that obtains between what the situation demands of me commonly and the response that I give to it, MS 23. Unlike in the previous reflections, his vocabulary has shifted from consciousness to praxis as epitomized in physical work. He wishes to draw a social lesson from this arrangement, namely, that our social situation, our class, modifies our subjectivity, our way of being in the world, if you will, at a pre-reflective level. We are witnessing once more an important modification of the unblinking eye of Sartrean consciousness as described in BN. Indeed, Sartre admits, there are several dimensions of subjectivity for a man, MS 33. Two such dimensions of subjectivity that are constantly retotalized, without our knowing it, the past and class being. To this he adds a third, repetition, and a fourth, invention, which, as we shall see in the next Rome lecture, distinguish inauthentic and authentic moralities respectively. And to these last two he adds another essential character of subjectivity, namely, projection, MS 33-34. One begins to see what Jean-Bertrand Pontalis meant when he called Sartre's 30-year-long relationship with psychoanalysis, an ambiguous mixture of equally deep attraction and repulsion, 33 His thesis is that our class consciousness modifies slash enriches our consciousness in a manner that is more basic than our reflective knowledge. In other words, it is non-knowledge tied to praxis. 
Sartre is taking issue with George Lucas C.S., who defended a notion of proletarian consciousness that was independent and determining of the individual worker's consciousness. This is the kind of collective consciousness that Sartre had rejected since B.N., true to the primacy of free organic praxis, he now enlists class consciousness into the praxis, comprehension, he says in CDR, of individual workers. The concrete, social reality is not this machine, the inert exigencies of the physical object, but the person working at the machine, paid, married, having children, etc. In other words, one has to be this social being, worker or bourgeois, and one has to be it in a manner that is first of all subjective. That means that class consciousness is not the primitive given, far from it, and that at the same time, one has to be, a class member, in the very conditions of the work. MS 36-37 A Socialist Humanism and Its Morality Returning to Foucault's critique of dialectic because of its apparently necessary link to bourgeois humanism and its ethics, it seems that the battle lines were drawn as early as anti-Semite and Jew, when Sartre distinguished synthetic, later, dialectical, from analytical, reason. That abstract difference carries numerous concrete consequences for Sartre. It emerges, at a still admittedly abstract level, in his remark in the critique that, at a certain level of abstraction class conflict expresses itself as a conflict of rationalities, CDRI 802, but it appears concretely in the inability to recognize the existence of social wholes such as, class, with its concrete expression in practices and impersonal processes like capitalism, colonialism and racism. Again, Francis Jeanson captures the contrast between Sartre's ethics of authenticity and his dialectical ethics when he observes, for a practice of the self-oriented toward a personal conversion to authenticity, in N.E., is substituted a collective practice aiming at the humanization of men, in C.D.R., 34 this humanization of man, or what Sartre elsewhere in the same text calls, making the human, feral home, in Robert Stone's felicitous rendition, is the project of an authentic ethics as long as one does not seek man as a platonic ideal, essence or form waiting on the horizon. It is tempting to do so, especially when Sartre showcases, integral man, will home integral, as the counter-concept to our present condition of subhumans and the end of incomplete man. Rather, Sartre explains that man is the end, not knowable but graspable as orientation, of a being who defines himself by praxis, that is, the incomplete, alienated man who we are. 35 This resembles the practical non-knowledge that was subjectivity in the 1961 lecture. Our present situation is this, we know more or less obscurely what whole man is not. What he certainly is not is ourselves, MH 271. Remember that Sartre is a dialectical nominalist in the sense that, there are only men and real relations between men, SM 76. So the integral man is going to emerge by our directing our praxis toward the minimization of practical inert ethical principles and values as we work toward creative autonomy, the free future mentioned above. Given the impossibility of conceiving this end as Sartre observed in search for a method so long as we have not freed ourselves from the institutions and systems that generate alienating ethics, it seems that our only option lies with creative, and I would add imaginative, praxis. This is Sartre's much employed, as if, that enables us to orient ourselves Kant-wise toward the goal of, humanity, that we glimpsed in the group, be it the athletic team or Sartre's revolutionary cell, but which eludes our collective grasp in our current condition. Point 36 With this dialectical, socialist humanism comes a concomitant struggle against racism and the colonialism that assumes and promotes it. We shall not pursue Sartre's, and Jeanson's, active involvement in the Algerian Revolution, except to say that the ethical discourse which is being employed in these texts is directly relevant to the struggle for social justice that brought Sartre further into the public eye. It led him to visit Castro's Cuba in 1960 and 1961, to support the Algerian Revolution, and prompted him to take a leadership role in the war crimes trials they shared with Bertrand Drussel, the basis of colonialist exploitation, in Sartre's view, is the belief on the part of the colonists that the natives are necessarily taken for, submen, to justify their exploitation whereas the cry of the freedom fighter is that, we too are men, ends and means fraternity and terror. We discussed the issue of ends and means in chapters 10 and 11 above, 
where it was a matter of relating ethics to politics. Sartre frequently stated the end means problem in terms of ethics and politics, since his notion of the ethical before St. Genet and even there, was anti-Machiavellian, as we saw. In fact, it was his amoral realism that led him to adopt a more utilitarian stance in all but name, with his view that bourgeois or idealist ethics, such as those analyzed in the notebooks for an ethics, were at best naive in the present state of our inauthentic society and at worst the breeding ground of oppressive and exploitative practices masquerading as bourgeois justice. The realist issue was whether one could pursue justified violence, that is counterviolence, to dismantle socio-economic structures that were themselves violent or promoters of violence. Sartre's preface to Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth, 38 addressed to the European beneficiaries of colonialist exploitation, marks the extreme form of Sartre's ambivalent attitude toward physical violence. Point 39 and yet, there is a constructive strain even in Sartre's most violent remarks. In Wretched, for example, he allows that this irrepressible violence, the counterviolence of the colonized, is man recreating himself. 21. Point 40 This positive attitude would continue in the Rome and Cornell lectures, as well as in what we know of power and freedom. This humanist strain brings us to the counter-concept of violence, terror, namely fraternity. Among the specific modalities of the group listed in the critique, Sartre mentions violence and fraternity, CDRI, 510. Both are features of the organic praxis of a group member. In the group, the individual's existence is not, or is no longer, the temporalization of organic need in a project, rather, it arises in a field of violent but non-antagonistic tensions, that is to say, through ob of synthetic relations by which it is profoundly and fundamentally constituted as a mediating relation, that is to say, as terror and fraternity for all and for himself, CDRI, 510. So it seems that, fraternity and terror, are not mutually exclusive. Indeed, they may serve complementary roles, at least in an inauthentic society, since fraternity emerges when seriality, alienation, is overcome or at least kept in check, the concept of moral creativity recommended in E.H. and promoted in the Rome and Cornell lectures seems both to aim at and to presume, dialectically, a certain equality of possibility slash freedom at the start even as it intends to expand the field of our possibilities and thereby achieve a richer degree of freedom. This is the unconditional possibility that Sartre's socialist ethics, morale, proposes. Under the aspect of fraternity, this possibility forms the ethical dimension of that equality and reciprocity that characterizes the reign of freedom, and that reign marks the advent of integral man in a society of material abundance which, for Sartre, is our guiding ideal. So what of Machiavelli, or the saying that one can't make an omelette without breaking eggs? It seems that two distinctions may soften the problem of coordinating fraternity and terror, though they do not resolve it. One would be to speak of a violence that is non-antagonistic. That could include the fear of legal sanctions that maintains order in our society. It may be a necessary condition for the fraternity of non-alienating social action and authentic ethics think of traffic police in the classless society. Another distinction would be that between necessary and meaningless violence, taking terror and violence as roughly synonymous. We might think of the counterviolence that is required to overcome structural violence such as colonialism, but which is not in excess of commonly recognized limits. Still a third possible distinction can be made between means that are inconsistent with the end itself, in this case expanded freedom as maximization of possibilities, and those that respect that goal in their very pursuit. Sartre recognizes this limiting principle on violence when he writes that all means are good except those that denature the end. 41 While these attempts at fine-tuning the problem may seem to be bordering on casuistry, which Sartre explicitly rejects in the Cornell Lectures, CSC, 27, making the human 337. It seems plausible that Sartre is employing a solution characteristic of the pragmatism of John Dewey, what he famously calls, the means, ends continuum, when Sartre asserts that, revolution contains its own criterion in itself. The Cornell Lectures, Morality and History. Because much of the Cornell material builds on the Rome Lecture Notes, without precisely repeating them, 
I shall discuss briefly the remarks that elaborate or add Tohat was presented the year before. Point 43 The manuscript is divided into five sections, of which the fifth was scarcely begun. The Rome lecture notes were divided into four sections. Sartre's introduction to the text lays out his intention to pursue his topic according to the progressive-regressive method introduced in Search for a Method and also used in Sketch for a Theory of the Emotions. Point 40 For the first two sections of this text offer a phenomenological description of moral experience and its actual efficacy in our daily lives. The third section offers a regressive movement to the basic structures of our ethical conduct and their internal laws, while the fourth section elucidates the factors that progressively mediate our moral experience in a concretizing synthesis. The final section seems intended to deal with the paradox of structural causality, e.g. Le Six Strauss or Althusser, as examples of the then current confrontation of structure and history. Point 45, but this section is quite brief and is followed by an appendix on need, desire, moral negatives, man as the son of man, and the imperative. 1. The Specificity of the Ethical Experience As with B.N. and the pre-theoretical ontological experience of being, inspired by Heidegger's being in time, the Cornell lecture begins with a pre-ontological and immediate experience of the ethical as such, CSC 35. This implies that Sartre's phenomenology in the first two sections will be hermeneutical, though he does not use the term here. His reading of common usage reveals a kind of ambiguity, perpetual dialectic, between fact and right, droit. He sees the categorical imperative as irreducible to any set of facts. Such is the popular understanding of moral obligation that Sartre is describing. Still, he is aware of a certain flexibility between homage to a strict imperative and the day-to-day -day observance. He cites here and in the Rome lecture a study of schoolgirls who believe that lying is wrong and yet admit to sometimes having told lies. One might speak of a certain gray, louche, area between accepted rules and their practical observance, scarcely news to us. 2. The essence of ethical normativity. Still on the descriptive and interpretive level of his argument, Sartre begins to cite distinctions already introduced in the Rome lecture notes. The pyramid of customs, moors, and institutions constitutes the real object of the ethical, CSC 41. Unconditionality is set forth as the distinctive feature of the ethical, for Sartre, as it is for many ethicists, it trumps other, conditional claims as being unethical or amoral. Point 46 Among ethical terms, Sartre lists values, goods, examples and ideals. As instances of each he offers respectively, sincerity, value, life, good, ethical creations that have slipped into habit, example, and the crystallization of moral habit in the charisma of a person, ideal. The ethical paradox now reappears in the following guises, the good-slash-value, fact-slash-right, the given-slash-the inaccessible, coincidence with self-slash-nihilating pulling away, from self. These are among the many aspects of the ethical paradox for Sartre, CSC 42. It is in terms of this ethical paradox that one must understand what Sartre means by, example, CSC 43. He allows that one can live a moral life in the midst of these paradoxes, for example by casuistry, what he calls, the effort to condition the unconditional, CSC 43, that affords a person what he terms, moral comfort, MH 337. But in the Rome lecture these are what he called, inauthentic, forms of morality. 3. On unconditional possibility as the structure of the norm. The existence for the schoolgirls of an unconditional imperative against lying guarantees their security, human life has a meaning, MH 351. We saw in the Rome lecture that one source, perhaps the basic source, of ethical ambiguity was the ambiguity of the norm itself, it can guide both autonomous and heteronymous moral actions, the authentic and the inauthentic. Sartre now speaks of a blossoming of unconditionality so that it would render the historical act and the ethical act homogeneous, MH 353. But such an opening out of unconditionality does not seem possible in the current state of affairs, unless we discover slash create a dialectic of the unconditional and the conditional by a praxis, whether successful or not, that would affirm itself as ethical while rediscovering its historical condition. MH 354-355. As an example of such confluence of the ethical and the historical, 
Sartre cites the resistance movement during the Nazi occupation of France. Read in this regressive stage of the argument, it appears that the ethical is a constitutive moment of the historical action, that of creation slash discovery, invention, and that this moment presents itself as a pure ethics by opposing history, that is to say, realizing certain ends regardless of their historical consequences, MH 361. The unconditionality shows itself in my willingness to pursue this end or die trying. The non-negotiables of life and death underscore the absoluteness of the action at hand. The battle may be lost but I still have my honor. The point of this regressive analysis was, to put in relief the necessity of establishing the basis of a dialectic of ethics and history as soon as the ethical appears and in practice claims to be the essence of praxis, MH386. To recapitulate briefly his argument thus far, the dialectical interchange just described would yield a historical action that was moral and a moral action that was historical. This seems to be his vision of the revolution, as the threshold whereby the practical inert deviation is checked, if not completely destroyed, by socio-economic changes, history, that render possible the free future, that guides all action insofar as it aims to an absolute end. This would constitute the end of prehistory, in the Marxist sense, the dawning of one truth of history, with a Hegelian H, as in the critique, the emergence of integral man out of subhumanity, and the advent of the ethical in its full sense. Such a line of analysis leaves us with the question whether it is a utopian dream, the expression of unrelenting optimism or a pessimistic adieu. Or perhaps, as Sartre suggested at the close of St. Genet, the reconciliation of the physical violence, moral evil, callous exploitation, an oppression that scarcity, and human agents, have inflicted on human history as we know it, whether, in sum, the contradiction between ethics and history can be resolved, be it only once and in the realm of the imaginary, SG 599. This remains a lingering option not to be ignored. Point 47 The imaginary is emerging as both a beacon of hope and a council of despair. 4. The Paradox of the Ethos. Sartre's second ethics might well have been called the ethics of paradox, except that the paradoxical nature of ethics had been a staple in his philosophical diet for years. As early as what is literature. 1948, he reflects. The contemplation of beauty might well arouse in us the purely formal intention of treating men as ends, but this intention would reveal itself to be utterly futile in practice, since the fundamental structures of our society are still oppressive. Such is the present paradox of ethics, for good will is not possible in this age, or rather, it can only be the intention of making good will possible. WL 221-223, emphasis added. As we have seen, the ethical paradox is a complex, multifaceted phenomenon. In this progressive section of his argument, Sartre is considering the mediating factors that will bring this paradox to a head. This is a concrete issue, even if it does not so much resolve the paradox as enable us to live with its ambiguity, ideally in a creative manner. Juliet Simon states the matter concisely, historicity of ends, inert permanence of ethical action, this is what Sartre, under various descriptions, has called the ethical paradox, CSC 51. As we saw in the Rome lecture, it is a matter of transcending, the passer, the historical givens of a society or tradition that are repetitious or inert, closing off the possibility of pursuing an open future. This echoes the abiding mantra of Sartrean existentialism, you can always make something out of what you've been made into, even as it recalls Sartre's ontological dualism of spontaneity and inertia. Still Simon raises an important objection, can this unconditionality apply equally to what Sartre considers inauthentic ethics, such as Kantian deontology or Marxist amoral realism? She sees this as, the point of non-return for Sartre's reflections on ethics and the reason why he abandoned the project, namely, that the unconditional of the free ethics hits the wall of inertia and, worse, shows itself to be that very wall of inertia itself. The paradox of ethics, she warns, could well come from the fact that a human product, unchose over e, presents itself to freedom as its law, and from the fact that the very unconditional is after all the thing, le chose, in its inert imperatives, CSC 51. 5. Paradox and Marxist Structuralism. 
reference to the thing reminds one of the machine of Stalinist communism, so berated in Eastern Europe in the 1950s and 1960s. Of course, its connotation expanded worldwide to include capitalism and the military-industrial complex in the 1960s, but Simon's reference, and Sartre's, is probably to so-called structuralist Marxism, Louis Althusser, or Marxist structuralism, Claude Le Six Strauss. Sartre's claim is that structuralism and history are polar opposites, their approach to ethics is to offer abstractions, like the codes of texts or the kinship trees for permissible marriage in a particular tribe. Whether Sartre's understanding of structuralism is accurate, and he did respect structural causality, which is one role of the practicoiner, he continues robustly to defend free organic praxis from its perceived attacks. Sartre's Third, Dialogical Ethics We have previewed some features of Sartre's third ethics in his interview with Leo Fretz. His remarks in the Schilp interview confirm the change of perspective that is evident in the conversations between Sartre and Benny Le Vy, his young friend and secretary, that we are about to examine in detail. Both Raymond Aron and Simone de Beauvoir, in a rare confluence of opinion, expressed shock at the three essays that were serialized in the major weekly Le Nouvel Observateur, presenting the initial fruit of these exchanges. They saw the interview as an aggressive young man in the process of moving from his early revolutionary Maoism to the strictures of his rediscovered Orthodox Jewish faith, taking advantage of a blind and failing old man. Lu Vy, of course, has a different opinion on the matter, which he expressed in a final word to the revised published volume of these essays.49 But however one interprets the texts in dispute, it is clearly a hermeneutical challenge that has yet to be resolved. The majority of the tapes of their conversations were in Lovie's possession when he died of cancer in Israel years later, and remain unavailable, which only adds to the complexity of the matter. What I hope to accomplish in the concluding portion of this chapter is to summarize the basic claims that Sartre introduces in support of the dialogical ethics, to determine what is novel about them in comparison with his previous writings when he was unhampered by blindness and possibly weakened mental powers, and to offer a plausible assessment of the nature and significance of these differences. Respecting his view of his own apparent contradictions, Sartre remarked, I've changed like everyone, within a permanence, 50 what remained constant within these fluctuations was the conviction that history has no reality except by human praxis, it makes men only to the extent that they make it by surpassing the passament, what it has made of them, 51 again, this is an expression of what I've been calling the primacy of praxis in Sartre's later philosophy, it pervades his earlier thought under another name, individual freedom and responsibility. The basic claims. Unlike his earlier remarks on the topic, this dialogical ethics is the product of a conversation between two allegedly independent thinkers. It is more open-ended than conclusive, despite several agreed-upon principles and conclusion. It remains socialist, in orientation, building on the social ontology of the critique as does the dialectical ethics, but is less concerned about phenomenological insights with its distinctions between the certain and the merely probable nature of its claims. Of course, if the two previous attempts were incomplete, this one was barely begun. The unifying concept of dialectic is scarcely mentioned. In that respect, power and freedom resembles the lecture, existentialism is a humanism, in being a series of insights, apercus, rather than an extended argument. Despite that feature or perhaps because of it, the work is quite suggestive, serving to enrich as well as challenge the claims made in the previous undertaking. A further claim is this, I don't believe that the relationship of production is the primary one. Rather, the family relationship is the primary social relationship, Hope 86. Relegating socio-economic considerations to second place by comparison with the relative autonomy of ethical considerations saves Sartre's position from being dismissed as idealist, in character, as the notebooks were. But its reference to moral consciousness or conscience, what John Locke called the internal forum, brings it back into the mainstream of moral philosophy as commonly understood, and that, I believe, is news. What is distinctive about this approach? As an ethic of the we, it is plural rather than singular in its number and thus generates alternatives and tensions in its expression. Lest one see the plural as an invitation to a totalizing dialectic, the we underscores its dialogical nature. 
the ethic seems satisfied with agreement rather than bent on knockdown demonstration. When asked what he means today by ethics, la morale, Sartre responds, there is a dimension of obligation in each consciousness, a kind of requisitioning that goes beyond the real, a kind of inner constraint that is a dimension of consciousness, conscience. And that for me, he adds, is the beginning of the moral, in my opinion, each consciousness has this moral dimension that one never analyzes but which I would like us to analyze. After explaining that this self-consciousness is also consciousness for another, he adds the insightful remark that this self considering itself as self for the other, soy mi mi por el otra, is what I call conscience, la conscience morale, 52 not coincidentally, it bears a distinctively Levinasian mark. Benny Levy was especially interested in the work of Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas during his Orthodox years. Bernard-Henri Levy concludes his assessment of this controversy with the assertion that, the last Sartre, was a Levinasian obviously, indisputably, and profoundly, 53. The differences, their nature and significance. These can be summarized briefly in three remarks from Hope Now, each of which challenges or at least qualifies his previous position. First, obligation now emerges as the specific feature of moral consciousness, as Sartre admits, this is a difficult term which he refuses to define but which seems roughly synonymous with exigence, requisition, and inner constraint, Hope 69-71. It is significant that Sartre fails to mention the terms unconditional or even norm, though they were essential to his dialectical ethic. In fact, the term dialectic is missing from the index of the book. Second, the issue of humanism recurs when Sartre simply denies that he is a humanist. In fact, he speaks of moving beyond humanism, much as he had spoken in search for a method of moving beyond Marxism at some future time. His reasons are the usual ones its association with bourgeois values, class identity, and racism. But then he restates his position, admits that we are all submen, and speaks of a presumably true or authentic humanism as something to be achieved. If one considers living beings as finished, closed totalities, humanism is not possible in our time. If, on the other hand, one considers that these submen have in them principles that are human, which is to say, that basically they have certain seeds in them that tend toward man and that are in advance of the very being that is the subman, then, we can describe as humanism the act of thinking about the relationship of man to man in terms of the principles that prevail today. Essentially, ethics is a matter of one person's relationship to another. Hope 68. When Benny Levy interjects that Marx too said that in the end man would be truly whole, integral, Sartre deftly uncovers the Machiavellian assumption latent in that claim, ah, well, yes, but that's absurd. It is precisely the human side that already exists in the subman, precisely those principles that tend toward the human being, that forbid his being used as raw material or as a means in order to achieve an end. Ethics begins exactly at that point, Hope 69, emphasis added. He elaborates. We experience humanism only as what is best in us, in other words, our striving to live beyond ourselves in a society of human beings. We can prefigure people in that way through our best acts, Hope 69. That goal called humanity, as an achievement word, will be realized when we have true fraternity understood as the actualization of our self for the other, soy mi mi por el otra, which is precisely what Sartre calls conscience, la conscience morale. 54 A truly remarkable expression in its implicit correction of the socially handicapped ontology of BN. Then occurs the quiet existential contradiction that has been the Achilles heel of all three Sartrean attempts at an ethics. It can be summarized as fraternity versus terror, and is perhaps the major flaw in his sketch for a theory, as he finally confesses. So there are two approaches, and both are human but seem not to be compatible yet we must try to live them both at the same time. There is the effort, all other. Conditions aside, to create humanity, to engender humanity, this is the ethical relationship. And there is the struggle against scarcity. Hope 91. To tell you the truth, he admits, I still don't clearly see the real relationship between violence and fraternity. Hope 93. Two obstacles he finds especially pressing. 
An adequate definition of fraternity without terror has yet to be achieved before we can tackle the fraternity terror issue itself. Point 55 And in the meantime, as Le Vy puts it, if the idea of revolution becomes identified with the idea of terrorism, it's done for, Hope 96. Sartre's third attempt at an ethic seems stalled or balanced precariously between these two existential promises and threats. If the ethic of authenticity in the notebooks exploited the non-objectifying model of the aesthetic gift, the dialectical ethics faced the unpleasant challenge of constructing a method to achieve such a society where positive reciprocity could be realized. The third attempt harkens back, if only out of hope in the face of despair, to the imaginary, as our sole possible resource foreshadowed so starkly in St. Janet. Point 56 Let us conclude our discussion of Sartre's three attempts at sketching an ethical theory with his words in memory of his former friend and colleague, Albert Camus. In view of the foregoing reflections in this chapter and earlier, they could easily have served as his own epitaph. He represented in this century and against history the current heir to that long line of moralists whose work constitutes perhaps what is most original in French letters. His stubborn humanism, narrow and pure, austere and sensual, battled against the massive and deformed events of the day. But inversely, by the persistence of his refusal, against Machiavellians, against the golden calf of realism, he reaffirmed the existence of moral fact at the heart of our age. Sit 4 127. Chapter 15 Existential Biography, Flaubert and Others. Toward the end of his biography of Jean Genet, Sartre pauses to issue the following warning to anyone considering a similar task. In a good critical work, we will find a good deal of information about the author who is being criticized and some information about the critic. The latter, moreover, is so obscure and blurred that it has to be interpreted in the light of all that we know about him. Point one. Sartre's caveat to the contrary notwithstanding, his critical biographies yield a considerable amount of information about the critic himself. Still, his caution that a necessary condition for avoiding the obscurity and blur of this information is that it be interpreted in the light of all that we know about him invokes an ideal that is clearly impossible to attain. Of course, the caution is Hegelian in tone, anything less than the whole truth is false point too without venturing along that dark path, let us be satisfied with the insights, less than complete but cumulatively informative, that the previous chapters afford us as we begin to read Sartre's interpretation of three giants of 19th century French literature. Our goal is to totalize these studies and the earlier chapters in our reading of his massive Flaubert biography as a summation of his metaphysical, aesthetic, political and ethical pursuits described and analyzed in the previous chapters. The end of the story. Scarcely, as the lively dispute over Sartre's dialogical ethics reminds us. But we are seeking a perspective from which to interpret a life, while keeping to a minimum the obscurity and blur that threatens a briefer inquiry. Remember that Sartre's totalization is a process word. Of course, employing his distinction between totality and totalization, we could regard his former life as a totality subject to our totalizing accounts. As being and nothingness warns and no exit dramatizes, the dead are prey to the living. Baudelaire, An Essay on Bad Faith. This existential biography, written in 1944, appeared in print in 1947, also the year in which Sartre's What is Literature was serialized in Les Temps Modernes and was dedicated to Jean Genet, whose biography Sartre would publish five years later. Sartre never liked his short book or its subject. Point three originally conceived as an introduction to Baudelaire's intimate writings, just as the Genet volume was intended to introduce his collected works, this essay caused a scandal and was violently attacked on all sides, for in short, Sartre was rather cavalierly dishonoring one of the icons of French poetry. Beauvoir explained. Of course, Sartre was still far from having understood the fecundity of the dialectical idea and of Marxist materialism the works he published that year are proof of that. His study of Baudet's E. Crits in Times written two years earlier, is a phenomenological description, it lacks the psychoanalytical dimension that would have explained Baudelaire on the basis of his body and the facts of his life. Alluding to Materialism and Revolution, published two months after Baudelaire, she, in effect, 
she is claiming that the combination of existential psychoanalysis formulated in BN the year before and of historical materialism built on an expanded notion of being in situation elaborated in his writing of the late 1940s and early 1950s would yield an account of the artist's concrete choice of the imaginary, the irreal. That choice was already present in the Baudelaire study, though in bad faith six problematically functioning in the Mallarmé, seven clearly articulated in St. Genet as we saw in Chapter 11, and fully realized in The Family Idiot. This, at least, is my development of her remark and the thesis of this chapter. Since the Baudelaire was written the year after BN was published, it comes as no surprise that the philosophical core of this essay is the metaphysics of that work point eight that is both its strength and its limitation. In his valedictory interview with Beauvoir, Sartre acknowledged that his interest in criticism was primarily metaphysical, basically, my critique looked for the metaphysics through the author's technique. When I found that metaphysics, then I was satisfied. I truly grasped the totality of the work, his way of seeing the world, Suar 269. Of course, his interest is not only metaphysical. Sartre's diagnosis of his version of the progressive-regressive method in search for a method assures us, everything took place in childhood, SM 59-60. There his example was Flaubert. But when the example is the marriage of Baudelaire's mother to General Opic, a perceived betrayal similar to Sartre's view of his mother's abandonment of him by marrying Joseph Mancy, the parallel, CEB 47, is striking, though less surprising in view of what had become a matter of methodological principle for Sartre whenever the evidence was available. Beauvoir claimed that Sartre's favorite fantasy as a child and adolescent was that of the Poti Maudit, misunderstood by all during his lifetime and struck by fame's lightning only beyond the grave. 9 In his introductory note to Sartre's study, Michel Laris, the editor in charge of poetry for LTM, calls Baudelaire, the quasi-legendary prototype of the Poti Mod at 10 but for our purposes. What matters is to see how Sartre's reading of the poet exhibits the newly fashioned ontology slash metaphysics of BN, specifically the ontological conditions for his basic category of disvalue which he called bad faith. We know that the most common form of such self-deception consists in denying our ontological makeup, our freedom and responsibility that is, collapsing our transcendence into our facticity, our existence into our being, in the futile attempt to be what we are in the inert way that a stone is a stone. George Bauer observes that, Sartre's, evaluation of Baudelaire's life and work is ferociously negative because he finds in Les Fleurs du Mal a basis for his interpretation of the poet's quest for permanency in the myth of bronze and marble 11 echoing Roquentin in Nausea, Sartre's Baudelaire is seeking salvation from an anguished contingency in the work of art, the irreal. In Baudelaire's case, this occurs in the extreme, making his life into a, physical, poem, an imaginary construct and a style of life. This is the incarnation of the, feudal passion, that defines human reality in BN, Baudelaire chooses to be a, freedom thing, B84. This suggests Sartre's remark in BN, one puts oneself in bad faith as one goes to sleep and one is in bad faith as one dreams, BN 68, EN 109. Here he insists that Baudelaire's bad faith is so deep that he is no longer its master, B 103, no longer but, presumably, he once was in charge, hence the bad faith. Still, this is but one of numerous claims, increasing in frequency as lived experience, le VECU, replaces. Consciousness, in Sartre's works, that betray a sense of something like the unconscious invading his theory. Point twelve. How, then, is Baudelaire to escape this lived contradiction between being and existence, the intolerable feeling of being de trop in the world, B241, an emotion Sartre designates metaphysical anguish, M145. Suicide, Sartre suggests, is always an option for Baudelaire, but it would destroy the contradiction without resolving it, in this respect Baudelaire anticipates Camus in the next century. Perhaps a poetic objectification of his being in his own eyes and in the eyes of others might save him from his contingency. In Sartre's terms Baudelaire chose to exist for himself as he was for others, in their memories, B243, emphasis his. In effect, it was the being in itself, 
what Sartre would later call the practico inert, of the past that enabled Baudelaire to live the contradiction that his bad faith entailed, namely, to be a freedom thing, I am another, je suis un autre, b24. Sartre calls this symbolic expression of the impossible synthesis of freedom and thing, the Baudelarian, poetic fact, or the, spiritual, denoting his particular way of sustaining the poem, or his dandyish manner of living, midway between being and nothingness, presence and absence, b220. In view of Sartre's earlier characterization of the aesthetic object, the imaginary, as possessing the specific quality of presence-absence, it seems likely that Sartre's poets, and the poetic way of existing generally, are beings of the imaginary, however, realist, they may purport to be. This is true of Baudelaire, who reads himself in the eyes of others and delights in the irreal of that imaginary portrait. This original choice, implies an extraordinary, constant concern with the opinion of others, b193, emphasis added. From the beginning to the end of his essay, Sartre has not lost sight of this self-defining choice that creates and sustains Baudelaire the poet in his singularity as the author of just these works. The free choice that a man makes of himself is identified absolutely with what one calls his destiny, b245. Sartre's aim is to uncover the necessity that inhabits the contingency of the lives of each of his subjects as they choose to become what he reveals they are destined to be. Mallarmé, the shadowy side of lucidity. Sartre's study of Mallarmé 13 considered one of his masterpieces, is one of the large number of torsos scattered across the landscape of his published work. Point 14 in his last interview with Beauvoir, he claims that, around 200 pages, of the Mallarmé study were lost. Perhaps in the explosion and confusion that followed the second bombing of his residence by the OAS during the Algerian Revolution. Point 15 she confirmed this, oh yes. There were very detailed explanations of all of Mallarmé's poems. 16 Sartre presumably drew on that unpublished research when he answered Michel Sicard's question about his fascination with Mallarmé's later works, such as Un coup de de s, A Throw of the Dice, which involved spectacular typographical arrangements. Yes, I was amazed by that. But though I like Un coup de de s, it is still Mallarmé's classical poetry that especially pleases me that is, the Alexandrine or octosyllabic verses joined in sonnets or otherwise. There is where Mallarmé presents his essential self. 17 In other words, Sartre's assessments are made from a careful reading of the works under consideration, though he seems as coolly disposed to spatialized poetry as he is to some forms of contemporary music, despite his quite positive view of abstract painting in the plastic arts, Michael Scriven argues that in all his biography, his biographical project, Sartre aims to promote and exhibit the belief that the value of literature is to be found not in its institutionalized status within a sacrosanct literary tradition but in its ability to disturb the consciousness of the contemporary reader, 19 to the extent that the artwork holds a critical mirror to society, one could say that Sartre is engaged in a kind of committed literature even prior to what is literature. The creation of the imaginary object, the ear al, for instance, depends on the cooperation of two consciousnesses, author and reader slash audience, to derealize the analogon in an attitude that suspends our disbelief, the canonical expression, and opens us to questioning the reality that we otherwise take for granted. No doubt the aesthetic attitude must be sensitized to moral values and disvalues to achieve Sartre's goal of commitment. Admittedly, this is redolent of the idealist perspective that he will later reject, once he has discovered the dialectic of historical materialism that is so evident in his Flaubert study. But it does not preclude the possibility that the properly aesthetic suspension, or refinement of the phenomenological epochy, may open the door to critical assessment based on other criteria. In fact, a moral dimension is clearly present in Sartre's claim that theater, literature in general and the writings of Flaubert in particular exercise the function of uncovering, devoilment, our bad faith, our mystification point one could call this a Janus faced view of aesthetic critique, namely, that the tilt of l'art poor l'art toward aestheticism can be corrected, once it is seen that, art for art's sake, carries within itself the seeds of its own critical relevance if pursued to its extreme of indifference in the face of socio-economic exploitation, oppressive practices and gratuitous violence.
It may satisfy itself with shocking the bourgeoisie, as did Les Potes Maudits, or subjecting their values and institutions to a cynical laugh, as did Flaubert, or by issuing in a kind of disgust with the impotence of art itself in the face of oppression and exploitation, as with Sartre's famous turn from imaginative literature to direct political action in the 1960s.21 In other words, the close interrelation between the good and the beautiful, first invoked in classical antiquity and later, reintroduced with Kant, is arguably haunting Sartre in what is literature, and in these biographies as well. Witness his admission to Pierre Verstraeten in 1965, that the ethical and the concrete universal coalesce in a domain larger than that of language. Point 22 In a 1975 interview, Roland Barthes credits Sartre with effecting a fundamental change in the status of literature with a capital L. There is a man, who is situated at the exact point of historical disintegration of literature. This man is Sartre. There can be little doubt that he has exercised an extremely influential kind of cultural and literary leadership, and continues to do so, yet since, as it happens, his work may be defined as a destruction of the affectation of literary prose, he has accordingly made an important contribution to the destruction of the myth of literature. Point 23. And one might add that he thereby strengthened the case for committed literature. The two-pronged nature of Sartre's biographical method, namely, the co-presence of existential psychoanalysis and historical materialism, is moving more into the foreground in this work. As the translator of the text remarks, Sartre insists that Mallarmé's singular posis grew out of a series of conscious choices exercised on the basis of prior condition. Sartre does not minimize the immense weight of these conditions or the strenuous efforts required to overcome them. 24 This problem of the given and the taken in each existential situation, which had already been introduced in anti-Semite and Jew, remains as problematic as it is essential to Sartre's growing sense of the historical dimension of any concrete existence. We shall return to it in detail in The Family Idiot. Of the many features that mark Sartre's approach to these texts 25 let us note three topics that seem especially important for our study of Sartrean biography in the light of his ontology, aesthetic interest, moral thought and political commitment. We find each of these categories enlisted in a way that expands and refines their application in our previous chapters. This will be especially evident in his Flaubert volumes to which we shall turn shortly, but it is worth considering them in regard to the Mallarmé study because they mark an advance and an opening of topics that will be considered at much greater length in Sartre's massive biography of Flaubert. Objective Spirit This Hegelian term is absent from the Baudelaire piece, probably because that text was written before Sartre began his serious rereading of the Phenomenology of Spirit, and two years before Hippolyte's two-volume commentary on that classic appeared, 1946. Sartre offers two descriptions of objective spirit. On the one hand, he offers a semantic description, objective spirit is the medium for the circulation of significations, CDRI 776. On the other, he employs a term from the critique to describe objective spirit ontologically as culture as practicoinert, FI 3 44. These features were shared by Mallarmé's entire generation, the incestuous eroticism, the taste for failure and for non-being, the desperate idealism, the Manichaeanism, the preciosity, the nihilism, these themes pervade the objective spirit of the period, and all of them express the historical and social connection as much as, if not more than, the history of a particular individual. 26 Again, it is the family which mediates that objective spirit and its concrete incarnation in the individual lives of its members. Sartre is employing what has emerged as a methodological principle, the relation between the individual and his socio-historical milieu. It builds on the root concept of situation that is introduced in BN, but becomes more marked as the key to his emerging social ontology in materialism and revolution. In the Flaubert study, let us call it the principle of totalization, namely that a man, whoever he is, totalizes his epoch to the precise degree that he is totalized by it. 27 This is the perfect vehicle for gaining an understanding of the author and his time. In Sartre's hands, it demands a dialectical relationship that is more than just the endless back and forth of Hegel's bad infinite or the circle of Genet's tourniquet. 
Sartre's claim is that personalization advances in spirals that interiorize and exteriorize the situation in which the agent finds himself, SM 106. But Sartre remains committed to the primacy of free organic praxis, lest he get stuck in the mire of historicism. So he insists in the critique that the men history makes are never entirely those needed to make history, CDR 2 221. This is an expanded version of his existentialist mantra, we can always make something out of what we've been made into. But both sayings call for serious refinement when encountering objective impossibility, such as Heinrich faced in The Devil and the Good Lord. This brings us to the next theme, pessimistic metaphysics. This is the anti-humanist ghost that stalks Sartre's personal optimism. It reappeared in his dialogical ethics, Hope Now. We find it at work in all three writers, and also in Genet, which we discussed earlier because of the widespread belief that this book was to be Sartre's long-awaited ethics. It comes down to the claim that a fully human man is impossible in our present socio-economic condition. The best the system can produce is a class of submen who are structurally exploited and personally oppressed. We have observed this line of argument in the communists and peace and in the critique. While this Marxist interpretation is Sartre's, the materialist metaphysics that Mallarmé embraced is analytical, not dialectical, and vaguely Spinozist in its determinism. On Sartre's reading, the poet's impotence symbolizes man's impossibility. What is man? A volatile illusion flittering over matter in movement, M135. In sum, they are destined to disappear together. With Mallarmé's conversion to critical poetry and the notion of creating a poem without men which must refuse to subordinate words to a preconceived meaning, it follows that, on the contrary, he must arrange them so that a specific meaning emerges from their juxtaposition, M138. It appears that the poet in his later work, at least, is anticipating Foucault's famous death of the author, and its replacement with the author function, commonly seen as a structuralist move.28. The hero in spite of himself. Our third theme is complex and pervasive because it addresses the problem of the unconscious that has plagued Sartre's thought at least since being in nothingness. Here its focus is Sartre's view of Mallarmé's conversion. We have mentioned his materialism and the determinism that it entailed. Sartre is alive to the threat of crass materialism, the kind not softened by a dialectic. We see it in his call for the poet hero or martyr which Mallarmé's generation requires but that his contemporaries cannot produce, superstructures which are little more than reflections of the existing social order, if such passive objectivity were to be transcended, someone was needed who could internalize it, impose his personal stamp on it, and live out the paradox in all its contradictions to the point of dying for it, M64. What is called for is a dialectic of interiorization slash exteriorization by an artist who will be drawn by certain empirical modifications of his environment, which may lead him to alter his original project, M97. Such, for Mallarmé, is the death of his mother and his father's remarriage. Sartre sees a more positive poet emerge from this crisis. No has become transformed into yes. Since his impotence will not allow him to write poetry, he will write poetry about his impotence, M117. What Sartre sees as a constant and silent appeal to authenticity, M116, might well exemplify a recurrent Sartrean motto, loser wins. Mallarmé decides to write tragedy. In a note, Sartre used an expression from Mallarmé that Arlet LKM Sartre added as a subtitle to the published text, The Shadowy Side of Lucidity, while Lucidite Etsa Face D'Ambre. Without explicitly appealing to an unconscious, Sartre sees this shadowy side of our consciousness as making the secrets of Mallarmé's life available to an existential hermeneutic such as he introduced in B.N. The following admission is crucial to our sense of Sartre's growing acknowledgement of a quasi-unconscious dimension to our lived experience. We saw this in his open appeal to lived experience, le VECU, and saw it again in the distinction between knowledge and understanding in his discussion of Flaubert. Now he seems ready to flesh out this concept with the following admission. There is, indeed, an unconscious lodged in the heart of consciousness. This is not some obscure power he continues to caution, for we know full well that consciousness is consciousness through and through, it is interject finiteness. 
Mallarmé was deeply tormented by things we understand today but which were beyond his ken in his own time. Our aim, he continues, is to comprehend his images, gaps in his knowledge, biases, unjustified choices, etc., in short, the negative features of the poet, rather than the positive characteristics he unwittingly possessed. What he then considered normal or self-evident or natural is no longer so for us now. M83N. Let us add this to our list of indicators of what Pontalis called Sartre's love-hate relation to psychoanalysis. That list will continue in The Family Idiot. Flaubert, The Final Triumph of the Imaginary Throughout our investigation we have underscored the decisive presence of the imaginary in Sartre's life and works. It should come as no surprise, then, that he would describe his massive biography of Flaubert's life and times as a sequel to the imaginary. The intervening writings exploit this propensity, whether it be his early likening of imaging consciousness to consciousness in general as the locus of negativity, possibility and lack, 30 his appeal to the reconciling of contradictories, if only in the imaginary, CSG 599, his critique of the French Communist Party as lacking imagination, or his pragmatic appeal to the, as if, come si, as an imaginative reinforcement of his arguments. Accordingly, his biographies focus on distinguished artists who choose the imaginary dimension to communicate their views and values. It is as if their choices are ours, even if we find ourselves mired in the prosaic world of the factual, the dimension of the imaginary as the realm of negativity, possibility, and lack remains poised to challenge and even undermine our received opinion. Such was Sartre's Flaubert, who brought the Sartrean search for the concrete to full term as the singular universal, the choice to create Madame Bovary, his alter ego, Madame Bovary is me, point 31 Christina Howells phrased it nicely, we are witnessing the transformation of the kind of imagination evoked in Madame Bovary into the kind of imagination which produced Madame Bovary, 32. The Argument of the Family Idiot, Volumes I, 433. Comprising Sartre's overwhelming response to the question, what, at this point in time, can we know about a man? These volumes offer an object lesson in Sartrean anthropology. Point 34 He announces the work as a sequel to Search for a Method, and to the extent that it makes generous use of the progressive regressive method, this is a plausible claim. By a subtle and exhaustive use of this method, he examines those childhood and family relations that he believes necessarily mediate socio economic conditions and individual projects. Indeed, the practical application of this method should prove to be one of the lasting achievements of this work. In a defensive response to his Maoist discussants, Sartre promotes this undertaking as a socialist work in the sense that, if I succeed, it should enable us to understand men from a socialist point of view. 35 The starting point for his regressive e analysis is Flaubert's protohistory, that is, his early childhood and intrafamilial relations. This phase establishes the crucial fact that Flaubert was constituted capable of merely passive activity, a phrase from the critique signifying a subject as reflector of others' actions and not a true agent in his own right. He is deprived from the start of the cardinal categories of praxis, 36 denied his mother's love and his father's preference, young Flaubert reads family romance and sibling rivalry in terms of being and non-being. If father and family name represent the realm of being, Gustav will distinguish himself from his older brother in direct proportion to the quantity of nothingness he could incorporate. 37 So begins the odyssey of Flaubert's self-derealization, in which, in Sartrean fashion, he makes himself into the nonentity that others have prepared and expected him to be, the family idiot. A new term enters Sartre's lexicon, personalization, meaning that, the individual is nothing more than the surpassing and preservation, assumption and inner negation, at the core of a project to totalize what the world has made, and continues to make, of us, 38 Sartre calls it by another name for, this totalization which is endlessly detotalized and retotalized. 39 The progressive method now traces four turns in the spiral of Flaubert's personalization, the imaginary child, the actor, the poet, and finally the novelist. These are all forms of self-derealization wherein his ego remains an alter ego, reflected off family, friends, and the public. Sartre interprets the final turn from poet to novelist as follows. 
At last Flaubert's self-hatred and resentment converge with his project of personalization, in derealizing himself as artist, he will derealize the world. Point forty. His vocation crystallizes on that traumatic night in late January 1844 near Pontelli Vek, when he has an epileptic seizure, 41 falling at his brother's feet in symbolic death to rise as artist, l'homme imaginaire. Freed from the hated family burden of continuing his law exams, Flaubert is allowed the leisure, afforded by his poor health, to pursue a career in art. Such, in brief, is Sartre's reading of the formative events in Flaubert's biography. Before we turn to four issues that bind the family idiot to Sartre's other studies to form a kind of totalizing compendium of his entire oeuvre, two questions must be answered. What is the link between Flaubert's concept of art and his personal neurosis? And how does this concept reflect the general condition of French society in the last three quarters of the 19th century? These are the existential psychoanalytic and the historical materialist, Marxist, questions respectively. In response to the first query, one must assume that the clear eye of Sartrean consciousness seems to preclude unconscious motives on Flaubert's part. We have already cast suspicion on the accuracy of this claim. As we proceed in the text this misgiving may be confirmed, leaving the existential psychoanalytic vision somewhat clouded, 42 Flaubert's neurosis, therefore, is conscious, chosen in the sense that one chooses one's meaning slash direction, sends, by the practical projects that one sets for oneself. Still, we must acknowledge the concepts of comprehension, as in Flaubert did not know himself and, at the same time understood himself admirably, 43, and lived experience, le vecu, or life aware of itself, of which Sartre said, I suppose it represents for me the equivalent of conscious unconscious. When joined to the remark that subjectivity is by definition non-knowledge at the level of consciousness, Marxism and subjectivity, and Sartre's frequent appeal to Freudian technical terms and his expressed sympathy with Lacanian emphasis on the unconscious being structured like a language, all this does leave Sartrean consciousness, even in a multilayered sense, to bear a large theoretical load. Beauvoir's adopted daughter Sylvie Le Bon de Beauvoir, in her introduction to La Transcendence de Eligo, remarks that the only position in that early work that Sartre changed completely concerned psychoanalysis. He totally reversed his previous conception, his refusal, of the unconscious and of psychoanalytic understanding and no longer defended his past prejudices in that field. 45 Flaubert's personalizing project is to be a literary artist, a practitioner of the black art of the fly, whether for its own sake, l'art pour l'art, or to tell the truth, realism. If art is derealization, then Sartre's Flaubert must derealize himself, if it is a realm of its own, then he will be its sovereign, the lord of non-being, 46 finally, if art employs the real as analogon, then Flaubert will, imagine being, itself. Viewing everything sub-specie fantasy by a sustained adoption of the aesthetic attitude. Point forty-seven. Sartre claims that Flaubert's conception of art necessarily implies his neurosis, that it is no mere de facto concomitant. Flaubert chooses the life of a neurotic, home imaginaire, in order to be able to write. Such were the bases and structures of his choice, lest we conclude that Flaubert's concept of art as the imagining of being is merely the subjective outpouring of a disturbed mind, the last move in Sartre's argument links this concept with the objective neurosis of French society in the 1830s and 1840s, which left its artists no choice but neurotic art, l'art nivros, namely, a complex of attitudes that stress detachment, solitude, derealization, failure, elichek, 48 misanthropy and nihilism, features we recognize from Sartre's depiction of the world of Baudelaire and Mallarmé. The French under Louis-Philippe were developing a self-image that was positivist and utilitarian, as personified in Flaubert's father. Point 49. Not surprisingly, Sartre sees the younger son's choice of neurotic art in the crisis of 1844 both as an anti-utilitarian reaction and as a prophetic anticipation of France's opting for the unreal in the person of Napoleon on three. The latter in flight from the dark side of its image as revealed by the massacres of 1848.50 for Sartre, this is the deep reason for Flaubert's popularity in the Second Empire, the unreal was addressing the unreal. At Pontelli Vek a cycle was initiated, at Sedan, 
it was completed, 51 in a manner that we have come to expect from Sartre, biography has broadened into social criticism, analytic individualism has been subsumed into the concrete universal of dialectical reason. It is in this context, and armed with the concepts of the imaginary in search for a method as well as the terminology of being and nothingness and the critique, that we address five topics that pervade. Much of Sartre's published work but, I would argue, reached their most compelling form in The Family Idiot. The ambiguity of being in situation, the given and the taken, from its introduction in Being and Nothingness, 52 the relation between facticity and transcendence, the in itself and the for itself, has been recognized as an ambiguous mixture, only after the fact can one distinguish their respective contribution. But if that mixture is ineluctably vague, the advance from an idealist emphasis on what could pass for noetic freedom, 53 toward a more materialist emphasis on the force of circumstance exhibits a gradual thickening of Sartrean freedom. Concrete freedom respects the growing importance of socio-economic conditions in the Sartrean situation. That was true of his Existentialism is a Humanism lecture, where the word concrete denoted a freedom with a specific content. It was the apparent downplaying of this materialist aspect that led Sartre to resist publishing his so-called first ethics because of its idealist leaning. As he became increasingly sensitive to dialectical reason with its negative and double negative relations, his sense of the factical dimension of our social life grew accordingly. History entered the picture as did historialization, a concept he had already introduced when discussing Kaiser Wilhelm's inability to think beyond his life context but equal failure to embrace it authentically. Point 50 for the dialectical interrelation in the critique assumed the character of totalization in the Flaubert text. Point 55 but now the vocabularies of BN and the critique were superimposed, if not synthesized, to yield a totalizing praxis that brought the materialist, or realist, side of facticity into creative tension with the idealist, red, phenomenological, component of the lived situation, le VECU. But it did so at the price of moral probity, authenticity, in the sense that the givens of at least some situations seem to render ethical action nearly impossible, the lesson of Saint Genet. A jaundiced view of bourgeois society had infected Sartre from the moment he met his stepfather. We watched it surface in nausea and in several of his novellas and plays, in fact, in most of them. But if the idealist strain was overpowered by communist realism in the early 1950s, did the rediscovery of the ethical with the Maoists suggest a gesture toward idealist principles once more? Or was it merely a version of Sartre's political search for a third way, between the Soviet and capitalist ideologies in the immediate post-war years, now played out in the ethical field. What St. Genet taught us was a lesson at least as old as Aristotle, the difficulty, if not impossibility, of being a moral person in an immoral society. In Sartre's terms this became the seeming corruption of the practico inert and its poisoning of the creative freedom of the individual agent. Still, the existentialist light shines through, however dimmed it may be by institutional greed and individual oppression. That becomes clear in the dialectical ethics and, as we saw, illumines the dialogical ethics as well. The ambiguous relation between the given and the taken is writ large in the guiding methodological principle of the Flaubert text, what we called the principle of totalization. This is dialectical reason in the grand style. It functions not only in the relation between author and work, Madame Bovary, but also in a curiously, prophetic, reading of the Pontelli VEK incident that symbolically foretells the rise and demise of Second Empire society. The degree of this mutual totalization is as ambiguous as was the initial situation in BN. In the Flaubert case, one may ask whether we are dealing with some kind of pre-established harmony, minus a divine organizer. Is Sartre indulging in the discredited practice of foretelling the past, Vaticinium post-eventum? Or, more plausibly, is he interpreting Flaubert's falling symbolically into the one-rick world of the imaginary, as its eventual master, as prefiguring the slide into the real world of Second Empire political and social life, itself occasioned by its fall into institutional violence with the massacres of 1848? This exhibits Sartre's maximal effort to discover, what we can know about an individual in the present state of our knowledge, where a la Aristotle, we learn more from the poets than from the historians. Point 56.
The Actor and the Stage. In his adaptation of Alexander Dumas' story, Keen, as we saw in Chapter 5 Note 22 above, Sartre raises what Diderot called the paradox of the actor 57 who is this person who seems to find his true identity when playing roles on the stage. Sartre distinguishes the actor from the player. The latter returns home after the performance and becomes a person like anyone else, whereas the actor plays himself every second of his life. He is no longer able to recognize himself, no longer knows who he is. And finally is no one, 58 This theme of role-playing has pervaded Sartre's works, from childhood pretense, through phenomenological description of impersonation, Maurice Chevalier, in the imaginary and so forth. Point 59 It frequently serves to illustrate bad faith, self-deception, as with the perfect waiter, in being and nothingness. It obviously plays a major role in Saint Genet, actor and martyr, and it figures in Sartre's discussion of Baudelaire. Sartre devotes two portions of the first volume of The Family Idiot and several passages thereafter to Flaubert's play acting. In fact, references to Genet are implicit especially in these portions of Lydiate, where Sartre is speaking of Flaubert's personalization as imaginary child, starting the spiral movement to the actor, continuing to the writer and finally issuing in the author. Point 60 We observed a somewhat analogous uncoiling in Genet's conversions from thief to esthete to writer. Sartre calls these turnings metamorphoses, rather than conversions, but they could more properly be called conversions, a term used in BN for a change of life orienting project but elaborated in NE to denote a change toward authenticity, an ethics without oppression, a new authentic way of being oneself and for oneself, which transcends the dialectic of sincerity and bad faith. 61 Genet seems to be the most authentic individual on Sartre's biographical roster, except perhaps for Mallarmé. Sartre's analysis of Flaubert's illness repays careful reading because it seeks to support his basic claim that human reality, humans, are ontologically free slash responsible in any situation when the evidence of practical limits is increasingly obvious. The following passage distinguishes pre-reflexive, pre-reflexive, from irreflective, Ir fle chia, consciousness in an attempt to arrive at a middle level dimension, between his standard distinction between the pre reflective, common awareness that precedes our reflective knowledge, and reflective knowledge. This seems to be the level at which Flaubert's understanding is wider than his reflective knowledge. It also introduces a somatic aspect that was present in emotional consciousness, example, bodily changes to magically resolve a challenging situation. This psychosomatic awareness was mentioned, equivalently, in Sartre's first Gram Sci lecture on Marxism and subjectivity. Now these aspects of Sartre's ontology and epistemology come together, whether comfortably or not. Concerning the psychosomatic phenomenon exemplified in Flaubert's Crisis of 1844, Sartre generalizes. We are left to ask with Merleau-Ponty, what are the intentionalities of the non-thought? Sartre is certainly trying to unravel the phenomenon of what Merleau-Ponty called operative intentionality, and doing so with a concrete example. But his dualism remains intractable to any dialectic, so it seems. For years before his death, Sartre gave an insightful interview to the distinguished theatre critic Bernard Dort. He insisted that theatre is the essence of the imaginary, but that it essentially operates in a tensive relation with the real. He believes that Genet radicalizes that tension in favor of the imaginary. He tries to demonstrate that nothing happening on the stage is real, everything topples into the imaginary. 63 This is Sartre's chief difficulty with Genet's plays. But one can recognize this same tension at work in all of Sartre's discussions of the imaginary. It centers on the analogon, which is introduced in the imaginary but never analyzed to the degree that its pivotal use in Sartre's corpus calls for. So when we encounter references to derealization and the constitution of imaginary man in the Flaubert, we must never lose sight of the insuperable facticity, practical inert, ingredient in the surreal. That ineluctable factor will break forth in its material forcefulness with the debacle of Sedan and the billeting of Prussian soldiers in Flaubert's home. The ever-present moral question. In an earlier interview, Dort confronted Sartre with his own words defining the theater of situation, the most moving thing the theater can show is a character creating himself, 
the moment of choice, of free decision which commits him to a moral code and a whole way of life, st. 48. When asked if he still assented to the terms of this definition, Sartre replied, yes and no. Yes, because I do not see any reason not to show in the theatre freedoms which in fact demystify. As an example of this he cites Heinrich in The Devil and the Good Lord, a character, completely destroyed by his situation, someone who, no matter what he does, invariably does harm, because he is in a false position, 64 and now he qualifies this by saying, this is what I failed to take into consideration in the definition you quoted to me, the limits of freedom. The dramatist may bring such limits to the fore in portraying the character of the actor. Sartre believes that Brecht has been the only dramatist to raise problems of theatre in their true terms, the only one who has understood that any people's theatre, the topic of the conversation, could only be a political theatre, the only one to have pondered a technique of people's theatre 65 but note that the unveiling, devoilment, a term that we saw Sartre adopt from Heidegger, is not merely ontological in character, it is the manifestation not merely that, there is, ilya, being, but that it is correspondingly moral in significance. What is being, unmasked, is equally our bad faith, our self-deception about our ontological freedom and its corresponding responsibility, the traditional, existentialist, message that earns Sartre the title, the conscience of his day, 66 The final volume of The Family Idiot treats the socio-historical context of Flaubert's generation and his work. It is no coincidence that hell, as depicted in No Exit, is furnished in Second Empire style. The objective spirit of the age was incarnate in The Imperial Mirage, of the Second Empire. Point sixty seven Among the features of Neurotic Art, L. Art Enifros, described in his Flaubert piece, Sartre includes a description of the broader situation that fostered this kind of art. If these artists were imaginary men, it was because, in Sartre's view, their society was one Rick. Like Heinrich in The Devil and the Good Lord, it was impossible to make an authentic choice because the entire society was bankrupt. As we see from his second ethics in his Maoist discussions 68 it is with those presumably few individuals who retain an ethical core that hope lies, on the condition that they commit themselves to affecting fundamental socio-economic change. Point 69. The real slash unreal, aesthetics and politics. The reason I wrote the words is the reason why I have studied Janet or Flaubert, how does a man become someone who writes, who wants to speak of the imaginary? This is the question I sought to answer in my own case, as I sought it in the others, 70 Sartre often remarked that the artist is one, who must lie to tell the truth, WL 158, and point 12. His. Flaubert's study, which he characterized as, a novel which is true, unroman vrai, can be read as a work of art in this sense. The lie comprises hypotheses about Flaubert's infancy, inner states, and the like, as well as that imaginative reconstruction, that novel itself, which Sartre has built from these fragments, ex pd Herculum. The truth to be exhibited is what we can know about a man nowadays. So the writing of Lydiot, far from constituting the aesthetic flight from reality, which some have taken it to be, can itself be read as a political act. As he assures his Maoist friends, it is a matter of consciousness raising, of revealing the implicit hatred of man that grounds both Lart poor Lart and the bourgeois humanism that feeds, and feeds upon, it, standard themes of the politicized Sartre. Perhaps the main conclusion about Flaubert to be drawn from Lydiat that mirrors Sartre's thought across its various categories, is the ambivalence shared by these three authors toward the real slash unreal. The unreal, specifically the irreal or imaginary, is both an escape and a weapon for each. As with a theatrical piece, literary artwork must be sufficiently other than the real, which Sartre sees as truth, utility, 71 to provide a genuine alternative, yet real enough to be taken seriously, believed. Sartre underscores that curious relation between imagination and truth, affirmed a hundred times since, Flaubert's, youth, that truth reveals itself only to imaginary beings as the meaning, sense, of their derealization. 72 The meaning of Flaubert's derealization, consummated at pont vek is that he is forever barred from the essence of man, praxis. But that this very e check is the necessary condition for great art. For Sartre's Flaubert, a home imaginaire from inception to term is Elam check. Again, loser wins. 
Or does he? The imaginary is always the derealization of some reality, which take his ontological priority, in the present case, it triumphs in the end. Flaubert's disgust at the powerlessness of the imaginary after the Prussian victory is echoed by a similar conclusion in Sartre's autobiography, For a long time, I took my pen for a sword, now I know we are powerless. Conclusion, the Sartrean imaginary, chastened but indomitable. With a simile that could be read as the summation of his philosophic anthropology, Sartre remarks late in his career, man is like a leak of gas slipping into the imaginary, BEM 46. We have witnessed this slippage in its various occurrences throughout his career. Describing the arguments that often arose between Sartre and Aaron as young adults, for instance, Simone de Beauvoir noted how aggressively analytic was Aaron's approach. There are two alternatives, mon petit camarade, he would say. Take your choice, Sartre struggled hard to avoid being cornered, but as there was more imagination than logic in his mental processes, he had his work cut out, prime 33. Of course, Sartre's imagination was never free-floating, one had always built on a perceptual core that it could derealize, as he saw fit. His existential biographies confirm this tension between the imaginary and the real, the novel which is true. Michel Sicard observed that, one can never emphasize sufficiently how Sartre's first philosophy is grounded in a theory of the image to that theory, we have argued, found a ready home in the eidetic. Reduction, free, imagination variation of examples, central to the descriptive method of phenomenology. And when conjoined with the phenomenological concept of intentionality, it saved him from the illusion of imminence, with its thesis that the image is a mental likeness of an extramental phenomenon. Rather, for Sartre, intentionality affects a representation of the presence of Sauerier in an impersonation, for example, or the Renaissance in viewing Michelangelo's David, or the living thing by simply regarding a tree in its physical reality. Point three in other words, intentionality is Sartre's antidote against idealist epistemology in aesthetics. Sicard perceptively extends this value concept of presence to the historical concept of incarnation and its cognates that we have encountered throughout Sartre's later work, Sens, Personalization, and Singular Universal, for they transmuted from the phenomenological to the dialectical as Sartre shifted his basic methodological concepts from consciousness to praxis and the lived, le vicu. But in the process, we witnessed a certain clouding of the translucency that marked Sartrean consciousness at the outset. If not a full surrender of his opposition to the unconscious, it certainly suggested a weakening of his early rejection of that idea. Sartre's political commitments moved steadily leftward, crossing the positions of Aaron, Camus and Merleau-Ponty along the way. This too was a function of his loyalty to the ideals of socialism and freedom, as he envisioned them. He admitted this proclivity in his final interview with Beauvoir before his death, I invented mythical societies, good societies in which one ought to live. It was the non-real, non-real, that became the meaning, sense, of my politics, it is, for, something like that that I entered into the political, la politique, so are 479. And when asked in another interview whether, in some sense, lived experience, le vicu, would be a kind of imaginary, Sartre quickly replied, exactly, Shilp 23. Lest we take this tendency toward the imaginary as evidence that Sartre was an innocuous dreamer, who had never fully freed himself from the childhood heroes in his grandfather's library, we must keep in mind that he was a moralist, the social conscience of his age, and that his keen sense of injustice suffered by the oppressed formed the deep source from which his dreams were fed. Yes, there was street theater aplenty, the events of May 1968 fit that category well, as do photos of Sartre in the middle of the street selling copies of a banned Maoist journal. That was simply a courageous act of consciousness raising. Sartre was not a finger wagging moralist, but someone who valued social justice and strenuously opposed injustice wherever it surfaced. This was the kind of dreaming that brought him to the site of striking mine workers and that led him to denounce exploitation of the vulnerable wherever he encountered it. His political ideals displayed an ethical dimension that often clashed in the aesthetic, plays, novels, short stories where the inevitable contest between means and end was played out, if not fully resolved. But if their resolution was, in the imaginary, 
This was not the fantasy of, art for art's sake, but the, down and dirty, dealings of individuals trying to achieve something like an authentic life in an inauthentic society. And yet we find Sartre and his Flaubert admitting that, in the final analysis, the imaginary had succumbed to the real, the pen to the sword, Napoleon to the Prussians. His friend and collaborator on LTM, André Gors, Gerard Horst, diagnosed their situation well, the most radical and strenuous work of liberation may be able to be carried out only in the imagination, because it cannot suppress the original constitution of total alienation. 5. Is it in despair, then, that Sartre undertook his anomalous third ethics in full knowledge of his approaching death? Of the eclipse of his creative powers, and of the seductive vision of his youth, a return to the works. Of the 1930s, to nausea. His response, I believe, occurs in an admission made to Le Vy and to himself toward the end, such is the calm despair of an old man who will die in that despair. But the point is, I'm resisting, and I know I shall die in hope. But this hope must be grounded, hope 110. And that ground? Perhaps Sartre glimpsed it when he mused in Saint Genet. Only a being which is not entirely can have the sense of non-being, in order to form an image, one must disconnect oneself from being and project oneself toward that which is not yet or that which is no longer. In short, one must make oneself a nothingness. What a galling amusement it is to find in our most authentic product the reflection of our finiteness, the same insufficiency enables man to form images and prevents him from creating being. SG 359. This insufficiency, the imaginary, would be the ground of that hope that is part of man, 6. That has always been one of the dominant forces of revolutions and insurrections, 7. And that is the very locus of our possibility, negativity and lack.